Block 1 Audiobook Title Clone Girls 00 to 36 by Chalkat. This work belongs to author Chalkat. Source Scribblehub.com. Prologue In an old dilapidated hallway, a group of armed people were walking around. Those people, who wore dull gray uniforms, were soldiers of the Borkian Confederation, one of the main power within the known galaxy. They were on a mission to escort scientists to an abandoned ancient facility. Right now, the group was escorting one of the scientists inside the facility, assuring his protection. A mixture of emotions could be seen on their faces depending on the person. Some were serious, looking around for any danger, some were stressed out and some were bored. Tisha was part of the bored ones. Damn it. The young woman mumbled to herself, why do I have to be part of a boring escort again? She wasn't supposed to be escorting people. Heck, in the first place she was part of one the Borkian Confederation 9th Special Assault Brigade, an elite unit. She wasn't taught how to protect people, but only the way to kill them. She thought back for a moment. How did she end up in this situation again? She remembered what happened just a few days ago. She just finished her usual training round and was going to take some rest when one of the newly arrived superior officers, Major Felgron, called for her. She did not like the man from their first meeting. His gaze was always directed at her chest. From his fat appearance alone, she could tell that the man had not gained his grade through his achievements. Still, as a soldier serving the Borkian Confederation, and so long as she was paid, she did not complain. There were actually a lot of people like him inside the Borkian military. Corruption and nepotism was not even hidden anymore as all those who complained disappeared mysteriously. But the fact is that Tisha, a second-class soldier, and an orphan with no connection whatsoever, was called by him. In the end, this could only mean one thing. Right, I rejected that fat pig's offer. She said in disgust. Major Felgeron had offered Tisha a big promotion and influence if she accepted to become his mistress. An offer she flatly refused, as if I'd sell my body to someone like that. And now I'm here. She sighed. The next day after that incident, she had received the notification that she was now affiliated to the 608th Infantry Escort Company. It was known to everyone in the system that soldiers affected to escort duty were considered of the lowest rank by all. She did not even receive any piece of equipment or formation before getting into this mission. She even still had her old gears and uniform from the 9th Special Assault Brigade. She had no doubt Felgeron had something to do with all of that. The man at the front suddenly raised his hand, and everybody became tense, except for one person. What is it again? The man exclaimed. Dr. Von Borug, there seems to be traps up ahead, answered the soldier next to him. That's absurd, Lieutenant. Von Borug scoffed. There's no way traps would be present in such a primitive installation, you know. Tisha's attention was drawn to their conversation, and she listened quietly. She remembered what she had heard from the briefing about the man in a white blouse. Von Borug was a reputed Borkian scientist who gained notoriety for his research on ancient civilizations. Right now, he was studying old structures left by an unknown civilization on her home planet of Brulia 7. However, since he was being escorted by the lowest of the lowest in the army, it seems that this expedition wasn't that important for the higher-ups. This can't happen every time. Time is precious and I don't have much of it left. I must discover which civilization those ruins belong to. If you insist, sir. The lieutenant that led her platoon could not disobey orders from the scientist. Tisha understood his dilemma. Even though she didn't remember his name. She thought he was at least capable in his duty. Then, let's send one soldier first ahead of the group just in case. If it can accelerate things, sure, whatever. This compromise seemed fair to Tisha and she praised the lieutenant in her head. Sending an experienced soldier with the correct material would be the safest method. Not that she knew anything about it. But then, the lieutenant called her second class Tisha. You go and take a look. Where Tisha froze, the lieutenant had called her. A freshly transferred soldier who had not even received a formation on trap deactivation? Second class Tisha. Do I need to repeat myself? No sir. Before she could object, the lieutenant shouted at her and she reflexively answered. 
she could not argue against her superiors on the field, that was the Borkians' military most basic rule, and Tisha did not want to be executed on sight for disobeying. I take it back, he's an idiot, although on the surface, she had her usual poker face, Tisha was actually panicking, she sent a glance to the soldier at the front of the formation, pleading with her gaze to get at least some material to do the job, the man who had detected the glance just shrugged at her, and then proceeded on monitoring the surroundings as if nothing happened, what is that all about, at least give me some advice, she heard chuckles, her teammates actually found this situation funny, sure, she was part of the best the Borkian army had to offer until recently, so they could have been jealous, but still, sending her straight to death was a bit too much, wasn't it? Tisha continued on, hoping whatever trap was there, would not activate, no sound was made as everybody attentively observed her every movement, a long time passed in a tense silence as Tisha prayed for her life while the others watched her. This atmosphere ended when she finally arrived at the end of the long hallway. See? What did I tell you? There's no trap in this facility. Flambourg exclaimed. That seems to be the case. Now hurry up you all. We've got exploring to do. Flambourg and the soldiers began to move, although some of them, like the lieutenant, still had reservations. Meanwhile, Tisha sighed in relief. Her luck had yet to run out. Nothing had happened in the end. But then, intruder alert, intruder alert, unidentified personnel has been detected, exclamation mark. Suddenly, the hallway lit up with red light and a siren resounded throughout the facility. Tisha froze for a second, before making a dash in the direction of the exit. The others didn't react that fast. The first one to regain control was the lieutenant who immediately gave out orders. Take formation. Come officer, contact the base. Now. It was when he was giving such orders that small vents opened nearby, and ominous clouds came out of them. Exclamation mark everyone. Change of plans. Put on your air purifiers. We're retreating. No way. We cannot retreat now. We're so close to discovering what's inside this facility. Flambourg exclaimed. I order you to stay where you are. I don't have time for this. I'm not paid for this kind of shit anyway. The lieutenant retorted. He then took out his pistol and shot Flambourg in between the eyes. All men, mission accomplished. Let's get the hell out of here. Tisha was shocked by what she witnessed. All the soldiers followed the lieutenant's order without batting an eye. It was planned. She was still far from the group and unfortunately, she did not have an air purifier in the material that she was provided with. Was I set up to die in this place too? She thought, I won't let it happen. She took out her plasma rifle and began shooting her retreating teammates. Some bullets killed three soldiers and wounded some others. Gah, we're getting shot by that wench. Sir, should we shoot back? One of the men demanded, but the lieutenant just said, forget about it. She won't last long within the gas with no equipment. The important thing right now is to get out of here. We can come back later after we contact the Republic. The escort soldiers continued on. Tisha tried to catch them, but as time passed, her breath became more ragged. She had already inhaled too much gas. Her vision was troubled. She could barely see the others anymore. She began to slow down until her legs could not support her anymore. Tisha fell to her knees as her consciousness became thin. So this is how it ends. At this point, Tisha gave up. She knew she wasn't going to make it. Heck, even if she survived, where would she go? She didn't think the men outside would kindly receive her, seeing how things turned. All of this for nothing. She thought back on her life. Since young, she had always had a life of survival, stealing where she could eating what she could before getting caught and then moving on to a new zone. To escape from this life of misery, she enlisted in the army at the age of 14 and became a cadet. Throughout her six years of service, she was set on multiple dangerous operations, and always survived. She participated in great offensives against the enemies of the Borkian Confederation and was successful in almost all her missions. Thanks to that, she managed to gain quite a reputation on the battlefield, but she always refused a promotion, knowing it would pull her into dangerous internal political games between the aristocrats of the Borkian Confederation. As such, she did not mind not getting any merits for her deeds, at least the army paid well and all her basic needs were fulfilled, 
and so she followed orders from her superior, which had always stuck close to her, but it's not like any of this would change anything about her current situation. As she let go of the last grasp at her consciousness, she heard the buzzing voice again. Valid genetic code detected. Proceeding with evacuation protocols, those were the last words she heard before falling unconscious. 39. Chapter 1. Uck, my head. Tisha slowly woke up with a headache. Her head still sleepy. Did I drink too much yesterday? Uck. She tried to recollect her memories of what happened before she got to bed. That's right. I was transferred and then, exclamation mark. Her memory came back. Right. The escort mission, then the gas. She quickly checked her body. She still had her clothes on. Nothing seemed wrong too. She sighed in relief. Nothing out of the ordinary, so it wasn't lethal gas. She sighed again. I'm alive. She didn't die. She was fine somehow. Still, the fact that she nearly died made her heart beat fast. She adjusted her respiration until she calmed down, after a while. And now that she calmed down a bit, she noticed where she was. She was sitting on a bed, which was very soft, probably the softest she's ever laid upon. When she looked around, she noticed closets, a door and a mirror on the wall. There was even a desk with a chair. But there were no windows though. Her plasma rifle laid on a table not far. But she also noticed how clean the room was even though all things inside were white. As if nobody had ever used it before. This is. A bedroom? It was too luxurious and clean to be a cell anyway. This was strange to her, was she still in the abandoned facility? And who brought her here in the first place? As questions kept popping in her mind, one of her bangs passed through her vision. Exclamation mark. Something was wrong. She rushed to the mirror to take a closer look. Her reflection stared back at her with its usual grey eyes. On a first look, nothing seemed to have changed from the last time she checked. Her hair, although a bit tangled, was still her shoulder-length hairstyle. Still, something was wrong. Why impossible? How? Huh? Her lustrous hair, which she had tainted all black, was back to its original white color with black tips. She had tainted it because it made her stand out. Tisha had never seen or heard of anybody who had the same natural white hair as hers. When she was still a child, people bullied her because of her hair color. She did not know the reason why. And she didn't think people around her knew too. They just bullied her because she was different. Therefore, when she enlisted into the army, she dyed it. And she kept doing it after that. Somehow, she managed to keep her white hair a secret from everybody. But now, her hair was back to its lustrous white splendor with only the tip of her hair remaining black. She didn't know how this was possible, since she used quite the strong taint. This left Tisha with one more question to her new growing list. She fiddled with one of her bangs. It's real. She stood there, dazzled in front of the mirror for a while. But then she heard noises from the door. It was opening. Her instinct kicked in as she quickly grabbed her plasma rifle and pointed it in the direction of the door. What? Surprisingly, what she saw was a small metallic ball floating in the air entering the room. Patient 847 has been confirmed to have awakened. Welcome, patient 847. Would you like to have breakfast? Tisha was on her guard, even though the thing in front of her wasn't human. She did not lower her weapon and kept it pointed at the floating ball. Tisha did not know exactly what model it was but she was sure of one thing. This floating metal ball with eyes was a drone remotely piloted by an AI. No answer received from patient 847. Proceeding with a quick health scan. Rays of blue light came out of what Tisha thought as the eyes of the AI's drone. She identified those as the same rays sent during medical checkups when she was injured on the battlefield. She sighed internally. For now it didn't seem to be hostile. Still, she did not lower her weapon. After all, the techno empire of Filio sent multiple A.I.S to the battlefield, they were one of the enemies of the Borkian Confederation, and she had already met their kind. She remembered how waves of AI-controlled robots would rush at her and her comrades. Just remembering the moment when they engaged them, it gave her shivers. Meanwhile, the AI's drone finished its scan. Scanning finished. Final results. No anomaly detected. Patient 847 seems to have a slightly higher heart rate. Deduction. Patient 847 seems to feel the emotion called as fear, 
As a result, patient 847 is tense. Caution advised. Attending patient 847 is a priority. The silence continued for a while longer, until Tisha finally spoke. What? Are you answering patient 847's question? This unit is DD 777A 471. I'm the emergency reserve unit in charge of taking care of CL installation 3. Installation 3? Where is this? How did I get there? Did you bring me here? Also Tisha asked multiple questions, before stopping herself in her tracks. Some low quality A.I.S. Could not handle multiple questions at the same time and they would overload. Although she doubted it since the drone AI looked as clean and beautiful as the room she was in. Maybe posing questions once at a time is better. She thought. You never know with those tin cans. Fortunately for her. The AI seemed to be on the smart side. Answering patient 847's questions in order. CL installation 3 is located on the equatorial line of the planet Brillia 7. On the eastern continent, patient 847 was found in Entry 4's hallway. When the sensors identified patient 847, they activated the program of emergency reboot. This unit was the only one remaining in working order. This unit found patient 847 on the ground. After identifying the situation, this unit recognized the cause of patient 847 unconsciousness being the defensive system's sleeping gas and then proceeded to secure patient 847 and locate her to a safer place. That means I'm still in the abandoned facility if I believe what you're saying, but something doesn't make sense. Tisha frowned, weapon still pointed at the flying ball. Why did you take me in? What do you want from me? By posing those questions, Tisha thought she could get more information. Fortunately, I took some lessons in the art of questioning and how to resist torture. Well, seeing how I am treated, I don't think it will come to this. What she did not expect however, was for the little floating ball to eagerly answer her questions for a second time. Answering patient 847's questions, due to patient 847's corresponding genetic code and the situation in which patient 847 was found, safety protocols were applied. Safety protocols consist of protecting designated persons. Tisha nodded, but more questions appeared. What did it mean by her having the correct genetic code? She was about to ask when the AI dropped a bombshell. This unit wants patient 847 to take ownership of CL installation 3. Huh? Repeating. This unit wants patient 847 to take ownership of CL installation 3. Once again Tisha just stood there. The incomprehension of what the flying metal ball just said was written on her face. When the AI repeated its answer, she annoyingly asked, Why would you want me to become the owner of some ruins? Correcting patient 847, this installation is in perfect condition. It is not a ruin. That's not what I want to hear. Tisha grew frustrated, but she had to admit that for an abandoned facility, it was way too clean and neatly tidied up as if the AI could see her growing frustration. It continued on with its explanation. Answer, after proceeding to a scan of the nearby area, no other life form corresponding to the correct genetic code was found. Protocols obligates facilities such as CL Installation 3 to always have an organic owner of the correct genetic code. So this installation came back online because it detected my presence and wanted to make me its owner. Patient 847's deduction is correct. What the hell? Tisha finally lowered her plasma rifle. She believed that the AI wouldn't hurt her. Still, she was confused. Some things did not make sense to her. I still don't understand why my genetic code, as you say, would activate this facility. Just, why me? What makes me special to you? She was only an orphan who grew up in an orphanage and who was later thrown into the street. The only advantages her genetic code brought her was her healthy and strong body and her white hair. Okay, I might actually have some good genes, but still, thinking back, she never fell ill. She also had stronger natural healing than most. And, she had to admit that she had a nice body and a beautiful face, which was the main reason why Felgeron wanted to make her his mistress in the first place. Maybe she really had special genes? Her thoughts were interrupted by the drone's answer. Answer. 
Specific code is needed to activate CL Installation 3 and all other CL installations made by the creators. Candidates need to possess two genetic traits. The first one is to have natural white hair with black tips. The second is to possess gray eyes. Pre-made protocols require those genetic traits to use CL installations most efficiently. My eyes and my hair. Tisha was very surprised by this piece of information. Never had she thought that her white hair, which had caused her so much trouble, would end up saving her life. Requesting answer. This unit wants patient 847 to take ownership of CL installation 3. Yume, could you wait a moment, please? Advise. Acquiring ownership of the facility is a priority to move on to other activities. Ha, she sighed. It would seem like the AI wanted her to answer right now. Even though it asked for her permission, the AI seemed set on making her the owner. She wasn't really thrilled about it, but then what? It's not like she could just go back outside. She would probably be killed by those escort guys, and returning to her old unit was not an option. Besides, she did not possess relatives, nor any attachment to a specific place either. All right. She put down her gun. Guess, I have no choice but to accept. She looked straight in the blue eyes of the drone. DD-7 something something. Correction. This unit's name is DD-777A471. Right, right. Whatever, DD something as you said. I'll accept your offer. Patient 847's answer has been acknowledged. Updating patient 847 to owner status. Please provide a drop of blood. A trapdoor opened on the side of the drone, and a small, mechanic alarm came out. At the end of it, Tisha saw a thin metallic stem. Under this stem, there was a small tube. Tisha immediately knew what she had to do. She raised her right index finger, and pierced the tip on the thin metallic stem. Just as she thought, the metallic stem was a needle. The tube then filled rapidly with her blood. When the tube was nearly full, the drone retracted its mechanic alarm back inside its body. Checking genetic code from sample. Genetic code valid. Unlocking all restrictions. All functions unlocked. CL installation 3 is now preparing to begin production. The floating ball began trembling. Tisha could see its eyes lighting up like a loading function. Strangely enough, she found that cute. The drone then asked her a new question, and a blue holographic panel appeared in front of her. Please insert your name, Tisha, she said, not even touching the panel. Please write your name on the panel presented in front of you. The AI corrected itself, which made Tisha say sarcastically, You're a pretty advanced AI, from what I see, and yet you need me to write it down for you? I could just spell it to you too, you know? Usually, just spelling the name would have been in order to most a.i.apostrophe.s. Except older designs. From what Tisha had experienced, please write your name on the panel presented in front of you. The AI simply repeated itself. Fine I get it, what a troublesome AI, Tisha sighed. She then wrote her name on the holographic panel. Acknowledged. Owner's name has been successfully registered within the database. Authentication process has been successfully completed. Welcome, owner Tisha. The drone happily buzzed as the loading animation finished. Or at least that's what Tisha thought. Good for you. She smiled a little. Now then, I still have plenty of questions to ask you. Can you answer them? This unit is happy to answer. The drone blinked its eyes. Tisha nodded. Good. Now, could you grumble her stomach made a loud noise. A small silence was made as Tisha became embarrassed. Her cheeks quickly changing to a red color. Proposition. Would owner Tisha like to eat at the cafeteria within the installation first? Lead the way. 32. Chapter 2. Phew. That was so good. Tisha just finished her meal, and her opinion was very positive. This was the best set of pasta she had ever eaten. This couldn't be compared to the food that was served in the military, and she didn't even want to talk about the military rations. This must be what the higher-ups always eat. Not that I know that anyway. She paused for a moment. Which reminds me. How long did I sleep? She then looked at the drone. The AI had been quiet during all the meal, even though it was the one who served her. Answer. Owner Tisha slept for two days, three hours, 21 minutes and 14 seconds. That much? 
Just how strong was that gas? She sensed that the AI would answer her. Wait, stop. I don't want to know. She scratched her head, then sighed and looked back at the three plates of pasta she just ate. No wonder I was so hungry. She then looked back at the drone. And you. I should probably give you a name. This unit already has a denomination. Searching for a name would be a waste of. Oh please, stop. Tisha interrupted the AI. What you have isn't a name. It's your production number. Besides, it's too long. She put one finger under her shin, thinking, let's see, how about Blip? The drone just stared at Tisha. After a moment it rejected the name to her surprise. This unit does not recognize this name as its new designation. Note, owner Tisha seems to be bad at naming people. You Tisha could only make big eyes, if she was the owner. The AI shouldn't refuse her, right? It should even less point out this kind of default. Meanwhile, the AI continued on, as if nothing happened, naming is not recognized as one of the rights of the owner, as such it is possible for this unit to reject it. After some time of silence, Tisha sighed, all right, I get it, maybe it was a wrong idea to come up with something from scratch, how about I call you A4, it's still a part of your production number, and it's easy to remember, the drone stopped moving for a moment. Then it answered positively. This unit has acknowledged the nickname A4 and she'll respond to it. Good, good. Tisha nodded. In the end, she did not understand this AI completely. Even though it always had a neutral voice, it seemed to her that it had emotions, which in itself might not be a bad thing. After all, those kinds of things depended on the programming of the AI. It's not like it was a rare thing to see emotion lay.i.apostrophe.s, rather, a lot of them were present in the galaxy, most notably in the techno empire of Filio where a.i.s were considered full right citizens. Besides, if she had to live here for a while, she would prefer to have someone more humane to discuss with rather than a program that would just answer her every word. So, what's next now, A4? She asked. A4 responded in its usual non gendered robotic voice. Advice. Owner Tisha should know more of the capacities of CL Installation 3. Generating a map of the complex for better visualization. In just a blink, a plan of the building appeared in front of her. Tisha was quite impressed. Wow, thanks, that will help. She paused for a moment before exclaiming. Holy shit, that scientist was right. This place is enormous. What was projected in front of her was a 3D holographic render of the complex. It was a huge structure with six floors going underground. Tisha noticed a blinking red dot on the fourth floor. She supposed it was made to tell where she was right now. There is a lot of information. Tisha murmured as she analyzed the structure. This entire building was hers now. For Tisha who never had property of anything, not even her own quarters in the military. This provoked a wave of emotion to wash over her face. This place, there are a lot of facilities. Every room's function was written. The facility was well planned, multiple stairways and elevators made the link between floors, and one general purpose huge elevator linked all six floors from the center. The first floor essentially consisted of mostly empty rooms and storage, it had four entrances directed to the poles. Tisha remembered the AI saying she was found at entrance four, which means it was the one in the north, corresponding to her memory. When Tisha looked at the next floors, she understood the main orientation of the facility. This, is this a military installation? Answer, CL Installation 3 possesses all facilities to make it independent from the outside world except for the gathering of raw materials. Weapon creation and army related facilities are one of its main components. I can understand that logic, but why dedicate an entire floor to it? and one of the biggest at that. Tisha was talking about the second floor. There was a huge training ground inside. Not only that, there were shooting ranges, training and fitness facilities, and even simulators. Whatever the higher-ups were thinking, it seems that Dr. Von Borug really found something amazing. Her gaze continued down the other floors. The third floor had a lot of industrial capacity, and a very diverse one at that. From food, energy generation to small arms plants, everything was there. The fourth floor hid the cafeteria, where she was right now. Beside that there was a humongous refectory, and a kitchen. Smaller dinner rooms as well as smaller kitchens were also present. 
She also noticed a big medical bay was present on that floor. The fifth floor was composed only of private quarters for the personnel. This was where Tisha was when she woke up, in one of the multiple personal bedrooms on that floor. Tisha did not know what civilization built this place, but its modernity made her think it had just been built. Film Borug, though, had attested the structure to already be 1,000 years old at the very least. This meant that the civilization that built this place was very advanced. Then she stopped on the sixth floor. The sixth floor seemed to contain laboratories, but those only occupied a quarter of the space. The rest of the space was occupied by a factory, but the factory was only denominated as CL production. What's this? CL? Tisha turned to A4. Hey, A4, what is that part of the installation? Answer. This part of the facility is attributed to all CL creation processors. Uck, that's not what I mean. She sighed again. Sometimes a dot i dot apostrophe dot s. Were dumb. What do the letters CL stand for? She pointed at the map. I see those letters everywhere on the sixth floor. And now that I think about it, those letters are also in the denomination of the structure, right? A4 just blinked its eyes. Answer. The denomination CL is an abbreviation for the word clone. This installation's main purpose is the creation of clones. Tisha stared at A4 with big round eyes yet again, her face rapidly losing colors. She managed to speak. What? Did you just say? Repeating, the denomination CL is an abbreviation for the word clone. This installation's main purpose is the creation of clones. Oh God. In just what kind of situation am I right now? Tisha felt like she had a headache, and for a good reason. Why is this whole installation made for the purpose of something that has been banned throughout the whole known galaxy for years now? And why did I decide to become its owner without even knowing this fact? She blamed herself. Now she was sure she could not get to the outside world anymore. Cloning was prohibited. This was a rule that everybody within the known galaxy was under. Tisha thought the main reason was ethical, but everyone she met had told her that it might have been banned because of past acts in which the whole known galaxy was thrown into an era of chaos known as the aftermath of the fall of the United Federal Government. She did not know much about it. More than a thousand years had passed since then. Still. Everybody feared to come back to that period. As for the banning of clones, from what she heard, it was mostly because the original technology was lost to time. When the people in power tried to rediscover the technology, it always ended badly. Hence, to avoid a big disaster appearing, all governments had agreed on its banning. Yet, here she was, the new owner of an ancient clone facility which was probably the real deal. The AI, not understanding Tisha's state, was confused. This unit does not understand why owner Tisha is in such a state. Of course you don't. Tisha sighed yet again. How many times did she sigh in just one day? Oh well, at least nothing is in production right now, she said as she rested her exhausted head in her arms. Correction. Production of clones from owner Tisha's collected genes has already begun. A4 threw yet another bombshell. Tisha stood up immediately and grabbed the small drone, furious. All right, that's it. It was a pleasure knowing you, Tin Can. Any last words? Add ice. The destruction of this drone will not destroy this unit. This unit inhabits the central computer of this installation. Warning. Destroying said computer would cause an instant massive explosion. Tisha just stared furiously into the eyes of the drone. Right now, she just wanted to shoot it down with her rifle. Unfortunately, she left it in the bedroom where she woke up. I messed up, she thought. I should have kept it on myself. No, in the first place. I should never have agreed with becoming the owner of this place. Silence followed as the two stared at one another. After a moment, Tisha finally released the small drone before sitting back on her chair, totally depressed. How long has it been since you started cloning me? Answer, after making sure of owner Tisha's safety, gene samples were taken down to the clone laboratory in accordance with the protocol. After having checked the compatibility with the cloning method, the first batch of test clones is currently at the pre-infant stage. How fast? Tisha forced to laugh. So from the beginning it was already planned, wasn't it? A4 did not respond this time, but there was no need. Tisha understood, 
It was part of the AI's base program. She closed her eyes and asked, Can it be stopped? A4 answered rapidly, Answer, clone creation process can still be stopped. Wait, it can? Tisha addressed herself, sitting more straightly in her chair. She did not expect to get a positive answer. Current phase of the project can still be stopped before further progress. Core data has already been collected. Ha, ha ha she laughed. And here I thought everything was already over. She stood up happily. All right, A4, stop everything. This is an order from your owner. A4 blinked its eyes, passing to the color green for a brief moment. Order received. Requesting the owner to look over the report of the phase before giving a drop of blood to verify the order. All right. Titian acquiesced. Although, to her, it seemed a bit of a hassle. She wanted to get this over with a sap. While A4 was busy collecting the data for the report however, she noticed something. Ever since she had met A4, it had strongly wanted her to become the owner of this installation. And now she knows why. A4's program made it adamant on launching the production of clones. Yet here it was saying everything could still be stopped. Something was not right. Oh well, I'm probably imagining things. She rapidly gave up on the train of thought. Her mind was too tired because of the constant flow of information that she just received. If she could put an end to all of this, then it was fine. A blue holographic screen appeared in front of her. A4 had just finished treating the data for her. It was easy to read, but she did not want to read the 50-page long reports. She skimmed over it rapidly. Most of it was about the compatibility of her genetic code with the cloning method, which gene could be augmented to fully utilize its capability and what gene needed to be fiddled with to make the clones less rebellious against orders. It did not interest her. Rather, she was a bit disgusted and grimaced. <laughs> Near the end of the report however, something caught her attention. This part of the report was about a batch of 100 test clones created to test the gene amplifications. Wait, wait, wait. This. She read the passage with utmost attention, and a sour taste appeared in her mouth. Out of the batch, only 12 embryos survived the gene amplifications. This was just sad. After learning this, she felt sad all the way to the end of the report. But that was it. She wasn't someone who would care for strangers, even if it were embryos. At least they didn't have to see what a horrible world the outside is. Then, she reached the last phrase of the report. She blinked. Reread it. It was still the same line. Appalled, she looked at A4. H. Hey, you. Can you repeat the last phrase of the report for me? I think I'm so tired that I can't even read properly. Repeating, all surviving test clones will be terminated after the closure of this phase. B but, Yume, that's a bit. Tisha now thought of those 12 embryos that were still alive. She thought she did not care about them, but when she became conscious that they would be killed, and that she would have a role in that, it made her uneasy. No, as expected, killing new life is a bit too much. If it was of natural cause, she would be fine with it, such is the way of life after all. But knowing that she participated in killing 12 new lives, which had entered a stable growth period, it was a bit too much even for her. Advice, terminating the life of the test clones is advised. Those entities, although stronger than the other cloning phase results, are unstable and unruly elements capable of reaching the limits of the genetic enhancement and reach a similar level to the genetic source. If I decide to continue the cloning program, would you leave those embryos alive? Negatory. Protocols strongly advise their termination as soon as the process is finished. Tisha thought for a bit. If she were to believe the words of A4, the lives of those 12 girls would be terminated before even beginning. Was she ready to accept this for her own peace of mind and tranquility? The answer was no. A4, I order you to continue to nurture those embryos, she said with her most serious voice. Warning, it is strongly advised to terminate the life of the Null Class clones. This is an order A4, do you understand? Anger mounted in Tisha's voice, she would not back down this time. Not when she could save new lives just within her reach. Even if those lives were clones of herself. She thought that in the end, they deserved a chance to live. Her actions led to their creation. She had to take her responsibilities. Understood. Order received. Prolongation of the Null Class clones nurturing until sufficient age to operate alone. A4 reluctantly agreed. Tisha sighed. The embryos would live. For now, 
Tisha loosened her tensed muscles, she felt exhausted, but proud of herself somehow, after giving a drop of blood to A4 to confirm the freezing of all plans past the first phase of the cloning program, and verifying that A4 would keep his words about the twelve null class clones, she came back to the bedroom where she first woke up and fell asleep immediately. 39. Chapter 3. You Fool. Those were the words that reverberated inside the headquarters of the 9th Special Assault Brigade positioned at Fibro City, one of the biggest cities on Brilia 7. Inside the office of the general in charge of the brigade, Major Felgeron was trembling in fear facing the aura of rage from the woman behind the desk. That woman was Brigadier General Rika Do Essen, a war hero, and she was furious at him. While I was away meeting our superiors, you just had to send away our most capable soldier. The subject of the discussion was Tisha. Rika was furious that her subordinate, Felgeron, had decided to transfer her to another brigade without consulting with her. I told you, didn't I? Report to me anything that is happening around second class Tisha. Why you did, General Felgeron timidly answered. So do tell me, Major Felgeron, for what reason did you transfer second class Tisha? Rika smiled. Felgeron would have been charmed by her, if it weren't for the killing intent emanating from behind her, that or the hideous scar the woman had on the left side of her face. Th that is. He trembled. How could he tell her that he had done so because he wanted to give the woman a lesson after she flatly refused him? If he were to tell her that, who knows what would become of him? Felgeron was one of the new officers of the brigade, and everybody knew how he got his post. Needless to say that he wasn't popular at all, and this superior in front of him was one of those who rose through the ranks by their actions, the perfect opposite of him. S.H. She asked for it herself. She said she was disappointed in her skills so she decided to go back to the basics by transferring to an escort unit. He made up a lie on the spot. However, stop lying. I know that soldier better than you do. Bam. He eek. She hit the table with their fist making Felgeron shriek. The general then heaved a sigh and put her left hand on her forehead to top it all off. You just had to transfer her to a unit who betrayed the Confederacy and turned to the Ionian Republic. Now the higher-ups are suspicious of us. I, I have no excuses. This happened just by coincidence. She knew that the Major, although nothing more than a corrupted pig, would in no right betray the Confederacy. He is too stupid to make that move, she thought. Find her. Sorry, I said. Move your ass and go find that soldier. Rika ordered her orders. Why yes, I'll mobilize the troops immediately. Felgeron hurriedly left the office, as if fleeing for his life. This pitiful display only made Rika sigh. Really? In just what kind of troubles are we now? She opened a folder that was on her desk. It was a folder containing top secret orders that she just received. The orders were to secure the sector of the facility which had become contested between the Confederacy and the Republic. It seems that this sector will soon become a wart zone. And all of this because of some old ruins. Finding Tisha was sort of a pretext to chase Felgrun away. But this whole operation had to be operated in secret anyway, so it was a good excuse too. Besides, her brigade wasn't the only one involved on this mission. For the higher-ups to mobilize so many troops, this site must be of utmost importance to them. Beside her brigade, one mechanized division, two infantry regiments and one cavalry battalion would be mobilized. It was a considerable force for such a small-scale operation. In the report, she could see how the traitors operated. After eliminating Dr. Flanborg with the excuse of the activation of a trap, they eliminated the rest of the scientist team before securing the location and declaring their defection to the Ionian Republic. Fortunately for the Confederacy, one of its covert agents also received the announcement. They received his report five days after the defection of the escort company. Thanks to this agent, the Confederacy was preparing countermeasures to intervene. Rika's chain of thought derived on Tisha. She wasn't particularly worried about the soldier. She knew her very well after all. She entered service in the same platoon with a young teenager as a junior officer six years ago. Rika was only 18 years old at that time. She wasn't friends with the woman nor anything. Rather, she only thought of her as the best asset in her arsenal. 
Now and even back then, Tisha would make great achievements wherever she would go on the battlefield. Back in the days, she was jealous of her exploits, and was no better than Felgron, a selfish young lady from a good family who got her place thanks to her family. But then, something made her change her mindset. She put her left hand on her scar. She remembered the days when her section was sent on a retrieval mission five years ago. The mission itself had failed because of a surprise attack, and all of her section had died while she had been wounded pretty badly. Rika only survived because Tisha, who also suffered a wound to the leg, saved her life. During that traumatic experience, a bond had been created between the two of them. Not a bond of friendliness, but rather a mutual understanding that they both needed each other to survive. And they managed to do just that. Just after the incident, Rika had asked Tisha why she put her life on the line to save her when she could have made it back just by herself to her at the time. This was the most bewildering act, since she was bullying the young Tisha when nobody looked her way. Tisha had responded that it was just her duty, annoyed by that answer which, to Rika, seemed to simply be humility. She asked why Tisha was still serving in the army if she refused to be promoted. She could still remember what the young 15-year-old Tisha responded. A medal does not bring any food on the table, so I don't care about those pieces of scraps that only flatter the ego. Rika let out a bitter smile as she muttered those words. Tisha had then continued her phrase, in a rare display of her true feelings. Also, if I can permit myself, the political games in which the superiors engage are rather troublesome. Those words made Rika burst out laughing when she first heard them. The orphan girl was right, the political games the higher-ups always did would make it tiring to survive if you had no backers. After that, Rika made sure to stick to Tisha. She herself also worked hard and polished her skills not only on the battlefield but also as an officer. Thanks to that. Her achievements piled up until she was promoted to the grade of Brigadier General at the age of 21, only three years after her first mission. She then used her influence to build up the 9th Special Assault Brigade from scratch. She handpicked every soldier of this brigade, including Tisha. When orders for an important operation came in, she would personally give orders to the woman, and the two of them would lead commando operations. Not only was it weird for a general to fight on the field, it was also weird for a general to order a simple soldier around directly, but Tisha somehow refused every promotion, saying it was useless. So Rika made a compromise, and gave Tisha the special status of personal soldier, who could only receive orders from her when she was present. There were some complaints from her backers at first, but Tisha and her fulfilled every task with an incredible success rate, so the complaints quieted down rapidly. As a side note, Rika raised Tisha's salary as much as she could. This was a small price to pay if this could assure that Tisha stayed in the brigade. Tisha would have been wealthy by now, if she did not spend everything into her equipment, or, when it was not the case, into alcohol. But now, she lost her because of one stupid person. She sighed. She couldn't do anything about the Major right now except scaring the shit out of him. Her backers were the ones who forced her to have Felgeron within the ranks of her brigade. This is frustrating. She sighed again. She had lost Tisha in a stupid manner. Well, that girl is probably alive somehow. Rika had seen her too many times on the battlefield. She knew that Tisha had an act to somehow come back alive no matter what situation she would get herself in. This was one of the main reasons why Rika thought so highly of the twenty years old woman. Let's not think about it for now. She shook her head to disperse her thoughts, then stood up. I have to check on the troops. Even though she ordered Felgeron to find Tisha at the site of the abandoned facility, she would go there herself to lead the operations. She just said that to make him leave, if she had to search for the woman as a side quest, she would do it herself. Right now, she had to brief her staff about the operation. Let's see. Since it is a secretive operation, we won't have access to fast transport equipment. Spatial and aerial transports are also out of the question. We'll have to rely on ourselves. She looked at the map on the wall. It was very rare in these times to have a paper-style map. Still, Rika personally preferred that. There's at least three weeks or more. From her calculus, it would get her brigade one month of undercover transportation to get to Sector B-745, where the abandoned facility was located. Well then. 
time to go on a little trip, she said those words, she used that phrase every time she and Tisha would go on a mission, she moved toward the exit, when she opened the door, her guards saluted her, she told the man on the left, tell the officers to come to the meeting room in 30 minutes, code yellow, yes, general, so this is the armory, two weeks after becoming the owner of clone installation 3, Tisha finally set foot inside the main armory on the second floor. The main reason was because A4 had told her that there were movements all around the facility. She did not know if it was the escort company or another group. The planet was contested by the Ionian Republic after all, who also controlled multiple bases and cities on the planet. But, in the end, Tisha thought she should prepare herself in case something happened. She told A4 to add this to the daily reports it gave her. She also asked him if CL Installation 3 was equipped with defenses other than sleeping gas. The AI had presented her with a rather small array of defenses. To complement those sets of defenses, she would have to go out herself. She didn't mind it. She was used to fighting. Besides, having weapons would reassure her. With those, she could assure her own defense and defend the 12 small lives that were still inside their pods. After one week passed at adapting to her new life as the owner of Clone Installation 3, a week in which she did not stop asking questions to A4, she now better understood how the installation was now in such a clean state compared to the dilapidated walls of the entrance's hallways. Clone Installation 3 had a huge variety of drones used to do menial tasks such as cleaning, cooking, and transporting resources. All of them were connected to the central unit which directed them. While she was at it, she wanted to know more about the creation process of clones. Just in case the AI would try to create other clones behind her back. She learned that the clones were made to grow at an exceedingly faster rate than regular humans. In other words, the clones would not come out of the pods as babies. Instead they would already be grown up. This accelerated growth did not mean they would age faster later on. Rather, the aging would slow down to become similar to a regular human once the clone reached the age of 18 years old. The only problem was that the pods in which the clones were nurtured could only do so until a certain age. It was marked on the report that the 12 clone girls would get out of their pods when they reached the age of 8. The reports also indicated that they would reach this age in two weeks' time. It's rather empty, Tisha commented as she glanced at the empty shelves. When A4 had told her that the armory had a wide range of weapons, she thought it would be full, but it seems to not be the case. Indication, surplus of needed weapons has been recycled for later use of resources in other projects. Right. I guess that makes sense. Tisha shrugged. Personally I'd rather have more weapons than the bare minimum. You never know what could happen. A4's A's blinked for a second. Owner's preference has been registered. Redirecting resources into weapon production. Tisha just nodded. She followed A4 until the end of the room, where some weapons were neatly ranged. Ooh, what do we have here? For a moment, A4 thought there were stars in the eyes of Tisha. And while the AI was busy wondering whether it should launch a health check on its owner, Tisha grabbed one of the weapons. After a while of examining the weapon she excitedly looked at A4. The AI understood she wanted an explanation. Indication. This is a V12 carbine. It fires laser projectiles and is a polyvalent weapon with a good rate of fire. Its accuracy is however diminished the longer the range is. Laser blaster type, huh? That's a classic. She frowned a bit. She thought the installation would have forgotten weapons from another era. But laser blasters were the most widespread type of weapon used in the entire known galaxy. Indication, laser blasters are the cheapest weapons to mass produce. You're right. I've met them on every battlefield, so I'm rather familiar with them. Tisha posed the weapon and looked at two rifles posed one next to the other. I'm guessing those are laser blaster rifles then? R31 laser blaster rifle. It is considered in the database as the most standard weapon every clone is equipped with. Although its rate of fire is mediocre, its precision and ease of use compensates the slow firing rate. The other rifle is the R32 sniper variant which comes with a target locking system. Tisha just nodded. All the weapons presented to her were good ones. Although she preferred the plasma weapons that the 9th Special Assault Brigade had, she would not complain. A weapon is... In the end, just a weapon. Whatever form it has, 
She continued to inspect the weapons as A4 told her a precise report about each weapon's performances. After testing them at the fire range, she decided that the weapons she should keep ready to use were the R31, the V12, and two pistols called TP100. There was only one thing that bothered her. Hey, A4, is it possible to get a new uniform? The AI quickly responded. Note. Creation of a uniform is a simple process. Owner can either choose an already created template or come up with a new design. I'll do that later then. Although civilian clothes are good, I'm too used to wearing a military uniform. She said, since she was not part of the Borkian Confederation anymore, she could also personalize it all she wanted. As she left the armory while humming lightly, A4 called out to her. Notification. Creation of an armored suit is advised for the safety of the owner. Wait. Tisha stopped. I can create armor too? Affirmative. Then let's do it. R. Finally, I can get one of those armor the rich guys always wore in battle. She was excited. Because of her origins, the military refused to give her an armored suit. It was a totally stupid reason in her opinion. Even Brigadier General Rika could not help her get one. She wondered what the woman would say if she learned that Tisha could build one for herself right now. Well, that's not important anymore. Let's go A4. We need to talk about the design. Tisha came out of the armory in a happy mood followed by A4 who simply bipped as an answer. 38. Chapter 4 Tisha looked anxiously at the timer that A4 was projecting in front of her. Only five minutes and a dozen seconds were left on the timer. Right now. Tisha and A4 were in the clone facility on the sixth floor. Three weeks had passed since the beginning of the cloning phase, and the clone girls, as Tisha liked to call them, were about to come out of their nutrition pods. Tisha had thought for a long time about how to treat the clones. She wanted to treat them as human beings, but didn't know what kind of relationship she would have with them. After agonizing for a long time, she finally decided to consider them as family and that she would consider them her little sisters, just like the older kids in the orphanage treated the younger ones. From her memory, at least, and not that she was treated the same way anyway. Beside this, Tisha's reasoning was rather simple. She thought that those kids would need someone to guide them. Unlike how she herself had been abandoned by so many people when she was young, Tisha did not have experience in taking care of children, but she thought it would be fun to watch them grow up, even though that time would be short. There would only be six months before the clone girls reached the age of 16. Tisha looked around the room. It was the smallest of all the cloning rooms, with a capacity of 100 nutritional pods. Out of those 100 pods, only 12 were lit up. A4 had rearranged them so the pods were close from one another. Those 12 pods were located to Tisha's left. On the ones lighted up, Tisha could see inscriptions on a screen above the pod. She closed in on the first. Null CG01. Condition, stable. Somehow, seeing the green words calmed her. She never felt like she did right now. She asked herself, is this how it feels when you are waiting for the birth of a new member in your family? The answer was probably yes, but she still felt like she was partly wrong. She remembered her superior, Rika, telling her about a similar feeling when her younger brother was about to be born. But this small talk was made to make her forget about the horrible wound she had just suffered at that time. Notification, nutriment spots will open in three minutes. A4 called out to her. Tisha just nodded at the AI, looking back at it. She was quite happy that the AI had accepted the change to the usual code name of the clones. Tisha had insisted that her clones should be referred to as clone girls since it would be cuter. Hence why the code name became Null Clone Girl followed by the production number. The epithet Null was a special designation made by A4 to separate those clone girls from other generically produced clones. Not that Tisha wanted to create more. It recalled the fact that they were produced for testing only. The AI did mention however that this codification would also give them more command power over other clone types. A small detail to Tisha, but one that the AI was very adamant to notify it at every occasion possible. But those code names didn't satisfy her. She wanted the girls to have real names. As such, she spent hours thinking about names for each girl under the comments of A4. The AI had judged her quite critically about her naming sense, but thanks to A4, 
She was now sure those names were somewhat correct. Tisha walked over each bod, carefully examining them and looking at their screens. Null CG12. Condition, stable. As she reached the last pod and put her hands on it, A4 called her again. Notification, nutriment pods will open in one minute. Owner Tisha is advised to stand back from the pods. Tisha didn't say anything, she simply joined A4 near the entrance. She knew that this moment was important not only for her, but also for the little girls. She watched overs as the seconds passed. It felt like she was back on the battlefield, when time slowed down. The timer ticked down. 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Notification, awakening phase has begun. Draining preservation liquid. Nutrition pods will now slowly open as their occupants wake up. Just as A4 announced. The pod containing Null CG01 made noises. Tisha read what was on the screen just above it. Null CG01, awakening has been confirmed. Drainage of the preservation liquid, 100%. Proceeding with opening. Tisha slowly approached the pod as it opened slowly. Just as she had expected, an eight-year-old girl was lying inside the pod, naked. She opened her eyes slowly, and her eyes met Tisha's gaze. Ah oh, that was all Tisha could muster as a wave of emotions flooded her. She did not know what kind of emotion it was, but she was just happy to be stared back. Even if it was an expressionless stare, this moment did not last long however, just as she was about to muster some words to the girl, Tisha heard some noise from the pod right next to Null cg ones pod. It was Null CG 2s pod. She turned in a hurry. She did not want to miss a moment of the girl's awakening. She made it just in time as Null CG 2 opened her eyes in a rather quick way. Just like with Null CG 1 their gazes locked into each other. This time, Tisha managed to speak. Hey there Tisha was all smiles. As for Null CG 2 she did not know how the clone girl felt. After getting out of nutrition pods, there was a bit of time where the body had to adapt. Because of that, and the fact that this was basically their birth, they did not show any emotions. Oh, you're a fast one. To Tisha's surprise, Null CG02 lifted her upper body already. She thought they would need more time before doing that. The clone girl looked at the ground. Somehow, Tisha immediately understood what she meant. And although she was a bit worried, she lifted Null CG02 and put her down. It was a rather fortunate thing that the nutrition process included a function to implant knowledge into clones. Tisha could not imagine herself teaching 12 8-year-old kids how to speak or how to walk. You really are a fast learner. Tisha muttered as she warmly watched the clone girl checking her own body. Then, she heard some movements behind her, and was reminded of Null CG 01's presence. She turned over to see the young girl mimicking the same actions as her little sister. Tisha happily helped her too. Phew. Tisha watched over as the two clone girls were now staring at each other. Then she noticed one thing. They need clothes. She had totally forgotten about this fact. As she began to panic, she heard A4S voice. Indication, this unit has brought clothes. Oh god. I've never been more happy to have you a four. Notification, unneeded praise received. Tisha took the clothes a four brought her, and immediately helped Null CG01 put on her clothes. There you go. She patted the girl on the head, then turned around to help Null CG02 only to find out she had already begun. She was struggling to put on her t-shirt. Hee hee, let me help you. There you go Tilda. After helping the two clone girls. Tisha suddenly realized, why are the other ones not opening yet? Is there a problem? Indication, awakening phase can take some time depending on the concerned individual. Once signs of natural awakening are appearing, the preservation liquid in which the subject is submerged will be drained, and the subject will finish to wake up naturally. Is that so? Tisha sighed. Sorry, for some reason I began to worry over nothing. Noises that were becoming familiar to her were heard for a third time, and Tisha's worries washed away for good. There was no reason for her to be so stressed out. Everything would be fine. She looked at the pods right next to the two first, but it wasn't Null CG 03's pods. A? Eh? Which one? She looked over hurriedly until her eyes met the pods at the end of the line. Over there, Null CG 11's pod was opening. She quickly walked and reached it. Null CG11 still had her eyes closed, which made Tisha sigh in relief. 
she didn't miss the girl's awakening. A few seconds passed, but unlike the first two clone girls, Null CG-11 did not open her eyes directly. Instead, the young girl curled up into a ball and shifted to her left side. It seemed that the girl just wanted to sleep more. Orticia smiled warmly. Before knowing it she was tenderly caressing the girl's right cheek with the back of her left index. Wakey wakey Tilda, little one Tilda. Time to wake up Tilda. At her words, Null CG-11 finally opened her eyes. She turned her head while yawning and locked gaze with Tisha. The instant she did, and as if the sleepiness showed just now was a lie, she held out her arms to Tisha. She was asking for a hug. Exclamation mark C cute. It was like an arrow struck Tisha's heart. Even though Null CG-11 was expressionless, it had a devastating effect on Tisha. She scooped up the girl in her arms and they hugged each other for what Tisha thought was a whole hour. In reality the hug only lasted less than 15 seconds. She reluctantly ended the hug when she saw Null CG-02 approaching with a set of clothes in her hands and put Null CG-11 down. Thank you Tilda. You learn so fast. I'm proud. She praised Null CG-02 and patted her head again with her right hand. But then Null CG-11 clung to her clothes and looked up. She was asking for a head pat. Foo fa foo. Someone already wants to be spoiled Tilda. Fine by me Tilda. Tisha happily obliged. She knew that even though the girl was expressionless, she was happy. Meanwhile, Null CG-01 was staring at their interaction next to A4. But Tisha was too focused on helping Null CG-11 wear her clothes to notice the stare. Then, Tisha heard loud noises. Tisha immediately knew it this time, but surprise still appeared on her face as this time, two pods were opening simultaneously. Reaching them, she looked at their code names. It was Null CG-05 and Null CG-06's pods, just like before. The clone girls opened their eyes slowly, then looked at Tisha. Just after that though, the two girls stared at each other and did nothing else than that. Tisha said nothing and proceeded to get the girls out of the pods. Once she did that, Null CG-02 came over with two sets of clothes, and while Tisha helped Null CG-05 wear her clothes, Null CG-02 did the same with Null CG-06. After that, things proceed smoothly. Null CG-03's pod opened, then Null CG-04, Null CG-07, Null CG-08, Null CG-09 and Null CG-10 woke up without a hitch. Tisha felt happy like never before. She never expected to experience such bliss. She gathered all the clone girls near the entrance and watched over them as they identified each other. But the next moment, Tisha's expression of pure happiness morphed into one of horror after hearing A4's words. Warning, critical failure detected on Null CG-12's nutritional pod. Owner Tisha's attention is requested at all costs! Exclamation mark. Tisha left the clone girls and rushed to the last pod without second thought. When she arrived in front of it, the screen, which should have been displaying green letters, was displaying red ones instead. Null CG-12. Condition, unknown. Drainage of the preservation liquid, 38%. Error, unable to drain the preservation liquid. Advising Overseer to manually operate the nutrition pod. After reading those words, Tisha began looking for the manual commands. A, A4. Check on the child. What's her situation? The AI obeyed its owner and the drone did a quick medical check on the pod. Report, Null CG-12 has begun to wake up. Warning, if the preservation liquid is not drained within 5 minutes, Null CG-12 will drown. This is bad. Tisha hurried on. She found a sealed box on the right side of the pod near the screen. There it is. She saw no lock. Instead of just searching and losing more time, Tisha just took out one of her TP-100 laser blaster pistols and shot the sides of the boxes where she could see screws. Warning, damage to the structure has been detected. Owner Tisha should follow. I don't care right now. Tisha screamed back at the AI. Right now, she would not listen to any of its advices. She was too panicked to think rationally. Something that rarely happened to her. The metal cover finally seeded, and Tisha could see a panel. She quickly navigated through it and found two buttons, one to drain the liquid and the other to open the pod. She pushed the former. Update, liquid drainage is proceeding as planned. Good. Tisha was relieved. 
only for A4 to make her tense again. Warning, oxygen levels within the pod have reached low levels. Owner Tisha should proceed to open the pod with great urgence. Tisha did not respond. Instead, she just punched the button to open the pod. Clunk. A loud noise was heard. A small opening was made, but nothing came after. Tisha began to punch the button again and again. Nothing changed. Damn it. She looked around. Her eyes fell on a metallic tube near her on the wall. Within moments, she already shot the tube on the two extremities, melting them. She then proceeded to pull on the tube with all her force. Warning, destruction of material one. Ark, just shut up. She yelled annoyingly as she pulled with all her force. In Tisha's head, now wasn't the time to care about the destruction of equipment. Clink. She finally managed to take out a part of the tube. Unknown liquid splashed all over her, but she didn't care one bit. While panting from the effort, she pushed one of the extremities inside the opening of the pod. She then used the bar as a lever to force the opening of the pod. Ark, shit. She stopped for a brief instant and cursed. She did not have enough strength to make it open by herself. She was extremely worried about the state of Null CG-12. Even if the small breach was enough to give her oxygen, the young clone girl would still be stuck inside the pod. What would the little girl think if she woke up in such a narrow space? As she was about to try a second time, she noticed that the other clone girls had gathered around her. Although expressionless, Tisha could guess that they were also worried. Huh? As she was about to try again, three clone girls approached her. What are you doing? It's dangerous. Null CG-02, Null CG-05 and Null CG-06. She did not know how. But even though they all looked similar, she could tell who they were. Those three girls took position in front of her and grabbed the tube. They then looked at her. You three, all right, let's do it together then. Determination came back to Tisha's eyes as she pulled with all her force. The young girls did the same. Tisha did not think much about it, but it was really a good thing that the clone girls were stronger than normal kids. See a clunk. With their combined force, the pod began to slowly open, until one third of it was open. Tisha let go of the tube and quickly reached inside the pod. She carefully extracted the clone girl. Null CG-12 had yet to open her eyes. Tisha just held her up in her arms. Was I too late? Her eyes began to fill with tears. Was the life of this little girl going to end like this? After she managed to survive where others had failed, would Tisha already lose one of her newly found family members? In this tense atmosphere, Tisha totally forgot about asking A4 to do a medical checkup. All her attention was focused on Null CG-12. The AI itself did not comment, applying its own latest order to keep quiet. You you are you. Finally, after what felt like hours to Tisha, Null CG-12 weakly groaned, exclamation mark. Tisha lost power in her legs and collapsed on the spot. She held Null CG-12 tightly to her chest as she began to cry of happiness. Null CG-11 then hugged the both of them, and the other clone girls followed soon after. They all stayed in this position for a while. After a bit of time, Null CG-12 finally opened her eyes. She looked up and met Tisha's warm gaze. Tisha patted her head her eyes still full of tears. Then finally, her voice trembling and full of emotion, Tisha said, Nice to meet you, Vinya. 30. Chapter 5. In front of Tisha, twelve clone girls were lined up with a somewhat tense atmosphere in the air. After Null CG-12, or rather, Vinya, woke up, she had eclipsed herself for a bit to take a shower and change into new clothes. She did not want to leave a dirty impression of herself to the girls. Wanting to impress them, she decided to put on the brand new military uniform she just designed. For the design, she was inspired by the Borkian military uniform she wore before. That uniform did not prevent any movement, something that she appreciated a lot. She also kept it low on useless decorations, instead opting to place multiple wide pockets to hold ammunition or equipment if needed. There was however one service ribbon present on her uniform. That ribbon was tricolored with deep blue on the left stripe, green in the center and orange on the right. There was a silver star on each stripe which complemented its design. This ribbon was made by A4, and Tisha reluctantly agreed to wear it after the AI insisted for her to wear it. Its meaning was to show that she was the owner of Clone Installation 3. But it wasn't like there was anybody to see it. Until now that is. 
The ribbon was highly visible on her plain white uniform, which was also very visible. Tisha was not quite satisfied with the design yet, but it would do for now. To her, white was better than the dull grey colour of the Borkians' military uniforms, which she had complained about to Rika. Besides that, she also had a military cap. She had adorned it with golden lines to amplify the white and black materials. Something missed in the center however, there was no emblem, leaving a blank space. Tisha also had two pistol holsters on her hips. Even though the design was a prototype, and whatever use she was gonna make of it, she wanted to have a weapon on herself, just in case something happened and she would need to defend herself. A bad habit from her past experiences as an orphan as well as in the military. Not everybody was your comrade. Meanwhile, A4 had directed the clone girls to an empty room on the fourth floor, and she joined them after finishing changing. Now there she was standing in front of the girls, who lined up by their numbers order without thinking. All of them looked the same, same height, same grey eyes, and same messy white hair with black tips that reached their waist. If a stranger came in, he wouldn't be able to differentiate between them. Tisha wasn't a stranger though. Even now, she could tell who was who. Maybe it has something to do with the cloning process. She did not know, but it was a happy discovery for her. She had been scared of confounding them. Seeing their faces, which were beginning to show emotions such as curiosity, Tisha thought that it really was a good idea to put the uniform on. This would make this moment even more memorable for all of them. After all, Tisha was about to give names to each of them, but first, there was something important she had to do. I haven't presented myself, so, you, let's begin from there. She said then put her right hand to her chest, straightened herself and looked at the clone girls. My name is Tisha, and, you, ah, scratch that. She loosened up and scratched her head with the right hand. I'm your creator? No, that doesn't sound right. You, I am the person you were created after. You are my clones, my very first clones. But I don't want to refer to you like that. She raised both hands toward them. So, let's be a family. You are human beings in your own rights, so you deserve one. Is it okay with you all? All the clone girls nodded their heads in unison. Tisha was happy, and the girls seemed to be happy too albeit a bit confused. She could see small smiles starting to appear here and there. She thanked A4 in her mind because the AI had reminded her that they should be able to speak right about now. They did not speak yet, but Tisha was impatiently waiting for the moment she could hear their voices. Tisha then put her right hand to her chest again. Since we are family, we should act and present ourselves like ones, right? They all nodded back expectations in their eyes, all right, then from now on, call me big sis, I'll be your big sister and raise you all well, Tisha said that with excitement, however, the clone girls froze, they then stared at Tisha with various expressions, there was sadness, disappointment, reluctant faces and blank faces, all those expressions quickly disappeared, Tisha felt those gazes, but carried on as if nothing happened, now then, on to why you are all gathered here. Tisha took a serious tone, and all the clone girls returned to their expressionless faces. They were straight like soldiers. I will give you all a name. The clone girls all tilted their head to the right. They did not understand what she meant, but this action dealt critical damage to Tisha. T too cute. This is just too pure. They're gonna kill me with cuteness. God, was I this cute when I was a kid? Nope. No way. They're just special. Tisha's internal debate about the origin of the clone girl's cuteness was interrupted when she heard a timid voice. Ahum Null CG09 raised her hand timidly. Yes? Tisha jumped out of her thoughts, and Null CG09 rapidly lowered her hand, even averting her gaze. Oh no. I scared her. That's kind of cute too. What is it? Dear little sister, she said in her most tender voice to reassure the clone girl. I won't be angry. You can speak out. What do you want to know? After a bit of hesitation, and an encouraging look coming from her clone sisters and Tisha's warm gaze, Null CG09 must had some courage. W-H-Y-S-H should we get a second name? W we already have one. Oh dear. Tisha closed on Null CG09. The young girl closed her eyes, as if scared to get hit. Instead, she felt a warm hand on her head. When she opened her eyes, Tisha was crouching in front of her so their gazes were at the same level. What you have is not a real name, 
It's just numbers from a code used to classify you before your birth. Tisha rose up and then looked at all the clone girls. I don't want to consider you as simple objects, hence why I will give you real names. She then walked over until she was just in front of Null CG01. She crouched to meet her gaze and then warmly said, From now on, you are Lysia. She patted her head. You are the eldest of the group, so please take care of your little sisters. From now on, Null CG01. No, Lysia, nodded back. Then Tisha repeated her actions with Null CG02. Your name is Rhea. Please help your eldest sister take care of the others. I will. Rhea nodded. Tisha continued on, naming Null CG03 Willia and Null CG04 Nilia. She took her time for every clone girl, saying some words to each one of them. Then came Null CG05 and Null CG06's turns. Since the both of them always stuck together, Tisha named them both at the same time. Null CG05's name is Miria, and Null CG06's name is Tyria. Please continue to help each other in the future, she said as he patted Mirian on the head with her left hand and Tyria's head with the right hand. After that, Tisha named Null CG07 Lydia and Null CG08 Nisha. And now there she was. Back in front of Null CG09, the young girl trembled as she waited to receive her name, not out of fear, but excitement. Tisha smiled. Now, your real name is Mia. Do you like it? Mia. Null CG09 repeated the name. I. I like it. Thank you very much. He he. I'm glad you like it Tilda. She gave a short hug to Mia. Then she crouched in front of Null CG10. And you my dear, from now on your name is Mia. Do you like it? She patted her head. But then something Tisha had not expected came back. Un, I like it. Please take care of us, mother. Tisha's hand froze in place. Wh what did she just say? She began to panic. No way no way. I am not a mother. Absolutely not. Never. She denied it strongly in her mind, and as she did, she felt a strange emotion stir up in her chest. Ha 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 ha. I think you misunderstood something. I'm your big sis. Not your mother, understand? Is that so? Nia said. Tisha could again feel various emotions directed at her. Only, they were a bit stronger this time. Still, just like the pain in her chest, she chose to ignore them. Nia changed her expression to a smile then said. I'm Nia from now on. Thanks, big sister. Ha ha ha. Tisha forced herself to laugh, though, in her head, she was thinking about what Nia just said. This girl, the way she said it. Sounds like she might call me mother again in the future. I hope she doesn't do that often. I'll need to watch her carefully. Note. This is the reason why this unit was opposed to. Not now A4. Can't you see that we are bonding with each other right now? Tisha shot down A4's retort before he even had the time to finish. Now Tisha was in front of Null CG11, who was also expecting her name. Ever since their first interaction, Tisha could not stop herself from wanting to spoil the girl. Her mannerism was just too cute. Your name is Tysenia. Let's take care of each other, okay? Anna, Tysenia hugged Tisha without warning, surprising her a bit before she returned the hug. There, there she patted Tysenia's back. Ah, Tisha's eyes met Vinya's, causing the latter to push a little exclamation and avert her eyes. Even though she already received her name, she was clearly waiting for her turn. This fact made Tisha smile at her. She finished her hug with Tysinia then crouched in front of Vinya. Let's do it correctly this time, okay? Anna. Vinya nodded back. And Tisha smiled before making a serious expression. Null CG12. You will be known as Vinya from now on. Yes, I am Vinya. Vinya answered energetically, which made Tisha laugh. Then, Tysinia suddenly hugged Vinya. Fue. Vinya let out a strange voice then looked at Tysinia. I am Tysinia the young clone girl pointed at herself, then she pointed at Vinia. You are Vinia. Vinia was bewildered, but seeing Tysinia's smile, she smiled back, returned the hug, and answered. Yes, you are sister Tysinia, and I am Vinia. The both of them began to giggle while repeating their names. Tisha watched silently, a large smile on her face. Those two are really the cutest. Oh no. They're gonna make me melt if they continue to smile like that. When she tried to look away, her eyes fell on Tyria and Miria who were just holding hands while smiling at each other. Gosh, that's cute too. Everywhere she looked, 
The only thing she saw in her eyes was cute clone girls doing cute things. As her thoughts were going in a weird direction again, her stomach made a loud noise, and every clone girl stopped what they were doing and looked at her with big eyes. Yum, ha ha ha, it seems like I am hungry, she said embarrassingly as her cheeks turned red. Would you all like to eat? As if her words were a secret key word, multiple growlings could be heard. The eyes of the clone girls had stars, and some even began to drool. Tisha burst into a laugh. That's a really funny reaction. Tears started to appear in her eyes. Everyone's hungry, huh? All right then. Let's go eat. I'm sure something good is waiting for all of us at the cafeteria. I wonder what it's gonna be Tilda, recall. Owner Tisha should already know the menu since she was the one who insisted on choosing La S. Stop. Don't say more A4. This is supposed to be a surprise. Night time. Tisha watched over a room with 13 mats on the floor. 12 of them were already occupied. The last one, of course, was for Tisha. Tisha recalled the events that led to this scene as she watched the sleeping faces of the kids. After eating a delicious meal of lasagna at the cafeteria, Tisha led the clone girls around all clone installation 3 except the first floor. She watched over them as their expressions changed depending on the rooms they were in. As time passed, the clone girls grew tired. Since they were still young, Tisha judged they would need to go to sleep soon and, after having super, she helped the girls change into newly made pajamas. But then, as she was going to affiliate rooms for the girls, Tysinia and Vinia begged her to sleep with them. Tisha wanted to agree immediately, but after a quick look at the faces of the other clone girls, she decided it would be unfair for only those two to sleep with her. In the end Tisha proposed a compromise. Since it would be their first night, they would all sleep together inside the same room like a big family. It was happily accepted by all clone girls. Right now, Tisha was the only one awake. All the clone girls had already gone to dreamland under her watchful eyes. She eclipsed herself silently from her bed, and sneaked out without making any noise. A4 stood in the hallway. He was waiting for her. When she was out of the room, the both of them silently walked away. They mounted up to the third floor, where they entered a room full of lighted up screens. So, how's the situation outside? Tisha asked, not losing a minute. Her tone was dead serious. Report. During the day, signs of activity have been detected yet again near the sector. Recon drones have reported an increasing presence of life forms within close perimeter of clone installation 3, displaying collected images on screens. Tisha looked at the screens. As expected, it's the Republicans. Tisha recognized the green uniforms of the Ionian Republic. In one of the images, she saw them interacting with officers from the 608th Infantry Escort Company. The following days after Tisha woke up, she had ordered A4 to keep an eye on the situation outside. The soldiers of the 608th Infantry Escort Company had received reinforcement, probably from their associated brigade. Soon after, A4 intercepted one of their transmissions which was destined to the Ionian Republic. In the end, I just got caught up in something big by accident. Tisha sighed. It wasn't like defection was a rare thing within the Borkian military. Since military units often had a backer which financed them or built the unit from scratch, like Brigadier General Rika, it wasn't something strange for them to follow their leader when he or she was defecting. When she first learned of this, Tisha wondered just how the Borkian Confederation had yet to be plunged into a civil war. This time however, it seemed that the scale of the defection was bigger. Seems like this will become a headache. Tisha sighed again as she folded her arms under her chest and sat down on a nearby chair. Usually, the one dealing with those kinds of problems would be her direct superior, Rika Doesen. She would just follow the orders given to her. She wasn't interested in those people's squabbles at the time. But from now on however, she would need to pay attention to it. Right now. She found herself in the middle of a brewing conflict between the Borkian Confederation and the Ionian Republic. At first she thought she should just stay quiet, since this didn't concern her, but then she thought about the reasons why a conflict would appear here. They want to secure clone installation 3 for themselves. Tisha knew that Brulia 7 was contested between the two powers, but she did not really know why. Now however, she could see where it was coming. A4, 
set all human beings within the perimeter from neutral to enemy order received. All human forms within the perimeter and associated with the Borkian Confederation or the Ionian Republic have been recognized as enemies. Tisha could already imagine what would happen if any of the two factions discovered Clone Installation 3's real power, that was why she ordered such a drastic move. If any of them attempts to enter the installation, don't spare them, alright? Orders received. Unaccepted tentative of entrance within the installation shall be met with security drones. Tisha nodded her head. She thought about the clone girls, now that she had decided to take care of them. She needed to keep them secret and assure their protection. If she had to, she would even come out herself. Speaking of which, what's the progress on my armored suit? Notification, armored suit's fabrication progress is up to 85%. Estimating time until completion. Three days, that's good. If I come out, I wouldn't want anyone recognizing me. She would take any measure necessary. She didn't know if she would meet someone she knew, but even if she did, she would not spare them, even her old superior. Right now. She wasn't second-class Tisha of the 9th Special Assault Brigade, nor an orphan soldier of the Borkian Confederation. She was Tisha, owner of Clone Installation 3, and she had a family to protect. Whoever comes, I won't spare you. 32. Chapter 6 Long live the Confederation. Those were the first words Rika heard as she entered the freshly built command post in Sector B746. On the sides, soldiers making salutes formed a line along the two sides of the red carpet donning golden trims. They were the ones who shouted those words. Rika continued on as if nothing had happened. She passed the saluting men and walked on the red carpet. She was used to this kind of ceremonial entry. The higher-ups of the Borkian Confederation loved them and added them everywhere they could. This flaunted their ego and did nothing to help but it had been done so many times that it became tradition. Rika remembered Tisha saying a long time ago that she disliked this the most about the military. What was the need to flaunt your wealth on a battlefield? The tip of her mouth raised a little. She had to admit that Tisha was right. Still, since it was protocol, she herself wore a military uniform rich with decorations. Her uniform was the standard grey one issued by the Borkian military but the Borkian military was also very lax about the uniform. This allowed her to redesign her uniform however she wanted. In addition to the golden and silver trims and buttons on her uniform, she had added dark green lines on the extremities and the joints. This, with the addition of the emblem of her brigade, three silver spears crossing each other at the center on a dark green background, on her right sleeve, made her unit recognizable by all. Of course. She also had shoulder pads and a necktie inscribed with two golden stars. They indicated her rank. Finally, she had a multitude of medals and service ribbons attached on her chest, right where her heart was. She arrived in front of the closed doors guarded by heavily armed soldiers. A soldier in an armored suit stopped her. Please introduce yourself ma'am. She nodded. This was also part of the protocol since they could already tell who she was. Rika took out a card from pocket and gave it to the man. He inserted it into his suit, and, after a few seconds, Brigadier General Do Essen, the meeting will soon begin. Please follow me. He gave her back her card and she nodded at his words. The guards opened the door, then she followed the man in the armored suit. Rika sighed internally. Twenty days after receiving her orders, Rika had arrived in Sector B746, where Borkian troops were gathering before entering the conflict zone, B745. As soon as she did, she immediately received a convocation from the highest placed officer taking part in the mission, indicating that the person was already there for the meeting. All of this was bothering her. The higher-ups had sent a high-graded general to lead the operation without telling who until the last minute. The only thing she knew was that her presence was imperatively needed for today's meeting, and that she could not use a hologram to participate from a distant location. The secrecy policy made her a bit tense as it was unusual. Still, she complied with her orders and hurried over. The armored man guided her inside a room already packed with military staff, all seated around a big table. Rika could see some faces she recognized, both good and bad ones. She nodded at each of them. Her expression remained neutral throughout all this. When she reached her seat, she sat down immediately, then removed her military cap, 
At that moment, the man to her left called her, General Doe Essen, I see they called you too. She turned her head to her left, she recognized the old man. Oh, greetings, General Poltok. Yes, they called me here too. The old man to her left was Major General Birdo Poltok. He was a war veteran with whom she had already collaborated in the past. They were on friendly terms. If you're here, that means you brought the old devils with you? Indeed, while not all troops are there yet, my devils will be hunting Republicans very soon. The old man said with a smirk, he was already salivating for prey. The old devils recommended was Birdo's unit the 15th Mechanized Division. Because they were battle-hardened veterans who contributed a lot in multiple battles, they got the nickname of the Old Devils, and Birdo was the embodiment of those devils. Seeing him, Rika once again assessed the seriousness of the mission. If it wasn't important, the higher-ups would not send two of their more experienced units on the same battlefield. Now that I think about it, I don't see your bodyguard today. Birdo looked around. He was searching for Tisha, which would usually follow Rika around. Is she sick? No. Rika shook her head. She has been reported as missing since a month ago. What? Birdo had a hard time understanding what Rika just said. He knew Tisha's battle record. While it wasn't rare for her to be written as missing in a report, she would usually show up two or three days later, reporting her success in her mission. Did she die? Birdo murmured next to Rika's ear. Even though he thought it was unlikely, he still needed to confirm. Having known both women for some years now, Birdo grew attached as much to Tisha than to Rika, both of which could be his granddaughter's age-wise. Strictly speaking, he also recognized the duo as invaluable assets of the Borkian military. To him, there might as well represent the future of the Borkian Confederation. Rika shook her head, answering Birdo's question. It's more complicated than that. Even now, Rika had this slight feeling that Tisha was still alive somehow. Maybe she would come back to her camp and find the girl waiting there to give her report. All dirtied up but safe and sound. Is that so? Well you can tell me more about it later. It seems like the meeting will start soon. Just like Birdo said, the doors of the meeting room were opened plainly. A group of people stood there in gaudy but still grey uniforms full of medals and golden trims. All people within the room stood up and saluted when they saw a handsome young man, the most decorated of all. At the head of the group, the man looked around the room, before entering he let out in a calm, yet authoritarian voice. At ease. Just like that, everybody came back to what they were doing. That's General David Fika. Birdo then silently said to Rika, he's a rising star within the command center, and has been building a lot of influence. Rumors say he might soon be a candidate for the presidential elections. Rika nodded her head, she had heard of the man from her connections, but they weren't praising words. While she did not doubt his skills, the rumors she had gathered told that General David Fika was a cunning politician more than a military man and that he frequently accepted bribes. General Fika took his seat at the end of the table. Everybody present in the room looked at him. He rapidly scanned his papers, then spoke. Ahem. Now that everyone is here, let us begin the meeting. The room quieted down. The general continued. First, a report from the 506th Cavalry Company. Captain Roller, you may speak. Yes, General. Thank you. Captain Roller stood up, saluted, then spoke up. We have confirmed the presence of Republican troops within Sector B-745 since one week ago. As soon as they arrived, they secured a perimeter and integrated the defectors within their ranks. We estimate their forces to be similar to ours in numbers of men, with a slight superiority on their side. Here are the locations where my men found a concentration of troops. Some of them are camps. Some are defensive positions or quickly made fortifications, and others are just patrol routes. As she spoke, a 3D map appeared on the table for everyone to see. Red dots lit up on the map to indicate where enemy troops were gathering. Additionally, pictures appeared to justify her words. When she finished her report, whispers could be heard here and there as some officers were commenting on the data. General Fika then asked her a question, silencing the room. Did they try to enter the old facility? No sir, not yet at least. Good, you may sit down. After Captain Roller sat down, General Fika smiled and spoke again. 
it would seem luck is still on our side, gentlemen. The enemy has yet to steal our prize. Our first priority is to enter Sector B-745 and install a command center. Once done, we will slowly deploy our troops. Everyone nodded. All that was said was in accordance with the current military thought. There was no need to rush into battle, all guns blazing. Building a command structure and preparing logistics came first. The last time the Borkian Confederation tried to rush into battle was 30 years ago against the Techno Empire of Filio. They suffered a humiliating defeat and had to cede an entire planet to them. Hence, military doctrine now insisted on well planned maneuvers. Now then, let's affiliate responsibilities. The general continued. I order the 15th Mechanized Division to deploy itself and be ready to engage the enemy at any moment. The 9th Special Assault Brigade shall be put under Major General Poltok as a support unit. Everybody nodded at his words as he was pointing at some places on the map. Green dots then appeared where he pointed and followed the direction of his fingers. Then he continued on. The 612th and 615th Infantry Regiments shall join me as we close in on the abandoned facility. The 506th Cavalry Company shall be put in reserve in case reinforcement is needed somewhere. Any questions? One of the officers raised his hand, then spoke. General, can we expect to receive aerial support? General Fika shook his head. No. Area law spatial strikes and even artillery strikes are prohibited for this operation. The facility must be secured intact. There were some frowns from some of the officers, when General Fika saw that. He continued, if you have anything else to say about the battle plan, please raise your hand. Nobody raised a hand except Rika. Yes, Brigadier General Doe Essen. Sir, I understand your eagerness in securing and exploring the abandoned facility. But please reconsider. Engaging only half of our forces would put us at a great disadvantage, and if we do not get any support, how are we going to prepare for our assault? The Republicans would rain hell on us. Rika made a point, and the other officers nodded in agreement. Rika and Birdo's forces would make a total of 15,000 men, and there were another 15,000 men available from the two infantry regiments. If they, like Captain Roller had said, were already numerically inferior. They would have a hard time holding the line against the Republicans without making sacrifices. Besides, they were the one attacking, and from what the report just said, the enemy had already prepared their defenses. If, unlike the Borkian military, the Republicans didn't care about the state of the facility, their forces would suffer heavily under aerial strikes or artillery strikes. All in all, they wouldn't come out of this skirmish unscathed. Something that Shrieker, as well as Birdo, wanted to avoid. Both of them wanted to keep their losses to the minimum. What Brigadier General Dewesson said is understandable. However, I can only dispatch five more infantry squads from the infantry regiments to the front line. General Fika said, that would mean around 6,500 more men would be added to Rico and Birdo's forces. Before new hands could be raised, the general continued, this is a code red operation. I am under strict orders from the field marshal. The government has asked for the abandoned facility to be explored at all cost before the Republicans. This is unnegotiable. I need the rest of the manpower to secure the site. As for retaliation strikes, there is no need to worry. The Republicans want this facility as much as we want. They wouldn't dare hit it. A silence followed. The general had made it clear that there would be no more discussions on the subject. Code Red was a term employed when a mission was given by the President of the Borkian Confederation and his cabinet. The terms could in no way be changed. No officer asked any more questions, except Trika who raised her hand again. General, I understand that we are in no place to change our orders right now, but could you at the very least give us the reason why this abandoned facility must be explored at all cost? I need something to motivate my men. This was a question that nobody dared to ask after General Fika had mentioned that the operation was under code red. It was not that they were prohibited to know, but that asking this could endanger you in the eyes of the ones who gave the mission. Rika did not care much about this, since she had managed to prove her neutrality to the political factions, just like Birdo. And yet, when General Fika looked at Rika while smiling, Rika immediately felt chills in her back. I understand your concerns Brigadier General, however, 
I cannot say it. He paused for a moment, like he was thinking of something. That's right, Brigadier General. I read in the reports that one of your soldiers was transferred to the 608th Infantry Escort Company just before they defected. Exclamation mark. Cold sweat began to form on Rika's head. If I am correct, you were quite close to that soldier, right? You must be quite worried about her right now. Rika paled. She understood what the general secretly meant by saying this. What he actually meant was, shut up and stay at your place. Stop bothering me. Else I'll make you a scapegoat for the defection that just happened. Why don't you motivate your troops by announcing that this is a rescue operation? I'm sure your troops would gladly accept. General Fika said, still smiling. Understood, General. Now that this is settled, let us begin our preparations. We should set out as soon as possible. We are limited by time after all. General Fika closed the discussion and passed to the next thing on the program for the meeting. Everyone did the same, except Rika, whose mind was somewhere else. Rika was in a tight spot. She would not be able to have any part in important discussions now. She would just be scoffed out. The general had clearly shown that she wasn't considered a person of trust who was politically neutral. If she even dared to express herself again, General Fika would end her career on the spot. Birdo sent her a worried glance. Fortunately she was working under him for this mission. As the meeting continued on about small details such as food rationing, Rika promised herself that she would explain her situation to the old devil in front of a good meal with expensive alcohol. 26. Chapter 7. It was already one week after the clone girls came out of their nutrition pods. Tisha spent her entire days with the girls. She had ordered A4 to create a whole playground for them on the fourth floor. They played a lot of games together. Those moments would stay engraved in Tisha's memories. In fact, she even ordered A4 to record the scene and take some photos. But playing with the clone girls wasn't the only thing Tisha was happy about. Within a week the girls had begun to forge their own unique personalities. To celebrate this fact, she had helped each girl find the hairstyle that they liked the most. Each clone girl found the hairstyle they liked, albeit, Tisha had forced every one of them to keep their hair long, selfishly saying she preferred it that way. Only two clone girls did not really search for a hairstyle for themselves. The first was Tysenia, she said to Tisha that she could do her hair in whatever way Tisha wanted, which caused critical damage to Tisha for the umphist time. In the end Tisha arranged Tysenia's hair into twin tails. In her opinion, Tysenia's cuteness was doubled with this hairstyle. The second clone girl was, surprisingly, Lysia. When asked what hairstyle she would prefer, the girl simply said she didn't care. A bit troubled, Tisha gave her the same hairstyle she had, albeit with her hair still reaching her waist and no lock reaching her eyes like Tisha. At the moment, Tisha had left the girls by themselves in the playground. She trusted they wouldn't hurt themselves anyway. Right now Tisha had something important to do with A4, and that was testing the armored suit, which she had postponed. When Tisha entered the armory, A4 guided her to the left side. They entered another room with empty shelves. However, at the end of the room, there was a stage with multiple mannequins standing side by side. All were naked, except one at the center. What the mannequin wore was the armor Tisha had designed with the help of A4. A4, is this? Answer, this is the armored suit owner Tisha and this unit designed together. I thought so. Tisha gulped. She had dreamed of getting one of those, and now, an armored suit, one she had designed was finally standing in front of her. The armor was a bit black but mostly white. From the distance, it only looked like plastic hard parts stuck together, but this wasn't the case. Tisha recalled A4 telling her the hard parts of the armor were composed of a mix of three materials. The main component was a metal alloy called rudium. It was a light yet very solid metal alloy that could protect her against hard projectiles. The second component was a special type of carbon fiber that from A4's own words, was capable of absorbing shocks and diffuse energy throughout a section of the armor to a certain degree. This function would be very useful against laser blasters' fire. The last component was a variant type of bioplastic material that helped combine the two other components and let them stick together. It was also the reason why the armor appeared to have this shiny white plastic appearance. 
The hard parts with those materials were separated into multiple pieces of armor that protected vital parts of the body while not restraining any movement. For example, beside the chest plate, there were four arms protectors, reinforced boots, elbow and knee protectors, tibia protectors and much more. Because of that, each part that could not be covered by hard parts, like the joints, were protected by a black skin suit worn under the armor. The skin suit was composed of the same carbon fiber material as well as an endurant and insulating biotextile. The belt was also made so that different types of equipment could be hooked on it with ease. Finally, there was what Tisha thought was the coolest part of the design. The helmet. It covered all her head and had a T-shaped visor tinted blue with black's borders. It had a helmet crest that began at the front until the back of the head in an elongated way. This was added by Tisha. She argued that it made the helmet cooler that way. Of course, the armor was full of electronic components. The helmet came equipped with an air filter, communication devices of multiple types, and a HUD that would assist the user's vision with multiple apps. For example, it had a target tracking system. The armor also came equipped with a small energy shield generator, but when used, the one wearing it could not use any weapon. Overuse of the energy shield could also lead to overheating of the armor. To power all of this, the armor also had a small energy generator which provided infinite energy. Finally, in addition to all that, complementary armor was added in the form of great pauldrons on each shoulder and a synthetic black leather that covered the back of the legs, called by A4 a karma. The design was still no more than a prototype that Tisha could remodel later, but for now, she was enamored with it. Can I wear it? Notification. This armored suit hasn't been made to be observed, its primary purpose is to protect owner Tisha from serious injuries. Tisha rolled her eyes. Was that a joke? This unit only states the obvious. Right. Tisha was sure the AI enjoyed itself when it said that. She did not comment more. This kind of exchange had become common between the two of them when nobody else was present. So, can you give me instructions on how to wear it? She asked A4. Although she badly wanted an armored suit, she had no knowledge on how to operate it. Notification. Owner Tisha should first begin by wearing the skin suit. The skin suit has a zipper on the front. Hard parts of the armor can be clipped and unclipped easily by the owner. Tisha nodded. She undressed the mannequin and headed to a changing room that was prepared nearby. After undressing herself and only keeping her underwear, she put on the skin suit. It immediately adjusted the temperature for her, something that Tisha greatly appreciated. Then she put every part of the armor on except the helmet, which she kept under her right arm. The first thing she did was test if she could move correctly in it. There are some points that could be upgraded, but overall the performance seems good, she murmured to herself. It's a bit tight on the chest though. She looked herself into the mirror. Wow. She was a bit amazed. Somehow, the armor did not let out a bulky impression. Quite the contrary. It embraced her forms quite perfectly. Also, for some reason, her hair was let as it is, flowing behind her. Now then. Let's test it. Tisha went to the training ground on the second floor. A4 had prepared equipment for her to test out the armor. She did not say a word as she put on her helmet. Its integrated HUD lit on. From outside, this made the T-shaped visor shine a faint blue color. Tisha grabbed her weapons that were posed nearby. Then, when she heard a siren, she rushed out into the park or ahead, which was in the devastated town environment type. Her HUD signaled to her the presence of enemies to her right. She hid behind a wall, took out her rifle, which she had put on her shoulder, and discreetly searched for the enemy. She found two drones patrolling the zone, and she proceeded to shoot them down quickly. After confirming their destruction, she continued on. Each time she disabled a drone, her HUD would lock onto the next target. When danger came, it would also alert her of the incoming enemies from her blind spots. After a while, the difficulty of the exercise was increased by A4. Tisha slowly found herself encircled by drones, which began shooting low lethality laser beams at her. Her amazing reflexes permitted her to evade most of them. However, some still found her. Tisha flinched and stepped back a little from the impact, but that was all. The next moment, she threw away her rifle and took out her pistols. She began shooting at every drone around her. Each of her shots found their targets. 
disabling them. After eliminating all of them, a siren was heard. This meant the end of the training session. End of the training session. User Tisha has beaten her record by 300 points. She looked at her hands, then gripped strongly. She was still in good shape. This is amazing. She exclaimed. She was very happy about the performance of the armor. It did not bother her movements and provided good protection. Now Tisha could move more freely on the battlefield without always worrying about getting hit. Tisha happily walked back to the entrance of the room where A4 was waiting for her. When she saw the AI's drone, she called out, A4, that was really amazing. With this I can. She stopped in her tracks. A4's drone was there, but it wasn't alone. Tisha could see heads sticking out from behind the entrance. As soon as those heads noticed her gaze, they quickly retreated back behind the door, only for one head to slowly stick back out at a time and look in her direction with stars in their eyes. Oh that's so cute. Tisha melted for a moment. Wait, not that. This is not the moment. Tisha, get a grip on yourself. You can all come out. I know you're there. The heads behind the door were startled, to Tisha's amusement. Then, one clone girl slowly revealed herself and approached her. Soon after, four other clone girls revealed themselves and followed behind. They were Rhea, Willia, Miria, Tyria, and Nia. I said everybody, so come out too. Lydia, I know you're there. A bit of time after Tisha said that, Lydia came out from behind her, coming from the ruined city landscape. She had been hiding in the room from the beginning. What are you all doing here? Tisha asked, removing her helmet. The clone girls looked at each other. Then all their gazes passed on Rhea. They wanted her to explain, it seems, we were searching for you. We wanted to eat dinner together. The girl, who emanated a more mature look than her sisters, finally said that. Oh, is it already time? Tisha did not even look at the time. She was too focused on what she was doing. Noticing uneasy glances from the clone girls, Tisha smiled at them. Did you think Big Sis would get angry because you left the playground without permission? They nodded. Tisha's smile deepened. I'm not angry, you know? I trust you are all good girls, you can go wherever you want. If there is a place you can't get in, A4 would have told you. A4 was currently monitoring the clone girls with another drone. In case something happened. He would directly report it to Tisha just as she ordered. And what about you Lydia? I was searching for a quiet place. Lydia said quietly. So it was the case. Well, that's fine. Tisha had remarked the girl liked quiet places, so she did not bother her when she entered the room herself. Besides, the training drones wouldn't hurt her since A4 controlled them. As Tisha was about to go to the changing room to change herself, she heard someone. Yume, big sis. Yes. What is it, Nia? Can I take a closer look at what you are wearing? A. Eh? Tisha did not expect this kind of question coming from Nia. After the small incident when Tisha gave names to the clone girls, Nia had put a form of distance from Tisha by not asking questions for two days. When Tisha wondered how to fix things, Nia intensively began to act carefully. Tisha took that as Nia forgetting about the event and finally beginning to grow up emotionally. They played a lot of games together after that. During those games, Tisha had noticed that Nia was the most playful of the group. It was a bit worrisome that she did not show much interest in anything else but playing. But seeing Nia expressing curiosity for an object, Tisha could not refuse. Sure. Here take a look at it. She gave Nia her helmet. It wasn't that heavy, so even a young girl could carry it. What Big Sis is wearing is an armored suit. It will help Big Sis when she is outside for work tilde. Whoa. Neil examined the helmet carefully, like it was an object that could break at any time. The other clone girls also looked at the helmet with curiosity. So cool. Tisha did not know who said that, but it made her kind of proud of herself. Right tilde? Big Sis designed it herself with the help of A4 tilde. Then... Nia demanded. Can I make one too? A. Tisha did not know how to respond. The stars in the eyes of Nia were so big she could swear they looked like the ones in the galaxy. The girl had not shown much interest in anything else, so she was happy that she found something that interested her. However, she couldn't let a kid play with military gear. Even to her, there was a limit. I'm sorry. But you can't, she said with a sorry look. You are too young to play with those. I see. Nia looked very sad, which made Tisha feel bad. 
but Nia did not give up. When I grow up, can I make one? She asked with puppy eyes. Do you feel a critical hit? Tisha struggled for a moment. Still, she did not change her mind. Even if you grow up, I don't know if I'll let you wear one. You need to train like Big Sis to wear one of those armor tilde. You mean the cool things Big Sis was doing just now? Willia intervened. I wanna do that. She then joined Mia and made puppy eyes too. Gaha. Damage accumulated as Tisha let out another weird noise. If this continued, Tisha wouldn't be able to resist. She looked around to change her ideas, only to fall on the stairs of both Miria and Tyria. They were clearly demanding for it too. Gyu. Another blow was dealt. If this continued, she would cede. No. I have to remain strong. I can't let those kids become child soldiers like me. T. They need to have a normal life. She looked at A4, her lowly eye, for support. Suggestion. Training the Null class clone girls might be beneficial for Ona Tisha's safety. You too, A4? It was a complete betrayal. Then, Tisha looked at the two clone girls who hadn't said anything. Lydia was sitting on a chair, looking uninterested, but the regular glances she sent from time to time told all the contrary. Then, Tisha met Rhea's gaze. Sisters, let's stop there. We're bothering big sis. A E Tilda? A way out appeared. Tisha beamed, while the other clone girls looked a bit dejected. Tisha sighed in relief, but then Rhea approached her. You know, big sis, everyone wants to be useful and help you. Since we're a family, aren't we supposed to help each other? Another blow was dealt. Tisha's health bar was in the red. Since this is what we want to do, why not do it all together with the other sisters too? Or is it that you don't want us to help you? Rhea said with a sad look. All right, I get it. I'll train you all. Tisha raised her arms. The clone girls had one. Really? I'm glad. Thank you big sis. As if the sad look was an illusion. Rhea let out a big smile. Shocking Tisha. Behind Rhea, the other clone girls high-fived, except Lydia, who just smiled and silently left. Then we'll go announce it to the others. Let's train all together under big sis. Yeah Tilda. The clone girls all left the room in a hurry while giggling. Meanwhile, Tisha just stood there. Her mind had yet to process what just happened. The clone girls had used their one and only weapon to win against Tisha. I've been outmatched. Notification. Null class clones, albeit powerful, are not capable of overwhelming their gene source. Tisha turned her head towards A4 while smiling, but her eyes were not. Question mark. Tisha then suddenly grabbed her helmet and threw it on A4 with all her force. It just bounced off. Question mark. Humphrey, this is revenge for just now. Tisha stood up, and, while pouting, she left the room, leaving a confused AI behind. What should I do about the armor? Keep it as it is. Tisha is too lazy to change it anyway. Votes, 250.0%. A4 will reshape it behind Tisha's back. Votes, 125.0%. Armor is not important. I want more of the clone girls. Votes. 125.0% total voters, formidable. This poll was closed on Mar 18, 2023 425 AM, 24, Chapter 8. Twelve clone girls wearing red track suits were lined up in order, their eyes looking at Tisha with expectations. It was the afternoon, just after the clone girls had managed to convince Tisha to train them. They all gathered at the training ground on the second floor. At the beginning, Tisha still hesitated. She blurted out an excuse that the clone girls did not have clothes in which to train into. This argument of hers was quickly shot down when A4 appeared with newly made track suits for the clone girls. Now she was sure that the AI was on the clone girls' side from the beginning. If there was a thing that consoled her, it was seeing the girls wearing track suits. She felt healed when they wore them. Meanwhile, Tisha had kept her skin suit and just removed the rest of the armor. She was too lazy to change. Now then, I will ask again. But are you sure you all want to be trained? Tisha asked. This would be the last chance for her to stop everything. However, the clone girls had already made up their minds. They all nodded at her. Tisha sighed. I understand. But just so you know, we won't stop the training after we've begun. It will be something done every day. Is that clear? Again. The clone girls nodded. Tisha's attitude then suddenly changed. 
Her posture changed from a relaxed pose to a tense and rigid one. She then told the clone girls, First, we will train your bodies and learn some self-defense moves while being unarmed. It is important that you girls learn to defend yourselves first. Second, during training, I will treat you all like soldiers and not as little sisters. I don't want to see one of you fall back behind, so until I am satisfied with each of you, we will not learn anything else. All the clone girls nodded again, but some had disappointed expressions on their faces. Tisha did not care and continued on. Then we will begin by doing laps of the training ground, right now. The clone girls were startled by the change in atmosphere. They did not move. They only looked at each other. Tisha then harshly yelled. What did I just tell you? Soldiers, get on the move. Now, the clone girls were startled again by Tisha's harsh tone. She had never raised her voice like this before. This time, they all followed her order. The clone girls started to run, and Tisha accompanied them. Tisha's objective was to see the level of endurance the clone girls had. She had read in the reports done by A4 that clones had a stronger body than normal human children, but she didn't know to what extent. There was also the fact that each clone girl also had a specific set of genes enhanced, meaning there would be differences between them. As for Tisha's harsh voice, it was to clearly mark a difference between training time and her everyday self that the clone girls knew. Because she spoiled them a lot, there was a risk that the clone girls would not take her seriously. Besides, every drill instructor she had during her training was like that. Even her superior, Rika, treated her harshly when the both of them were training together. Her harshness was so strong that Tisha questioned whether she was doing it on purpose. I think I remember she even smiled. Geez, was she on that side of the spectrum? Tisha, let out a quick wry smile, remembering something silly again. She then made an expressionless face, silently looking over the clone girls who were running alongside her. The clone girls stuck together as a group, but she could see some differences that told her that every girl had their own pace. The ones that were at the head of the group were Willia and Lydia, while those that were lagging a bit behind were Nisha and Tysenia. They continued on for a while. As they were about to finish their third lap, Tisha noticed the girls at the end of the group were reaching their limit. She slowed down little by little, and when they finally finished the third lap, she said in a strong voice, We will stop here for now, good job everyone. All the clone girls slowed down. Some of them even sat down or lied down on the spot breathing hard, but still not out of breath, just when they thought they had finished. What are you all doing? Go drink some water and come back within five minutes, we'll do some stretching. Tisha clapped her hands as she said that. The clone girls that were down immediately got up and hurried over to A4, who brought water bottles who knows when. On her side, Tisha also drank a mouthful of water. She was surprised none of the clone girls had yet to complain. From what she had seen before while she received military education, kids around their age would usually always complain, even refusing to move. This would provoke the ire of their drill instructors, but that is another story. Whether it was because the clone girls were very motivated or because they were too scared to complain, Tisha did not know. Still, they were, after all, children, so Tisha had prepared herself for some complaints but it would seem she had underestimated the clone girl's stubbornness. Even after coming back, none of the clone girls began to complain. Tisha taught the girls some easy stretching moves, and they all did them without a hitch. Then, after a bit of time, Tisha stopped stretching. The girls also stopped when she did. Now, let's learn how to fight unarmed. This was what some of the girls were waiting for, and it showed in their expressions. The clone girls all nodded, waiting for Tisha's instructions. Tisha opened her arms wide, then she said, For the next ten minutes, I will fight you all together. So give me everything you have. This confused the girls yet again. What did Tisha mean by that? They did not know how to react. From the group, Rhea, which had by this point become the one her sisters looked at when they wanted to ask a question but were too timid to ask, raised her hand and spoke out. Yum, big sis. Call me instructor while we train. Instructor, what do you mean by giving you all we have? You did not teach us anything yet. That's right, I did not teach you any moves. Tisha affirmed, making the clone girls even more confused. She then continued, you see, as you are right now, 
teaching you my movements would only hinder your progression. It would be better for you all to begin by developing your own fighting style. Then, we can talk about me teaching you some moves. With that being the case, attack me. The clone girls did not move, hesitant looks on their faces. It's not that they could not attack Tisha. No, it was because they knew Tisha could beat them all quickly if she wanted. A4, set an alarm to ring in five minutes. Orders received, setting alarm to ring in five minutes. After saying this to A4, Tisha looked back at the girls. From now on until the alarm rings, I will only defend myself, so feel free to attack me. The clone girls looked at each other hesitantly, something inside them made them reluctant to attack Tisha. But as they hesitated, Willia suddenly charged out, surprising the others. Hiya! She punched Tisha with all her power, only for Tisha to stop her right fist with ease with the palm of her left hand. Willia did not give up however, she immediately made a roundhouse kick with her left leg. Tisha left Willia's right fist alone and just jumped back. Willia pursued her. She continued to exchange kicks and punches with Tisha until Tisha suddenly sidestepped to the left. She had just dodged a sidekick coming from behind, and the owner of that leg was none other than Lydia. While the others were still looking at the fight, she had sneaked out behind Tisha without anyone noticing. I missed, said the girl silently before retreating. Tisha smiled. Interesting, she timed her kick just at the right time. If Tisha had not noticed the girl from the beginning, Lydia's attack might have worked. Unfortunately for her, Tisha was still way ahead of her in terms of skills. Tisha continued to exchange some hits with Willia, who seemed to be having fun, for a while, until the other clone girls finally joined the fray. After a bit of hesitation, their instincts took in. The girls slowly encircled Tisha, who now defended herself from continuous blows. At first, the clone girls just striked hesitantly, wherever and whenever they could, not thinking much. Tisha dodged and blocked their blows with ease, but as time passed, the girls began to coordinate their strikes. From the group, Tisha particularly noted the amazing coordination Miria and Tyria showed up. In terms of coordination, they might be the best. They striked her simultaneously from different sides, forcing Tisha to take a step back each time. The other girls did not fall behind however, some girls showed an either aggressive or opportunistic aptitude with their own knacks. Rhea and Nisha were good examples of that. Both of them tried to hit Tisha's vitals, but while Rhea tried it when she made a continuation of strikes, Nisha, who seemed to be weaker than her sisters, waited instead for an opportunity to arise when Tisha was submerged by other blows from other clone girls. Faced with that Tisha had no room to play anymore and began to defend herself seriously. Then, after a while, Miria and Tyria suddenly grabbed both her arms and pulled with all they had. As Tisha resisted the pull, she suddenly heard a cute yell coming from behind. Yeah, something, or rather someone had jumped on her back, small legs locked on under her chest and hands around her neck. Eh hey, I got you. Now I have the high ground. Nia had managed to get herself on Tisha's back, then she began tickling Tisha around the neck. Nia did this because she knew that Tisha was sensible to tickling. She sometimes did this to Tisha during playing time. It did not seem to have the wanted effect however, and as she readied herself to execute her next move, an alarm resounded. Notification, five minutes have passed. Owner Tisha, eh? Nia froze for a moment. She then felt two hands grabbing her ankles forcefully removing her lock. Then, those same hands grabbed her wrists. And the next thing she knew, she was brought in front of Tisha. She only realized what was happening when Tisha Princess carried her. W wait. You, big sis. Tisha smiled at her. I didn't know you liked high places Nia. How about we play a game called plain? Cold sweets appeared on Nia's forehead. Something told her Tisha was dead serious right now. Nia might have flipped a switch without knowing it. P.L. Please way I woe Tilda. Tisha threw Nia high in the air, letting the poor girl scream at her first experience at flying. Still smiling, Tisha looked at her next prey. Nisha had frozen the moment Nia was thrown into the air. And now, Tisha gently tapped the back of her neck. Nisha lost power in her legs as her vision troubled. She fell unconscious on the spot. Now, who wants to join Nisha and take a nap? Tilda. Tisha asked still smiling, and the remaining clone girl's faces paled. 
Nia had definitely flipped a switch. Lydia made her move from behind, supported by Tyria and Miria. They striked at Tisha from three angles. Tisha dodged Lydia's high kick by lowering herself. She then grabbed Tyria's right leg and Miria's left leg. As she did, Mia was about to give her a kick with her right knee. Tisha just raised her hands, still grabbing the duo's legs. Miria and Tyria let out small screams as they lost balance and fell on the ground. Then Tisha closed on Mia who could not stop her action. She also got a gentle tap on the back of the neck, and joined Nisha into dreamland. Tisha then held out her arms, catching a still screaming Mia. They looked at each other. Wanna do it again? Eh? Wait. No tilde. Nia was back into the air. Tisha then set her eyes onto Willia and Nilia. Willia rushed at her, she directed her left fist at Tisha's stomach. Tisha immediately reacted, sidestepping, but as she was about to grab the girl's arm, a kick from Nilia stopped her movement and she had to sidestep again. That's a good move you made, Nilia Tilda. Defending your allies is important too, you all Tilda. Fue. Before Nilia knew it, Tisha was whispering in her ear. Right after hearing that, she began to feel sleepy and fell on the ground. Nilia. Willia exclaimed and rushed again, she charged, putting her left shoulder first. Tisha just sidestepped again at the last moment, but this time, she also gave a gentle tap to Willia's neck and put her right hand under the girl to hold her fall. She slowly put her on the ground, just as a familiar scream was coming close again. Tisha held out her arms yet again, catching Nia, who was by now crying. P.L. please, big sis, I am sorry. Don't do it again Tilda, Nia begged with tears in her eyes. One last time then, Tisha was merciless. No Tilda. Tisha passed on full offensive mode. She rushed at Tysinia who tried to punch her with her left fist, and grabbed her left wrist. Tysinia then tried to do a palm strike with her free arm, which Tisha caught too. Defenseless, Tisha in ear let out her ultimate weapon. Be big sis, you're scaring me. Please stop. She made her cutest puppy eyes. Sorry dear, but Tisha did not stop. The plan had failed. Tysinia in a panic tried to kick Tisha, but she had already left her hand alone and was targeting her neck. Tysinia joined the other sleeping clone girls. Right at that moment, Miria and Tyria came back, but Tisha didn't even let them begin their assault. They were taken out immediately, now for the third time. A scream came back from the artificial sky. Tisha held out her arms yet again, but this time, she immediately put Nia to sleep. Now then, Tisha looked at the remaining clone girls. Only Lysia, Rhea, Lydia and Vinia remained. They had stuck together so as to help each other. Tisha immediately approached them, she began with an assault of blows, which the girls somehow blocked and avoided by helping each other out. They're really doing a great job right now, Tisha thought but it's time to end this. She first struck Rhea, taking her out immediately. Lysia, Lydia and Vinia tried to fall back and regroup, but Tisha grabbed Lydia before she could join the other two, and she joined the sleeping group. Only Lysia and Vinia remain now. I have to congratulate the both of you. You might be the most talented of the batch, Tisha said, smiling fiercely. There was no doubt to the two remaining clone girls that Tisha actually enjoyed this training session. 12. Can you make a distraction? Lysia suddenly said. Vinia frowned a bit. Lysia had not used her name but her identification code name. She wanted to complain, but there was no time for that so she simply nodded, then began to move in Tisha's direction. Tisha was ready to intercept, but Vinia had more than one trick in her bag. She fainted a roundhouse kick with her left leg but then went for a palm strike to Tisha's stomach. Tisha saw through, so she dodged the palm strike, only for Lysia's foot to enter her vision! Exclamation mark. Tisha narrowly escaped the blow, she smiled at the girls. This was a great combination. Those two learn fast. But I have a reputation to hold, let's finish it with the next move. Tisha made a roundhouse kick toward Lysia. The girl dodged by crouching, but while she did so, Tisha had already launched her next blow towards her. She escaped the punch, but then that punch changed direction and headed towards Vinya! Exclamation mark. Vinya managed to block the strike by crossing her arms, but that was all Tisha needed as she quickly went behind Vinya's back and made her join the sleeping group. Left alone, 
Lysia was overpowered and joined the other clone girls in Sleeping Wonderland. Notification, 10 minutes have passed since the beginning of the exercise. Phew. Tisha calmed down. She looked all around her. All clone girls were on the ground, unconscious. Did I overdo it? Answer. Ona Tisha definitely overdid it. A straight answer coming directly from A4 was rare. It made Tisha scratch her head. I guess I grew too excited. While waiting for the clone girls to wake up, Tisha reflected a bit. After a while, when everybody had recuperated enough, Tisha said to the girls, All right, you all did a good job. You all passed the first step. The girls sighed in relief. They wouldn't have to do it again. Or so they thought. Let's do another two rounds of spas now. This time, I'll take each and one of you one on one, Tisha declared and the faces of the clone girls paled, all of them thought they had awakened a demon, all but one. Somehow, Willia was happy that she would be able to do other spas. The afternoon continued under the cries of the clone girls. The lesson they had gotten from today was to never trigger Tisha during training. Also, for a week, Nia stopped tickling Tisha when they played together. 23. Chapter 9. That's it for today, girls. You all did great, Tisha said watching over twelve tired clone girls. When she announced that, all the girls just quietly left, like zombies. Don't forget to take a shower Tilda. Yes, she got a weak answer. Two days had passed since Tisha started training the clone girls, and despite the Spartan training they were going through under Tisha, they did not complain. Tisha had to get them credit. It's not easy to keep up with her training. Even Rika could not take the amount of training Tisha did in a day. Of course, Tisha had adapted it so that it would be feasible for the clone girls, but it must be noted that it would be impossible for a normal eight-year-old kid to keep up with the training program Tisha had arranged for the girls. The fact that none of the clone girls had yet to throw a tantrum despite looking like zombies after training was a big proof of their motivation. Welp, time to do my training now Tilda. Tisha hummed happily as she took the direction of the changing room. She was going to train with her armor on so that A4 could collect more feedback data to improve it. But then, A4 called out, report, contact with patrol drone P-202 has been lost. Sending patrol drones P-209 and P-201 to patrol drone P-202's last location to identify the reason. Tisha stopped for a moment. She looked around her to see whether the clone girls heard A4, when she spotted nobody. A sigh escaped her lips. Then, with a serious look on her face, she entered her personal changing room with A4 following and closed the door. A4, what did I tell you about updates concerning what's happening outside? The drone's eyes blinked, reciting order. Should anything change about the situation outside clone installation 3? Ona Tisha must be warned discreetly when null class clone girls are present. If Ona Tisha is alone, a report can be given immediately. Yeah, you remember it correctly. Tisha nodded her head, then crossed her arms. Right now, the kids could have heard you, you know. Please be more careful. Tisha did not want the clone girls to know what was happening outside. She thought it would stress them out to know that. Just outside, a battle was going to break out in order to take control of the location where clone installation 3 was. She did not want the girls to experience that fear every day. From the daily report A4 gave her, the accumulation of forces from both sides would lead to a conflict that might drag on for a while, something that Tisha was pretty frustrated about. Ona Tisha's preferences have been reassessed. Good, Tisha nodded. How long has it been since you lost contact? Report, loss of contact with P-202 dated back to 9 minutes ago. P-209 and P-201 are approaching P-202's last confirmed location. Stream their point of view. I'll change in the meantime. Tisha began to change into her skin suit as A4 displayed on a screen nearby what the patrol drones were seeing. The patrol drones were navigating in a dense forest southwest of clone installation 3. It was not far from the southern entrance which was hidden under the thick vegetation. If it's on that side, then it is most likely the Republicans, Tisha said, letting her thoughts known to A4. The AI did not respond, but Tisha was used to this silent treatment now. Even though it did not respond, 
A4 was still listening to what Tisha said, that was enough for her, from the multiple reports she had received, she knew for sure that the Ionian Republic's armed forces had established a camp to the northwest of Clone Installation 3, while the Borkian Confederation had established their camp in the northeast. The two powers had begun to clash with each other on the plain to the north of Clone Installation 3. Tisha thought they installed themselves there because both camps had only found the northern entrance to the facility, and since this entrance was the most at risk, A4, with the approval of Tisha, had deployed drones equipped with weapons. Those drones were only a temporary measure however, since they were not built to fight, Clone Installations did not have the required factories to build military drones. Right now, the Republicans controlled the area around the northern entrance, they had already tried two times to enter into the facility but, following Tisha's orders, the drones had opened fire on the coming troops, killing some and injuring others, the Republicans had retreated both times, the fact that only the northern entrance was found did not mean however that the Republic and the Confederation did not know that other entrances existed, in fact, Tisha was sure they knew. Hence, when the patrolling drones had detected the presence of humans in this unpopulated area in the south, she was not surprised, as the patrol drones reached the location, Tisha could see the carcass of a patrol drone on the ground from the stream to her left, the flying sphere with four arms had a hole in it. Notification, P-202 has been found by P-209, beginning of retrieval. A4 announced this as P-209 began to approach the carcass of P-202, but then, the stream suddenly cut out, and not just P-209 stream, but P-201 stream as well. Warning. Signals with both P-201 and P-209 have been lost. Seems like you've been outmatched, A4. Tisha said as she finished arranging her armor. Reminder, this unit has never been made to be used as a military unit. Fufu, if you say so, A4. Tisha giggled, it seemed to her that the AI was pouting. Dissatisfied with the comment she just made. Requesting permission. This unit wants to send more drones. No need. Tisha denied A4's request, which confused the AI. It thought it was the most logical move to make. You told me our supplies were limited, right? Tisha said, glancing at the drone's reaction. Affirmation. Due to no access to a source of raw material, current resources are limited. That's exactly why we should not spend more resources producing drones. They are not very effective against our enemy. Instead, Tisha put on her helmet. I'll go there myself. Command center. This is Rico 1. Do you receive? Loud and clear Rico 1. We've just eliminated two more targets. We will inspect them before going to the next location. Roger that Rico 1. Continue the mission as planned. Roger. Rico 1. Over. Max sighed as he put away his communication device in his bag. His platoon had been walking for hours inside this dense forest, and he was tired of it. Max, what did HQ say? His lieutenant, the chief of his platoon, walked over and asked him. Nothing's changed, sir. HQ still wants us to continue. Max sighed again. If he did it before, he would have been reprimanded. However, the lieutenant was in the same state as him. If only we knew why we are searching for some old ruins. Ever since his battalion had arrived in Sector B-746, their officers had ordered them to search the forest for what could look like a ruin. While it seemed an easy mission compared to the other battalions who were confronting Borkians, they had been ambushed multiple times by those drones. At first, they thought they had been attacked by the Borkians, but HQ had denied this by affirming that those drones were linked to the objective of their mission. They were then ordered to continue their searches, but as they did, similar drones began harassing them more frequently. This was the third day Max and his comrades had been searching for ruins in this forest, and in that time, he only slept around three hours. I understand your frustration, Max. But this mission has been classified both as top secret as well as urgent. Even I don't know why we're searching for ruins in the middle of nowhere. But we are soldiers. All we can do is obey orders. That was all they could do, affirmed his lieutenant. Sir, we have finished inspecting the targets, one of the men said as he came closer to Max and his lieutenant. They seem to be the same model as the one eliminated before. 
Mechanics said it is a drone modified to be equipped with a laser blaster. I see, so it's not a military drone. Good work, keep an eye out, more could come out. Yes, sir, the lieutenant seemed lost in his thoughts. It puzzled Max, who rarely saw his superior like that. Lieutenant? He asked. <laughs> oh sorry, I got lost in my thoughts for a moment. The lieutenant apologized. It's fine lieutenant, but... If it's not too much to ask, why were you lost in your thoughts? I was thinking about the reason why HQ would send us to search for some ruins, the lieutenant said as he scratched his head. He sat on a boulder next to a tree. Max sat down too. You see, I first thought they sent us there because they found a weapon that could give us an advantage against the Confederation. In this case, the ruins would be of an old arms factory, or a laboratory, something like that. What the lieutenant said made sense to Max. If people were talking about secret weapons then yes, searching for some old ruins would be beneficial to their side. From the stories he heard when he was young, many incredible weapons and innovations were lost a thousand years ago, before the Confederation and the Republic were even founded. If the weapon could change the tide of the power struggle to the Ionian Republic's side, then he would willingly give up his life for the Republic to get it. Max was a soldier of career after all, unlike half of his platoon, who were young conscripts. But Max got out of his thoughts when he heard the lieutenant. It seems I was wrong. Those drones prove it. What do you mean by that, sir? If this were a military facility, do you think it would be protected by some civilian converted drones? The lieutenant had a point. If this was a military factory, the security would not be so light. But then what was it? Max did not know the answer. Besides that, those drones seem too shiny to me, the lieutenant remarked. It's like they just came out of the production line. That's true. Now that he thought about it, this didn't make sense. Was the factory still functioning? How could it be true? It had been abandoned for years. Could it be someone has managed to take control of the ruins? That's what I thought too. But it's impossible, right? There's just no way someone could sneak in an old ruin while the military is there and then reactivate its function somehow. The lieutenant denied it. He then raised himself. It's about time a new drone comes out to inspect this location. We should move on. He looked at Max. Max, contact HQ and tell them our discoveries. Yes, sir. Max obeyed. He took out the communication device he had just put inside his bag, then turned it on. Command Center. This is Rico 1. Do you receive? PSHHHHT. Command Center. This is Rico 1. Do you receive? His communication device only let out incomprehensible noises. Max then turned his head and shouted, Lieutenant, something's wrong. As he was shouting that, the lieutenant's head suddenly exploded. Splatters of brain bits were scattered as the soldiers froze for a second under a rain of blood. Exclamation mark. All the soldiers immediately put themselves on alert, monitoring what was happening around them as the second in command shouted his orders. Ambush. Defensive positions. We were under attack. Soldiers. I want you to loo. Bang. His head exploded, leading to the same gory result as the lieutenant. Not good. Max thought the enemy was targeting their officers. He watched in horror as the third on the line in command tried to give his orders with signs, only for his head to explode too. Still, the soldiers did not panic yet. They looked around, searching for the origin of the shots. There, one of the soldiers pointed at a tree, before a laser beam pierced his chest, killing him. The other soldiers immediately began to shoot in that direction. Max could see a silhouette navigating through the dense forest at high speed, and he wasn't the only one. A burst of laser beams were shot at it. In response, laser beams came back at them, each one killing someone. Stay calm everyone. Someone shouted. Keep firing at that position. Max and the others did as they were told, but each time they shooted at the silhouette, the silhouette would shoot back with a terrifying accuracy, killing more than two soldiers each time. Against such an opponent, some conscripts began to panic. Four deads later, and one of them shouted. Uh, fuck this, I don't want to die here. The conscript got up from his position and began to run in the opposite direction. Others, seeing that, did the same. Wait, come back Higa. One of the soldiers tried to call them back, 
but was shot in the process. As for those fleeing, they did not last long either. From his position, Max could only see laser beams above his head and the scream of those unfortunate enough to get hit. As their numbers decreased, Max tried to think of a way to survive. He looked at his closest comrade who nodded back. His comrade immediately got up, arms raised, and said, I surrender laser beam pierced between his eyes, not letting him finish. Max paled. Th this monster, now they knew they had no way out, it was do or die. Their numbers slowly dwindled until Max could count the ones remaining. They were now only five. Another one of his comrades fell next to him, quickly followed by another one. Now only two of them were left. Ah, his last comrade got shot in the shoulder and fell on the ground in pain. At that moment, Max had stopped shooting with his machine pistol. He knew there was no point. Instead, he hid himself the best he could between two roots. Only the groans of the wounded could be heard now. After a while, he heard noise coming from the thick bushes to his right. He sneakily took a look, and he had a hard time believing what he was seeing. There stood a woman in a fully armored suit, a white and shiny armor that did not seem to have known battle nor did it seem to have any emblem. Max wondered for a moment how they did not notice her with such shiny gear. The woman approached the groaning man, who was looking at her with hateful eyes. The woman said nothing. Instead, she just pulled out a pistol, and shot the man in the head. Exclamation mark Max paled. The woman had no pity even for the wounded. He watched in horror as the woman approached each body and shot each one with a laser beam in the chest. Max slowly approached her, weapon in hand. He sneaked out behind her slowly while the woman continued her merciless actions, slowly but surely. Then, he took a breath in, and came out, pointing his weapon at the head of the woman, only for the woman to point the pistol at his head. The both of them stared at each other for a while. Max did not know what face the woman made because of her helmet, but he could see his face's reflection on the shiny helmet. He was terrified. When he realized that, he tried to pull the trigger, but the woman was faster. He felt his mind going blank as obscurity took over his vision. Tisha sighed. That last one sure made me tense. She knew there was one survivor hiding, but trusted her instincts would help her survive. Tisha looked at the soldier one more time, before crouching. She checked his material. Oh, so he was the operator of the platoon. Good thing I asked A4 to jam their communications. She said as she took the dead man's communication device with it. She could listen on the enemy's movement for a while. Now, I should collect some more resources. She said as she collected the man's machine pistol and grenades. She was collecting more weapons or gears to use. As for any other resources, A4 would send drones to collect them. Tisha had long learned that there was no use caring about a body on a battlefield. That's why she looted the bodies without batting an eye. When on a battlefield, she was merciless, even to the wounded. Tisha had learned the hard way that even injured people could still attack her. Besides, if she let them go, they would release information about her and clone Installation 3. Something that she could not allow. Now then. Since I'm here, let's do some more cleaning, she said as she got up after looting the last body. She turned on the communication device and listened in, before moving to a new location. That day, the Ionian's HQ was thrown into chaos. In a single day, they had lost contact with five platoons. They lost a total of 250 men without even knowing how. Because of that, HQ stopped its operations within the southern forest for some days. Meanwhile, Tisha had to find an excuse to tell the clone girls, for not being able to eat with them. Tysinia and Vinya's pitiful gazes made Tisha feel guilty. 24. Chapter 10 <laughs> Tilda Tysinia was humming happily while Tisha was brushing her hair. Right now, they were in Tysinia's bedroom. They just took a shower, and Tysinia was about to go to bed. The following days after Tisha did some cleaning, Tisha enjoyed her days with the clone girls, playing with them to her heart's content. However, it did not last long. Just two days later, A4 alerted her of the presence of Borkian troops near one of the entrances. She dealt with them in the same manner as she did for the Ionians. However, the Borkians immediately came back the next day. To make matters worse, the Ionians resumed their expeditions in the south.
Tisha now had to deal with multiple fronts at the same time, lessening the time she could have with the clone girls. The sad faces they made she told them she was busy because of work broke Tisha. As Tisha was wondering what to do, Rhea proposed that Tisha take some time to be alone with one clone girl each day at the very least. Everybody agreed to this idea right away, as for how to choose the clone girl, it would be left to chance by drawing lots. After drawing, the winner of the first round had been Tysenia. So, as promised, the next evening, Tisha passed some time alone with Tysenia. You look so happy, did something good happen? Tisha asked smiling tenderly. Not really Tilda. I'm just happy that Big Sis is brushing my hair. You 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 you, you Tilda. You're such a sweetheart, Tysenia Tilda. I want to hug you. Tisha melted. She was really too weak to those cute acts, when she was not fighting, that is. Eh he. Hug me. Hug me. I wanna hug Big Sis too. At Tysenia's answer, Tisha hugged the clone girl as strongly as she could. Tysenia returned the hug with a happy smile on her face. They stayed like this for a while, until Tisha finally broke the hug and resumed brushing Tysinia's hair. So, what song were you singing? Tisha asked. I don't know. Tysinia simply answered, which made Tisha jiggle. I just heard Big Sis humming it, so I copied you. Is that so? Tisha answered. It was true that she sometimes hummed one particular song when she felt at ease. Then I think I know what song it was. I don't remember the lyrics, but do you want me to hum it to you before sleep? Exclamation mark yes. Tysenia was happy, and so was Tisha. After finishing brushing Tysenia's hair, Tisha laid Tysenia in her bed and took a chair nearby. She began to hum the song. <laughs> Tilda Tisha's humming voice resounded in the silent room. Tysenia looked at her big sis silently. The voice soothed her slowly to sleep. But before that, her curiosity overtook her, and she asked Tisha, Big sis, what is that song? It's a lullaby. Tisha stopped humming and answered Tysenia. She looked into the distance, reminiscing about something. It is a song that is often used to put children to sleep. But, big sis, who taught you that song? Was it your mother? Tysenia asked. Somebody had to have taught her, right? Tysenia thought it was probably a member of Tysenia's family. Hence, based on her implanted knowledge, and her own experience of a family, she assumed Tisha's mother had taught her. If so, she wanted to meet that person. However, Tisha only shook her head. My superior taught me. She used to sing the lyrics too. The answer Tisha gave was not what Tysenia expected, making her even more curious. Your superior? You have a superior big sis? Who is she? Not anymore. Tisha suddenly said. Then she smiled as she finally looked back at Tysenia. It doesn't matter right now, so let's go to sleep now. Tysenia nodded hesitantly. She wanted to know more about Tisha's past, but Tisha's reaction told her she would not talk about it. As her consciousness slowly escaped to dreamland, she swore she would learn more about this superior that her big sis mentioned. Tisha just looked at Tysenia's sleeping face. The young girl had made Tisha's thoughts go over Rika's situation. She did not know where her old superior was right now, but some unknown thought told her the woman would be fine. She had, after all, reached the grade of Brigadier General. Rika was laying down in the mud, her vision bloodied as she looked at the cloudy sky. Despite the fact that her ears were ringing, she could still hear rounds of explosions all around her. What just happened? She was confused. Why was this happening? Her superiors had told her section to scavenge an enemy aircraft that crashed a few hours ago. The site of the crash was a peaceful side of the war zone too. Right now, Rika was on Pelia 4, fighting against the independent system of Belia. Pelia and the Borkian Confederation had entered into a conflict after the former had refused to be integrated into the Borkian Confederation. But the war didn't go well for the Pelians. By the time Riku and her squad were deployed to the front, the Borkian armed forces were in the process of capturing the strategically important planet of Pelia IV. By doing that, they had forced the Pelian authorities to the negotiation table, and a ceasefire had been enforced on the front line. In other words, this was a nearly peaceful sector where Rika would be able to enjoy her life as a junior officer without the risk of getting killed. And yet here she was now, under a rain of artillery shells. Slowly, her senses came back. She should have been happy about this fact, but as her senses came back, 
she felt an unbearable pain from the left side of her head, as well as her right side. G she tried to scream, only for a miserable groan to come out. Why, is this happening? She thought, they told me it would be safe. They, Rika did not like war. Instead, she wanted to enjoy a spoiled high-class life like her mother, marry somebody who was of the same status as her, and then live at home while taking care of her children. She only enlisted because her family pushed her to do so. The Doesan was a well-established family within the Borkian elite circle. While it was not a family that had enough power to become an official representative in the Borkian Senate, nor the power to become part of the government, the social network the Doesan possessed could not be underestimated. The patriarch of her family however, yearned to become a senator, as such, he enlisted his family members into the military in the hope their deeds would be enough to promote the family's status. This was the reason why the young lady Rika Doesan was pushed into one of the Borkian Confederation most prestigious military officer academies. Of course, she complained, but the patriarch made it clear to her that she had to graduate from the academy, then serve at least five years into the armed forces before she would be free to do whatever she wanted, or else she would be casted out of the family as a failure. Rika had tried to ask for help from her parents, but they could only give her sorry gazes as they sent her off to the academy. Because of this forced enrollment, she understood that she was only a pawn to the patriarch of her family, and as a result, her trust in her family was destroyed. Still, she would obey, hoping to be left alone after completing her service. Some years passed, and Rika was now a junior officer. For one year, she was assigned to the 956th Infantry Regiment to learn on the field. Rika was given command over five other soldiers. This was a tradition within the Borkian military, and she was no exception to it. From those soldiers, four of them were sent from her family as bodyguards. Rika was, after all, part of a high-ranking family. The last one was an expressionless teenage girl, an orphan with no backers but with excellent skills. Being a spoiled young lady who did not want to be here, she did not like this teenage girl who was often praised as a perfect soldier in the making. Hence, whenever she could, she and her lackeys would bully the girl. Satisfyingly enough to Rika, the teenage girl did not resist against her, she just took everything without ever fighting back, just like an AI who could only listen to orders. Then, one day, an officer who was backed up by her family told her they would go on a safe mission that would help her rise within the ranks. Rika, of course, could not refuse. At the beginning, everything was fine. Her section progressed smoothly within the no man's land. With the ceasefire, nobody would try to shoot them, but then her mind went blank. Now there she was, agonizing as she slowly lost blood, not knowing what had happened. She tried to lift her upper body, but then, don't move, she heard a familiar voice. She shifted her gaze toward the direction of the voice, and what she saw made her eyes round. The black-haired teenage girl, the one she had been bullying for a whole year, was treating the wound on Rika's right side. You, what are you doing? She was baffled. What was this girl doing in this king -a situation? I'm giving you first help, mom. The teenage girl answered. Rika stared at the girl who was nonchalantly applying disinfectant, which made her groan in pain. She wanted to know why the girl was helping her instead of getting revenge after all she's done to her, but this wasn't the time for that. What about, the medic dead, said the girl without batting an eye, just like the rest of the section. A hey, all of them? Cough Rika made a sudden move from the shock, which made her cough as pain spreaded. Stay calm. Mom, or else the wound will aggravate, the girl warned her, and Rika did not try to move after that. The treatment took a long time in her eyes. The only sounds she heard during that time was the echo of the battlefield, as well as her groans from time to time. After some time, all her wounds had finally been bandaged. You're lucky, Mom. Your wounds weren't as deep as they seemed. You'll be able to move with some aid, the teenage girl said as she cleaned her hand with some water from her gourd. Now, Mom, what are your orders? Orders? You are still my superior in rank, Mom. The girl answered as if it was obvious. We should get back to our base. But it's useless, Rika thought. With her current state, she did not believe she could make it. Understood, Mom. The teenage girl stood up and began to prepare her equipment which was dispersed within the shell crater they were in. Rika saw that the girl was limping from her left leg, 
There was a bandage already red with blood on that leg. The girl then said to Rika, Once the shelling calms down, I will try to get you back to our lines, Mom. Rika just nodded, but in her head, she thought the chances of them surviving were non-existent. Rather, it might have been better. She wouldn't have to worry about being abandoned by her family anymore. They were the ones who put her in this position in this place. After some time passed, and night slowly arrived, the bombardment waned off. The teenage girl helped Trika stand up, then supported her from the right as she held a laser blaster in her left hand. They slowly began to walk out of the shell crater. The area had been completely destroyed by the artillery. Rika had a hard time recognizing it, but her companions seemed to know more than her. They slowly walked into this no man's land full of newly made craters. The problem was however, that as they began walking toward friendly lines, Rika was beginning to lose consciousness. She had lost too much blood. Tisha noticed it, and proposed something. Mom, I know it's hard, but try to keep your consciousness awake. How about you talk about happy moments and try to forget the pain? Rika just nodded. She did not have the strength to argue. Instead, she began telling stories of her childhood to her young companion, like how she felt when her little brother was about to be born. Simple answers came back, affirming that her companion was listening in. Somehow, this gave Rika some strength to keep on advancing. Then, after a while, the girl began to tell Rika about her past too. About her life as an orphan on Brilia 7, and why she enlisted into the army. The teenage girl slowly opened up as fatigue accumulated. Her soldierly attitude disappeared, replaced by the girl's true personality as she cursed the officers who sent them on this mission. They exchanged for a while like that, until Rika remarked something which, NHN, reminds me. Panda I don't think I ever heard your name. It's Tisha, with no last name. Tisha. Okay, I've remembered it. Well, Pant Tisha, I'm Rika Doesen. If we survive, I'll make sure something like this doesn't happen again to the two of us. I promise. Rika did not receive response. Not that she needed one. She had already made up her mind. If they survived, she would do everything to go up in ranks rapidly while assuring her own safety. And the one of Tisha who just saved her life when she could have literally abandoned her. Never would she be lazy and selfish again. They continued their slow approach under the cover of darkness. Tisha's leg didn't get any better, and she too, was beginning to have a hard time staying awake. They both spoke about silly things to keep themselves from closing their eyes. Fortunately for them, they were about to reach friendly lines. We, we did it, Tisha. We managed to come back, Rika exclaimed forgetting her pain. But then, Tisha stopped. Hey, Tisha, come on. Let's continue. We've arrived. Rika did not receive an answer. Instead, Tisha slowly fell down. Tisha, Rika held Tisha, and they both fell. Rika kept calling Tisha's name, but did not receive an answer. Then, as Rika panicked, she heard a voice from behind her. You promised something like this wouldn't happen again. Exclamation mark Rika turned and saw an older version of Tisha, with an enormous wound to her stomach bleeding profusely, guts visible, and as suddenly as that, artillery shells began to explode all around her again, obscuring her vision, exclamation mark Rika woke up while gasping for air, the scar on her face itched, she raised her upper body, quickly inspecting her surroundings while putting her left hand on her scar. Of course, nobody was in her room. Sigh. She calmed down, and began to regulate her respiration. This nightmare again. Ever since she came here, Rika often had this nightmare where she would relive this horrific moment of her life. It was like a phantom that did not want to go away. When it happened for the first time, she thought it was only a one-time occurrence, that it only happened because she was going to risk her life on a battlefield again. But the nightmare kept coming back every night making her unable to sleep. She questioned herself, why was she having that nightmare? That's when a certain person began to appear in her nightmares and began to say a line to her. You promised something like this wouldn't happen again. She was beginning to be certain of one thing. She had this nightmare because of a certain promise that was now unfulfilled. Rika wasn't a saint. She broke multiple promises in her life. But there was only one person she kept her promises with, albeit unconsciously and it was Tisha. As the nightmare kept appearing each night, 
Riku understood something. While she always said to herself that Tisha was a valuable asset, it would seem that her heart disagreed. After all the two of them had been through together, she might not have looked at Tisha as a valuable and loyal soldier under her command anymore, but as a precious comrade with whom she had made a precious agreement with. Someone she could entrust her life to, they might not have been friends, but, even though the both of them refused to recognize it, they cared for one another with their own way, making sure to keep the other safe. But now, Tisha was gone. Rika would probably not see her again, even if the other woman survived. She was sure the higher-ups would try to frame Tisha or her somehow sooner or later, seeing how she was treated during the meeting with General Fika. Rika was trapped. She would still continue her duty, but could not escape her fate. The Doesan family was still thriving from her fame as a war hero, but on the first occasion, they would drop all support and banish her. That was something that disgusted her. At least before, she had someone that would remain on her side, but that was not the case anymore. Death penalty would probably wait for her at the end of this battle. There was no talk about going back to civilian life. Rika could not see herself going back to her former self too. Since she had lost her closest ally, the only thing she had left now was her brigade. She resigned herself to live on with the guilt of not fulfilling a promise that was never completely affirmed as one. This guilt that has been building in her heart, it was the guilt of not having enough power to prevent her precious comrade from falling into danger. Rika closed her eyes, as if to forget about it all. She began to hum a lullaby to herself. This lullaby was her favorite, as it helped calm her mind. <laughs> Tilda, in the silent room, Rika's humming voice resounded. The lullaby soothed her, but it did not chase the nightmare away. 22. Chapter 11 Screams echoed through the rocky hill as bursts of laser beams flew all over the place. A group of soldiers in grey uniforms were trying to advance towards a makeshift fortification on a rocky hill. Most of them were being killed by a machine gun that the Republicans had positioned there. Where's our support? A man shouted as his comrade next to him died from the machine gun's fire. Just as he asked this, a hoverer tank took position to the side. The laser turret of the hoverer tank then targeted the Republican makeshift defenses, and fired. Boom. The barrage of laser beams ceased as the Ionian's defensive position was blown into the air. Cheers erupted from the Borkians as they rushed at the now defenseless position. Took them long enough, said David Fika as he put down his binoculars. The general and his suite were observing the progress of the assault from a tower inside the temporary camp his men had built. He and his troops were confronting the Republicans in the east. David had sent his men in a human wave with no care for the losses. He only had one objective, and that was to secure the area. This was the last Republican defensive position in the east, General. One of his aides said. It's a good thing they left this side too undefended. Now we can focus on our real mission. David said, drinking some tea from his cup. Of course, David was talking about the facility. While the abandoned facility was protected by drones, David and his men had already studied them. He had established countermeasures that made the drones easier to deal with. Still, it was strange to him that those drones could still take out entire squads, if not more within a single day. If David managed to secure the facility for the Borkian Confederation, he was promised a promotion. This would help him in strengthening his position and advancing on his project to become the president of the Confederation. Besides, he also had another plan. He could keep the facility for himself as a bargaining chip to gain even more influence. He himself did not know what was inside, but his superiors had ordered him to secure and explore the location at all cost. The faster, the better. In any case, he wasn't that worried about his losses. He already had found a good scapegoat to receive all the critics and the blame. Lieutenant General Rika Doesan. It's a pity, her face has become so ugly because of that scar. He remembered the past when he was still in the military academy. He had seen the black-haired young woman and wanted to court her as his possible bride. But before he could do so, she had already been affiliated to a regiment and left soon after. Tell our troops to begin the search for the entrance. Understood. His communication officer immediately began fiddling with his radio. PSHHHHHHH, -h -h huh? However, there seemed to be a problem. The radio only made inaudible noises. 
It was puzzling, since the radio was one of the most modern the Borkian Confederation had. It never did that before. Just as he was about to change the radio, an explosion was heard. What was that? David exclaimed. He saw smoke in the direction he was just looking at. Exclamation mark. He then took his binoculars again and looked at the situation. The first thing he saw was the burning carcass of the tank. Ho hover a tank down. Signaled one of his aides who was also looking over with his own binoculars, causing confusion from their entourage. Contact them. Ask them what is happening now. Someone exclaimed to the communication officer. See can't. The radio is jammed. What? General. What should we do? David did not answer his panicking subordinates who did not even propose to send reinforcements. He just looked through his binoculars, searching for the reason for the chaos. He saw laser beams coming from behind a boulder, taking down the Borkian soldiers. There's someone attacking us, he said. Is it a Republican commando unit? But our intel did not mention the presence of the Ionian Republic special forces though. I need more info. He kept his binoculars pointed at the boulder, hoping to find out more. And find out more he did. The person shooting his soldiers revealed itself as it changed position for cover. Exclamation mark. It was a woman wearing an armored suit of a model he had never seen before. From what he could see on the white armor. There was no emblem whatsoever that could help identify it. A puzzling fact, as all nations always made sure that the emblem would appear on an armored skin suit. Armored skin suits were a pride to the nation. They were not that rare so to say, but their quality varied depending on its materials. It usually served as one of the most advanced means of war and came with a large variety of use and customization. This model however did not resemble any designs David had seen before, maybe it was just a new design kept secret? He did not know, but he made sure that his binoculars were recording the woman as she was taking down the remaining men like a leisure walk in the park. Bring our most skilled sniper, General, the man next to him asked. Bring our most competent sniper, right now. Why yes, the man rushed out. Going down the stairs in a hurry, David continued to observe the woman in an armored suit as she mercilessly killed the last soldiers. He wanted to eliminate her and then collect her armor. If this new design could be studied and then used against their enemies, it would bring David more fame. As the firing stopped, the woman came out of her hiding spot. She then began to kill the wounded on the ground. David did not care about these men's lives right now. He only cared about the fact that the woman was still there. It was at this moment that his lackey came back with a soldier following him. Your orders, sir? The soldier said. Soldier, take a shot at this enemy. David said, not even bothering to look at the man. The soldier only nodded and prepared his material. Not even questioning the order. He was one of the elite men David had brought with him, and his loyalty was unquestionable. The man took out a long rifle with a big barrel. It was a ghost rifle. This rifle was so powerful that it could even pierce tank armor. In fact, it was recognized as an anti-tank rifle rather than a sniper rifle. While bringing out this type of gun could be considered an overkill, David did not care so long as the target was incapacitated. There wouldn't be a problem. The soldier took position and aimed his rifle. There was a moment of silence on the observation platform as the soldier identified his target and waited for the opportunity to strike. In that time, the only thing that could be heard was the gulps of some officers, who were not used to tense atmospheres like that. Finally, the opportunity came as the woman relaxed herself after killing the last soldier. Bang! The soldier took his chance, and his bullet reached its target, making it stagger. The target has been hit in the chest, signaled an officer. David could hear some officers releasing their tension with a sigh of relief. However, he knew it wasn't over. Unbelievable, he said in shock. The woman had only staggered. That was all. There was a big impact on her chest plate, but it would seem the bullet had not penetrated it. This was unusual. Armored suits did not usually protect this much. Soldier, switch to armor-piercing ammunition and take a second shot. David immediately yelled, startling the officers who thought everything was over. The soldier obeyed while David looked at the woman, seeing what her next move would be. David thought the woman would take cover or even flee the area, but to his surprise, she did not. Instead, 
She looked straight in their direction. He had an ominous feeling when he saw her take out a rifle. No way. She can't reach us from where we are with a simple rifle. We're too far, right? It was as he thought this that the woman shot. David thought for a moment that she missed. After all, the distance was just too great. But then, gah, he heard a scream. David put down his binoculars and looked around him, searching for what happened, and he saw the sniper holding his shoulder in pain. Exclamation mark. Gee get a medic. Now, general, we should take cover. Panic and confusion took over the place. As David's bodyguards tried to cover him, he took his binoculars a last time to observe the armored soldier who just performed this shot. The woman, however, was nowhere to be seen. Uktisha groaned in pain. The bullet embedded in her chest blade was still hot. Its impact was so strong that it had cracked and blackened the shiny white armor plate. Still, Tisha was fine. If she were to believe the body checkup function of the armor that is, it was just the force of the impact that startled her. That, and the fact that getting hit by a bullet was still painful, even with armor on. I got careless. Tisha sighed as she took the elevator down to the fourth floor. She was going to take a medical checkup just in case. She reflected on what happened just now when she heard from A4 that the Borkians were assaulting Ionians' positions in the east. She immediately left to join the fray. She thought that she could eliminate both at the same time, and then pass more time with the clone girls after that. But never did she think the Borkians would set up a camp not far to observe the battle. Even A4 did not know about its presence. Now the Borkians knew that somebody who wore an armored suit was in the area. Normally, this would be unlikely to happen to her. But it seems that Tisha had grown overconfident since she got her armor. This overconfidence made her less aware of the danger. And this was the result. Fortunately, I acted after the Ionians were eliminated. This was Tisha's only salvation. The Borkians might have thought that she was an Ionian soldier. Thus they would focus their research on that side. Her identity was still safe for the moment, but still, my new armor, Tisha said bitterly as she looked at the blackened, cracked armor plate, now it's damaged, notification, in case of damage to the armor, this unit has prepared replacement parts, A4 suddenly said to her, the drone had immediately come to her when she entered the base, doing a flurry of checks on Tisha to determine her state, this made Tisha smile bitterly, the AI was really worried about her. Is that so? It's a good thing you did so. A4. The AI really thought of everything. The elevator slowed down as they reached the third floor. Tisha sighed as she finally would be able to take off her armor. But her main train of thought was already on the clone girls. What kind of game would she play with them today? Tisha was just impatient to go meet them. But Tisha should have been more careful about what she wished for. The door of the elevator slowly opened, and Tisha was about to walk out of the elevator, but she suddenly froze. A, A, just in front of her stood two clone girls, who also froze when they saw her. By Big Sis, one of them said, looking pale as she saw the state of Tisha's armor. Oh, Yume, hey there, Rhea, Nisha. Tisha said as buckets of sweats poured down her face. She has done it now. The two girls glanced at Tisha's chestplate with tears in their eyes. The fear and worry were apparent on their faces. Yume, Big Sis is fine. Th, this is just a scratch Big Sis got while doing her job. Tisha blurted out in a panic. The look on Rio and Nisha's face did not change. Of course they would stay like that. Gah, what kind of excuse was that? Tisha was embarrassed after seeing their reaction. They stayed in this awkward silence for a while, until Tisha let out a groan. The pain from the impact was still there. Exclamation mark. The two clone girls reacted to Tisha's groan. Nisha then grabbed Tisha's hand. Big sis, let's go to the infirmary. We need to heal you. I am fine, Nisha. No need to hurry. We can go slowly, okay? No. We're going there now. Nisha answered back. She then started pulling Tisha by the arm. Tisha let herself be pulled, but she was a bit surprised. Ever since she was born, Nisha had been the quiet type. Just like Rhea, she had a calm and mature demeanor. Nisha's demeanor reminded Tisha of Rika when the latter acted as an aristocratic lady. Nisha even took a liking to drinking tea with Rhea recently. 
Nisha's noble-like appearance was accentuated by the hairstyle she chose. She had straight long hair with a clear forehead and one braid on each side of her head. Those two braids were attached together at the back of her head. Yet here was Nisha, acting childishly because she thought Tisha was injured. Tisha did not know if she should be happy or sad. Since even Rhea continued to give her worried glances, Tisha decided that she should do as they said. It was what she was going to do anyway. Nisha stared at the screen in front of her. Patient, Tisha. Health check result, presence of bruises on the left side of the chest. No further injuries detected. Conclusion. No medical treatment needed to heal. She made sure to reread what the screen was displaying at least three times before finally looking away. Nisha had a normal, fulfilling day to day. In the morning, she ate breakfast with everyone, then trained with her big sis. After lunch, she had tea with Rhea. Her big sis was supposed to join them as she promised, but unfortunately, Tisha had to go back on her words because of her work. Nisha was a bit sad, but understood the importance of work from her implanted knowledge, and although Tisha had stayed quiet about it, she had a feeling that what her big sis did for work was something dangerous. Still, she believed her big sis would never get hurt. After all, she had seen how amazing she was during training time. But her expectations were shattered when she and Rhea met Tisha by coincidence. Nisha and Rhea had just finished playing together, like they usually did, when they found Tisha coming out of the elevator cage. Nisha instantly knew that something had happened when she saw the state of the armor her big sis was so proud of. More than that, Tisha's facial expression told her she was in pain. The person Nisha thought as invincible had been hurt. Something snapped inside her, and the image of herself she had built shattered. She clinged to her big sis with tears in her eyes and refused to let go until Tisha did a health check in front of her. As if to console her, Tisha had been patting her head, repeating the words I'm fine. Despite small grimaces appearing on her face from time to time, showing the contrary. After the health check's result, Tisha made Rhea and Nisha promise to not say anything to the others. She then left to change herself while Nisha was still focused on the results of the analysis. Whereas sister, she looked around. She was alone in the room. Rhea, who should have also been present, was nowhere to be seen. She's probably at the entrance of the changing room, waiting for Big Sis to finish changing. Nisha knew Rhea was as worried as her about Tisha's state. She moved to the entrance, but then stopped as she overheard a conversation. Big sis, what were you doing outside? Rhea had asked Tisha what all the clone girls wanted to know. Despite caring for them, Tisha did not speak a lot about herself or her past. Tisha knew a lot about the clone girls as their big sis, but the clone girls knew nothing about Tisha. What was I doing? Of course. Big Sis was doing some cleaning. That was Tisha's usual answer when asked about what she did outside. The clone girls did not usually question more, but this time, Rhea would have none of that. If you don't tell me, I'm gonna tell everyone that you got hurt. Rhea suddenly yelled. Eh, but what about our promise? Are you gonna break it? Those are just words. What I care about is you, Big Sis. Rhea suddenly let out those words in a voice that was close to crying, startling Nisha. We all care about you big sis, what are we gonna do if something happens to you? Nisha knew her sister was the most active in conversing with Tisha, and Tisha seemed to trust her the most with responsibilities. She knew Rhea took her role as a caring sister very seriously. Out of all the clone girls she was most likely the one who asked the most mature. She would never make a childish fuss like this normally, but it seems that, just like Nisha, Rhea had reached her breaking point. Rhea. From Tisha's voice, Nisha understood that Tisha had reached the same conclusion as her. I understand. I will tell you. There was a moment of silence. Nisha did not know what was happening since she stuck to the wall near the open door. She just held her breath. She did not want to be noticed and ruin her sister's chance to learn more about their big sis. Instead, she listened quietly. You see, Rhea. Tisha began to tell. Outside. There are bad people all around us. Bad people? Bad how? What did they do? Rhea said. Right now, she was not reasoning, she stayed childish in her way of asking questions. Those people want to take our home. Eh? But why? Because they think this place is abandoned. Abandoned? B but we live here. It's not abandoned. It's ours. Why don't you say this to them? We can't. 
they won't accept it, rather, they might try to kill or capture us. Why would they do that? Because they want to use our home's facilities for their own power games. I'm sure of it. You mean the cloning facility? Yes, that's why I must keep them away. Do you understand, Rhea? Yes, Rhea weakly answered. But do you have to do it alone? Aren't we training so that we can help you? Tisha laughed. Fufu. I'm not alone. I have A4 with me. And no, you girls are still too young to go outside. Right now, you won't be of any help. I see. I understand, big sis. Thank you for telling me, Rhea said. Can I get a hug from you, big sis? Of course, dear, anytime. Tisha answered, and Nisha assumed the two of them were hugging each other right now. Nisha slowly slid against the wall until her back reached the floor. Somehow, Tisha had yet to detect her presence. So that's the reason Big Sis was hurt. The people outside. She wants to protect us from them. Nisha stayed there, not moving, just digesting what she just heard. Her Big Sis had been protecting them all this time. She did not say anything to them so they did not have to worry. She bared it all on her shoulders. Nisha did not like that. She wanted to help her Big Sis. This was part of their raison d'etre, something that had been ingrained in their brains since before they were born. Some of the clone girls had chosen to forget about it since Tisha did not seem to want their help, but Nisha wasn't part of those clone girls. Ever since she had first crossed ties with Tisha, she wanted to be useful to her, and she was sure Rhea was the same. That was the reason why the both of them were on such good terms. Compared to her sisters, Nisha was not the best when it came to training. Still. If she could not yet help Tisha on the field, she would find something else to do to help her. She looked again at the equipment within the infirmary, and her eyes lit up with determination. Whether you want it or not, I will help you one way or another, Mother. 23, Chapter 12, Yum, are you sure we can be there, Nia? Mia said as she looked at the shelves, with a hesitant look. Most of them were empty, but some of them had weapons or ammunition stocked. Mia and Nia were within the armory. The room appeared less empty than the first time Tisha was there. A4 had since then resumed arms production following Tisha's wishes, albeit at a slow rate. I'm sure, Mia answered a confident near in front of her. If we could not be there, the AI would have stopped us, right? I guess so, Mia answered. Right now, the two of them were in the armory because Nia wanted to see more of their big sis equipment. Ever since Nia had seen Tisha's armor, she had been obsessed with technology. She would often ask questions to Tisha and A4 about this and that, but since Tisha had been more and more busy, she had received less answers to her questions. As a result of that, Nia had begun to sneak out frequently out of view of other clone girls, exploring the diverse plants of clone installation 3 to satiate her hunger for knowledge. It was really an unfortunate thing that Clone Installation 3 did not possess a library, because if it did, Nia would be there every day. Her curiosity and hunger for learning was just that strong. St. still, Mia hesitantly said, WHYMIH here with you again? For some reason, every time Nia sneaked out, she took Mia with her. Eh? I thought you wanted to go with me? Was I wrong? Answered a confused Nia. N no, you're N not wrong. Mia finally admitted after a pause not even looking at her sister. Mia was the most timid of the clone girls. She was scared of asking Tisha or even A4 the most basic questions. The only people she was somewhat at ease talking with were her clone sisters and that did not include Tisha, unfortunately. If she were to be put in front of a stranger, Mia would be unable to speak correctly and try to run away as soon as possible. Fortunately for her, there was nobody other than Tisha and her sisters within Clone Installation 3. Some other clone girls would disagree with her about this, but she preferred it that way. Still, despite that, she was interested in the various technologies present within the base. And Nia had seen through her about this fact. Hence, even though she complained, Mia was actually quite happy right now. This room is quite empty. I thought there would be more amazing things laying around. Nia said as she was about to grab one of the laser blaster carbines exposed on the shelf, only to be stopped by Mia, who grabbed her arm. Why you can't? If you touch that, A4 is G gonna intervene. Even though the clone girls were free to roam around, Tisha had strictly told them that they should never touch weapons if she did not give them her permission. 
and Sensei 4 always had an eye on them through the various security cameras installed, it would immediately tell Tisha, Ah, you're right. Eh hey, my bad. Nia quickly excused herself before continuing ahead. Let's go to the next room. Nia headed to the door on the left side of the armory, quickly followed by a panicking Mia. H hey, wait for me. D don't leave me alone there. Hurry up then. The two clone girls arrived in front of the door. Fortunately for them, it opened. This meant that Hey 4 did not consider this room as out of the clone girl's reach. As the door finished opening, Mia and Nia took in the scene. Whoa. The room, which had been empty the first time Tisha came inside, was now packed with parts for her armored skin suit. While the mannequins were still without anything on them, even the one Tisha usually displayed her armor on, since she was out cleaning, the shelves had different pieces of armor neatly arranged into sections. This is so cool. Nia said as she rushed to one of the shelves. And Nia, wait for me. Mia said as she too rushed to the same shelves as Nia. Hey, Mia, look, look. These are the same helmets as the one Big Sis is always wearing. Nia said as she pointed out at a helmet on the shelves. Mia followed Nia's finger, and saw the same helmet her Big Sis wore. There were five of them displayed on this shelf. Then, to Mia's surprise, Nia took one in her hands. W wait, Nia. W H what are you doing? Mia panicked, she thought A4 would warn them to put down the helmet, but it did not. Yes, I was right. Nia made a small fist pose. The helmets aren't considered outside of our permissions. I was sure this was the case since Big Sis let me have a look at hers last time. She then took another one. Here, Mia, take one too. Mia hesitantly took the helmet. Wow. She examined it like a treasure. See, I told you nothing would happen, Nia said, and Mia slowly nodded her head. It appears that they could touch the helmets without getting into serious problems. Let's try wearing them. Nia suddenly put on the helmet. It was a little too big for her head. Still, the helmet's HUD lit up, and the visor took a blue-colored tint. Oh it's really working. It's so cool. You should try it too, Mia. Mia nodded and put on the helmet. By this point, she had already been too captivated by the helmet to try to stop Nia. Same as Nia, her helmet also came to life once she wore it. Wow, there's so much information. Mia said as she looked at all the information her HUD was providing her. Right? Hey, while we're at it, why don't we play a game? Nia asked as she turned on herself and giggled, but she did not receive any response. Mia. Mia stood there, lost in her thoughts. Nia tried to get her attention by moving a hand in front of Mia's visor. Hey, Mia. Oh, yes? What is it? Mia finally answered her. Look. Ahem Nia took a pose. Hands to her waist. I'm Tisha, from now on I'll be your big sis. Blah blah blah. PFT Mia burst out laughing. That was just like big sis. Ha ha. He he, right? The two of them continued laughing for a while and Nia made other impressions of Tisha. Armia suddenly froze. What's wrong, soldier? Do you want to do some extra laps? Nia said, still playing her role. But then she heard a voice from behind her. If you are volunteering for some more training, why not, soldier? I think that's a great idea. Fudge ya? Nia jumped and turned around. There stood Tisha with her armor on. Bye bye bye. Big sis, cold sweat ran behind Nia's back. See since when? Since the moment you began imitating me, said Tisha with an emotionless voice. She, Nia could not defend herself now. Still, she tried to bypass the subject. What, what are you doing here? Ha ha. I could ask the both of you the same thing. What are the two of you doing there? It's not a place where you can play, Tisha said with a stern tone. She had just come back from cleaning some unwanted guests outside. Since it was relatively calm though, she quickly finished and then fastly came back. Of course, the reason was to pass more time with the clone girls. But because of the incident Tisha had with Nisha and Rhea, Tisha took a staircase that was not used instead of the usual elevator. Thanks to that, she met nobody this time as she headed to the armory to put down her armor. But the last thing she expected was to meet two clone girls within the armory. Jeez. And just the day after Rhea and Nisha saw me, she thought as she sighed in her mind. The conversation she had with Rhea after that wasn't something she wanted to repeat. Besides, the armory wasn't a place where kids should play around. I thought A4 had put it on the list of restricted areas. 
Guess we'll have a talk later, Yum. Well, you see, ha ha ha. Nia tried to search for the good words to explain why they were here, but she knew Tisha wouldn't play her game. We're sorry Sig Sis. We're here because we were curious about your equipment. Mia suddenly said. Em Mia? Nia did not expect Mia, who would not talk to Tisha except when the latter prompted her to do so, to answer. Is that so? Tisha was also surprised. She removed her helmet and directed her stare at Mia. Why are you so curious about it? Because we wanted to know more about the technology and how it's made. A eh? A eh? Tisha just let out a word confusing the two girls. She can talk to me just fine now. Tisha had been worried about this. Mia had never talked to her so openly before, refusing to even make eye contact. Tisha ended up thinking the girl was scared of her. That's why every time she talked to Mia, Tisha would direct her most tender look full of sisterly love to Mia. Still, it would not work as she expected and Mia would always stutter. But just now, I heard her well right? Tisha had a hard time believing it. That's why she removed her helmet, believing something was wrong with it. She even made a stern expression while addressing Mia. When she made that kind of expression in front of the clone girls, Mia would usually hide behind the back of her sisters. Yet, this time, she stood still and answered clearly. What could be the reason? That was when Tisha noticed the difference. Could it be? Mia, remove your helmet, she ordered. Mia froze for a second but listened to Tisha's command. Eh? What about me? Can I keep it on? Nia said, pointing at herself. No. You put it back on the shelf Nia, I'll deal with you later for imitating me. Tisha said with a smile to Nia, but her eyes did not tell the same thing as her smile. Nia hurriedly put the helmet back on the shelf as her face pulled. She thought she was definitely screwed this time. Now, Mia, Tisha said as she looked at Mia who had now removed her helmet, just like usual, Mia had a hard time meeting Tisha's gaze, can you tell me the reason again, why were you curious about my equipment, the young girl tried to answer as she fiddled with her fingers, not even trying to look at Tisha anymore, be because, Yum, W we wanted, to know more, Ab, stop, I get it now, Tisha said as she interrupted Mia who looked confused, I remember now, poor girl, she inherited one bad trait, Tisha thought. She knew what the problem was now. Mia had a speaking disorder and a fear of strangers. Just like Tisha did when she was very young. It was pretty bad back then. Tisha thought back. Ever since she could remember, she had a hard time speaking to others. The main reason for this was probably the constant bullying her shy younger self received at the orphanage. Back then, the other kids and even the carers, would get violent when she tried to ask something, and everyone just hit her every time she tried to talk back to them. Then, one day, the orphanage just kicked her out, the six years old Tisha was now homeless, and she had to try to survive by herself. At first, she tried to ask people around her for help. Tried being the right word, since she could hardly talk to anyone, she was ignored. Then, one day, a drunk man she was trying to talk to threw some old clothes at her face. The clothes had holes in them, so she could still see the man. She tried to call out to him to say thanks, and, to her surprise, she managed to say the words without stuttering. This was the first time, unlike ever before, that her voice came out loud and clear. She quickly realized the reason why. It was because of the clothes on her face. They acted as a sort of mask. This mask made her manage to speak, and look at other people light to eye. It was as if her fear of getting hit again had disappeared thanks to the mask. Young Tisha cried on the spot when she realized that, she would no longer have problems talking thanks to this. As for the drunk man, he was already gone by that time. Since then, Tisha kept a mask on her face. It helped her a lot in her daily life as a street urchin, and little by little, her speech disorder disappeared. By the time she was eight years old, she could talk normally without a mask on. It's good that it can be healed quite easily, Tisha thought, getting back on track. All right, I've decided what I'm gonna do with the both of you, she said. Mia and Nia both gulped, awaiting judgment. Both of you are prohibited from sneaking out like this again. I will tell A4 to make this area and the ones you've been in before, restricted zones. Both girls had sad looks on their faces, of course, 
Tisha knew about them sneaking out. They waited for Tisha's next words while closing their eyes. Mia. Why yes, you can keep the helmet. Tisha unexpectedly said, catching Mia by surprise. Yes? This helmet. Tisha said as she crouched in front of Mia. She then took the helmet and put it on Mia's head. It helps you to look at me in the eyes, right? Huh? Mia said with surprise. Oh, you're right. I can look at you now. I don't even stutter anymore. He he, right? Tisha said, smiling warmly. You know, I. Big sis was like you a long time ago. Eh? You were? Mia looked at Tisha with round eyes. This was the latest thing she expected to hear from Tisha, who showed so much confidence. Yes, I was. Tisha affirmed. I couldn't even say two words without stuttering. Tisha stood up from her crouching position. Keep the helmet. It will help you gain confidence in yourself. Then you'll be able to speak freely. Will it work? Mia hesitantly asked, to which Tisha smiled at her confidently. It worked for me. And since you are the same as me, it should also work on you. So keep the helmet as much as you need. You can even paint it if you want Tilda. Mia was happy that she could keep the helmet. She smiled. Yes, thank you very much. Tisha smiled. Her thoughts were already going in a weird direction. After all, you're cute when you wear a helmet. Tilda, it's like cosplay Tilda. But the voice of somebody made her refocus on the present. WH what about me? Can I keep the helmet too? Nia asked hesitantly. To which Tisha smiled as she answered. No way Tilda. WHY? Nia screamed. It's not fair. I want one too. It's not a toy, Nia. I'm giving it to Mia because she needs it. Tisha said, and Nia pouted. Tisha sighed. Are you that unhappy with my decision, Nia? Nia nodded at Tisha's question. Then how about we play planes for a bit? It's been a while since we last did it Tilda. Exclamation mark on second thought. Never mind. I don't need one. Nia suddenly made a U-turn. Ever since Tisha had made her fly during training. Nia had developed a phobia of flying. Well, guess I'll go, ha ha ha. She tried to run away, but Tisha grabbed her shoulder. Where do you think you're going, soldier? She said with a smile, a smile that made Nia very scared. You still have four laps to do. Now let's get to it. Of course, Tisha remembered that she had to punish Nia for imitating her. No Tilda. Mia quietly watched as her sister was literally dragged out of the room. She sent her prayers to her sister in her mind. Ah he Tilda, night time, Mia was laughing happily in her bed, the helmet in her hands. It now had green paintings in the form of multiple half circles that grew in diameter from the top of the visor to the top of the helmet. Tysinia had happily helped her do it and Mia was grateful to her. I should find a way to thank her later. After Nia was pitifully dragged to the training ground, Mia showed her sisters Tisha's gift and told them the reason why she got one. All of them were surprised at first, some were even jealous, but in the end, they were glad for her. With this helmet on, she could have a normal conversation with everyone. This might be the second best day of my life, Mia exclaimed as she hugged the helmet. Her first best day was, of course. The time Tisha gave her her name. She remembered how warmly Tisha had been at a time where she was the only one who was courageous enough to ask Tisha why they would need a name. And she did not regret asking her. From the time they were first born, each clone girl only had one personal objective. And it was to get as much attention to themselves from Tisha as possible. Incredibly enough, at that time, she came on top, followed by Vinya and Tysenia, who always gets the most attention from Tisha nowadays. Mia was not jealous of her little sisters. In fact, she was happy for them. The attention she had received on the first day was enough for her to feel satisfied. However, because she could not look at Tisha in the eyes, she had felt Tisha being sad about it. This, and her speech disorder, which had not helped clear things, was something that bothered her the most. But today, Tisha had found a solution for her. Now I can talk like everybody. Her joy was over the roof. Not only that, Tisha had revealed that she too, had a speech disorder when she was young. She was just like her. Just knowing this fact made Mia happy. Sleepiness soon came as she still held Behemoth in her arms, as she slowly fell asleep. Her thoughts were on Tisha. Thank you very much, mother. Even if you don't want us to call you like that, that's fine. 
You'll always be my mother in my mind. Our one and only mother who cares about us all. 23. Chapter 13. Let's fight. Tisha sighed. Right now, she was on the training ground with Willia. It was Willia's turn to spend some time alone with Tisha, and when Tisha asked her what she wanted to do, this was her answer. I'll ask again. But are you sure you want to do this? Don't you want to play a game with Big Sis? No. I want to fight Big Sis. I want to show you how much I've trained. Willia was stubborn about her choice. Ever since the first time Tisha trained the clone girls, Willia had only shown interest in training and fighting. She pestered Tisha every day to train with her, and give her more advice to better herself. Tisha did not know how to take it. On one hand she was happy the girl had found something that she liked and devoted so much of her time to, but on the other, she's gonna become a battle freak if this continues. Tisha mentally noted. It should be said however, that Willia's fondness for training and battle was something that came right from Tisha herself. She might not have noticed it, but she was quite the battle junkie too, and this fact only made her superior, Rika, work more than she ever demanded. Still, Tisha ended up granting the girl's wish, but there was something bothering her. I'm fine with giving you some lessons, but why did you drag Nilia with you? Yes, Nilia was also present. The poor girl had been dragged by Willia to the training ground the moment Tisha had agreed to train with Willia. Contrary to most clone girls, Nilia had yet to find something that interested her. She had a rather reserved personality, so she never spoke her concerns to others. By the time Tisha had noticed, the girl with a high ponytail was always being dragged around by Willia. A4 had told her that the two girls were often in the training area, so she assumed Nilia was just training alongside Willia. Whatever it was they were doing for training, Tisha just hoped the girl did not become Willia's punching bag. That's why she sent an escape rope to the girl. Nilia, you can do something else if you want. I'll take care of this little troublemaker. Hey, I'm not a troublemaker. Willia protested, but it fell onto deaf ears. Thank you for asking, big sis, but I'm fine. I want to join the training lesson. The girl responded. Tisha did not know whether Nilia's answer was truly her wish, or if she had already resigned herself to her fate. Enough talking. Let's begin already. Willia exclaimed, it would seem that her patience had run out. All right, all right, Tisha said. She then clapped her hands together. Then let's begin with the usual laps, soldiers. We'll do some stretching moves after that. Yes, can I join in too? A voice came from behind Tisha. Ah, it's Lydia, Willia exclaimed. Of course you can join. It's more fun if we're multiple to do it. Now that I think about it, Tisha recalled. A4 did mention that Lydia usually trained alone around this time of the day. Well, at this point, What's there to argue for one more girl wanting to train? With the addition of Lydia, they all proceeded to do their usual training with no complaints. During that time, Tisha thought back about the three clone girls' abilities. All three of them had special genetic enhancements that gave them strong fighting capabilities in a specific domain. Willia was the strongest in terms of raw strength alone. All her capabilities were focused on this. Because of that however, the clone girl had developed a rather aggressive style, only focusing on attacking her enemies, quite frankly, and to Tisha's frustration. She did not use her brain much. Not that she was stupid, but she might be the clone girl with the most simplest and honest personality. Nilia had similar gene enhancements, but has focused more on her body's toughness, endurance, as well as a very good dexterity. Thanks to that, Tisha had remarked during training that Nilia could do more hits than her sisters, and still be somewhat fine. As for Lydia, her genetic modifications were quite surprising. Somehow, a4 had managed to modify the clone girl's ability to make her presence felt. Thanks to that, she was the best at sneaking out unnoticed. Even Tisha needed to stay concentrated to notice the girl's faint presence. Added to this, Lydia was the fastest and most agile of the group. From the reports on genetic modifications, Tisha also learned that Lydia also had enhanced senses, making her very sensible. She could see and hear better and farther than most of her sisters. If trained correctly, she could become a big threat to her enemies, but this could be said for every clone girl though. And while Tisha agreed to train them, she had no intentions on making them deadly soldiers. 
just giving them enough training to defend themselves was enough in her eyes. Still, if Tisha classed the fighting abilities of all the clone girls, all three of them would be classed on the upper tier, with only three other clone girls occupying the first spots. In fact, A4 had even made a classment. The strongest of them all was Lysia, the second was Vinya and the third was Rhea. The three clone girls were the closest to Tisha's overall capabilities, no doubt thanks to the genetical modifications. Rhea's modifications were quite simple and standard. They essentially focused on enhancing her capabilities to make quicker judgments, besides some physical strengthening to Tisha. This was the reason why Rhea appeared more mature than the others. Lysia and Vinya were special cases when it came to enhancements. Vinya had the most enhanced genes from all clone girls, making her stronger than her sisters. As a side effect however, she took more time to learn, and would not likely be able to master her skills to the level of her sisters. In other words, she was a jack of all trades, master of none. Lysia, on the other hand, was the clone girl with the least genetic modifications. In fact, except for the growth rate modification, she was a perfect copy of Tisha. As for the remaining clone girls, their modifications were more focused on other aspects. For example, Mio and Nia had similar enhancements, mostly boosting their mental capacities, but with still well-balanced physical abilities if compared to Nisha. In fact, Nisha's modifications were mostly focused on her mind, and while she also possessed an enhanced view like Lydia, she did not receive any enhancements to her physical abilities, making her weaker than her sisters. Then there was the case of Miria and Tyria. Beside receiving what A4 called basic physical enhancements, both clone girls seemed linked to each other somehow. According to A4, the AI had managed to reproduce the telepathic link that some human twins possessed. Thanks to that, they could communicate to each other without even speaking, and as a result, their coordination was top-notch. For Tysinia, the clone girl had received a random number of gene modifications that did not particularly go well with one another, which usually ended with the instability or death of the subject. This was also the case for Vinya, because she had too many genetic modifications. It really was a surprise to A4 that the two girls managed to survive until this point and showed no signs of weakening. The AI had ended up praising Tisha's genetic code as one of the finest DNA structures ever built. This instability however, terrified Tisha. She had already nearly lost Vinya when the clone girl had to be forced out of her nutrition pod, and she had grown more attached to the girls than she thought. If anything happened to them, she would be devastated. This was the reason she mainly focused her attention on Tysinia and Vinya. She was scared that something might happen to them at any moment. According to A4, I'll need to keep checking their state until the growth period is over, which means for at least one year. Tisha thought as she began stretching. The clone girls are aging at a fast rate right now. They would grow one year older every three weeks until they reach the age of 16. Then, the growth rate would slow down until the clone girls reached the age of 18. A4 had estimated this second part to take at most half a year, and when that would be done, the clone girls would age just like any normal human being. Which reminds me, they'll soon be nine years old. Should I prepare some gifts for them? Tisha thought seriously. She wanted the girls to experience what a birthday was like and enjoy their childhood as much as possible. After all, they would have very short ones. But as she thought of this, her train of thoughts was interrupted by Nilia's voice. Instructor, I think we did enough stretching. It sounded like a pleading voice. <clears throat> Only now did Tisha realize what was happening. While she lost herself in her inner thoughts, she had unconsciously trained like she usually did, not the adjusted format she had done for the clone girls. Because of that, the three clone girls, who had followed her through the training without saying a word, looked exhausted. Oh crap. What have I done? She panicked internally. All right soldiers, Tisha said, acting calmly. She did not want the girls to know she had messed up and totally forgotten about them. You all did a good job for this special training. As a reward, we shall do a small pause before resuming training with some spars. Thank you for the lesson, instructor, said an energetic Willia, seemingly not having enough yet. I never thought you would even change the training course to be even more difficult. This is simply the best. Why yeah, 
I'm glad you're happy, Tisha answered as she averted eye contact. Willia was really too honest. It made Tisha guilty to have come up with such a lie. Her eyes then met Lydia's gaze. The girl had definitely seen through her lie. She made a strange face as she stared at Tisha, making her feel more guilt for her lie. Still, in the end, Lydia ended up breaking eye contact, leaving to hydrate herself. Tisha was left in a very awkward mood in the middle of all that. I should go hydrate myself too. In the end, she decided to continue as if nothing happened. After a short pause, the three clone girls stood in line in front of Tisha, waiting for what was coming next. Today, we will continue our unarmed fighting training. So let's do our usual spars. R, instructor, Yume, about that, Willia began saying somewhat uneasily, scratching the back of her head. Yes? What is it, Willia? I changed my mind. I don't want to fight you. Huh? Tisha did not expect this. Then, what is it that you want to do now? I'll show you how much I've improved by fighting Nilia. So just watch us. Willia declared. Tisha immediately looked at Nilia, as if asking if she was alright with this. The girl did not respond, simply giving a small nod. I guess it's alright. I'm fine with it too. But Tisha looked to the right, where Lydia was standing. What about Lydia? You can't leave her alone when she asked to join your training session. Oops. I forgot Willia said, sticking her tongue out. This made Tisha sigh. Willia did it again, not paying attention to her surroundings before saying whatever she wanted. Fortunately, Lydia was used to this. She raised her hand before saying, Instructor, I'm fine with just watching. Yes, Lydia says it's fine. So can we begin? Instructor Willia was already in position to start a fight with Nilia, who had also assumed a fighting stance. Fine, Tisha agreed. Since the clone girls had already decided to do this anyway, there was no need to say anything more. Since you are already in a position to fight, you will begin when I say so. I'll be the judge. The one who wins is the one still standing at the end. But be careful not to hurt Iakatha too much. Is that understood? Yes. Good. Tisha nodded. Lydia had positioned herself to her left, arms crossed. Then, begin. As soon as Tisha gave the start of the match, Willia rushed at Nilia with a big smile on her face. Here I come, Nilia. Nilia did not respond. She simply put her forearms in front of her face and blocked a roundhouse kick from Willia. Hee hee. This is only the beginning. Willia began laughing as she continued her assault on Nilia who somehow managed to block all of Nilia's attacks without taking a step back. After some time of continuous strikes, Nilia's defense seemed to weaken, something that Willia noticed. An opening, she said as she charged with her left shoulder. But just at this moment, Nilia sidestepped to the left, tending her right leg to make Willia stumble. Unfortunately, Willia managed to evade the trick. Wow, that was close. That's a good one Nilia. She then immediately resumed her barrage of hits. Watching from the sideline, Tisha had a smile on her face. Willia and Nilia's fighting styles were really the polar opposite from one another. Willia just focused on attacking, striking as much as she could to overwhelm her enemy, and letting her instincts guide her. As for Nilia, her defense was excellent. The girl did not hesitate to do feints to lure her enemy and then strike. This was an excellent tactic, big sis. Who do you think will win? Lydia asked from Tisha's side. She was watching the spar ensue with a lot of attention. Because of this, she did not even notice that she did not call Tisha instructor, but rather by her usual nickname. Tisha did not mind, always with a smile on her face, and still looking at the spar, she answered. I wonder who Tilda? It's hard to tell Tilda, big sis. You already know don't you? Lydia saw through Tisha's vague answer. She always saw through Tisha. Usually this would put Tisha in an awkward position, but this time it did not. Her smile only increased. That's right. I can already guess the outcome of this match. Then, she looked directly at Lydia, who looked back at her. What about you, Lydia? Have you guessed who will win? Lydia refocused on the fight instead of answering. After a while, she finally spoke. I think Sister Nilia will win. Oh? Why do you think so? Because she has been blocking all of Sister Willia's hits without faltering. From what I can see, she can still take more. Hee <laughs> hee. That's a good observation. Lydia, unfortunately, you're about half right. Tisha said, the smirk on her face not disappearing one bit. 
Just like Willia at this moment, she was enjoying herself. Then, who do you think will win? Big sis, Lydia asked, curious about how Tisha was so sure her prediction was wrong. I have something better to propose to you, Lydia, Tisha said, refocusing her attention away from the spa and on the girl next to her. If you can guess correctly what the outcome of this match will be, I'll grant you one wish. Anything? Lydia said. She had taken the bait Tisha gave her. Because if Lydia managed to find the correct answer, not only would this improve her deduction skills, this would also become a good excuse for Tisha to spoil Lydia a bit. Anything, from passing more time with me to getting a new toy. This big sis will grant it. I'll do it. Lydia immediately answered and focused herself only on the battle in front of her, trying to analyze Willia and Lilia's conditions. Her motivation was at the maximum. This made Tisha giggle a little before she too, focused on the match. A few minutes passed. Nilia and Willia were still sparing, and did not seem to show signs of fatigue. In this atmosphere, Lydia finally spoke up. I get it, big sis, I know who's gonna win. She energetically said, tell me then, none of them will. She proclaimed proudly with her hands on her hips. Tisha thought the gesture was cute. She smiled at Lydia before asking her, Why do you think so? I didn't notice at first, but Nilia's getting exhausted. She won't be able to continue for long. That's right. Tisha nodded her head. Then, what about Willia? Why can't she win? Because she doesn't pay attention to her state. She might still have a lot of energy, but she focuses so much on her attacks that she becomes clumsier at evading and blocking Nilia's strikes. There was a moment of silence between the two as they stared into each other's eyes. After some seconds that appeared to be minutes to Lydia, she finally asked hesitantly, H how is it? Did I get it right? In reaction to this, Tisha started laughing, startling Lydia. It's perfect Lydia, I give you a 10 out of 10. Yes. Full of joy, Lydia began a victory dance, before seeing Tisha's warm gaze on her. Her face reddened like a tomato as she calmed herself full of embarrassment. Tisha did not mind. In fact, this rare show of raw emotions coming from Lydia made her want to hug the girl immediately, but she restrained herself. Now, look at your sisters. It is about to end, Tisha said, managing to maintain her calm demeanor. Just as she said, the two girls looked exhausted. They had been fighting for ten minutes. I'll get you with my next move, Nilia, Willia exclaimed between two breaths. Come, Nilia just readied herself one more time to receive the impact. Yeah, Willia charged, preparing to punch with her right arm. Of course, Nilia prepared herself to counter. She caught Willia's coming fist with her left palm, grabbing it. This is not the end, Willia exclaimed as she tried to strike with her left hand, which also got caught into Nilia's free hand. The two entered a staring contest, exerting force to push the other. They stayed in this arguably funny situation for a while, before Willia had enough. Ah, enough with that. I'm gonna use my secret technique, she declared. Behold, Willia's super headbutt. A, A, or Willia's surprise headbutt not only caught Nilia by surprise, it also surprised Tisha and Lydia. Not expecting this move, Nilia did not prepare herself, and two clone girls' foreheads connected. Nilia immediately fell unconscious. But she wasn't the only one who got code. Willia also fell on top of Nilia, unconscious too. Nilia's head was hard, so Willia took as much damage as Nilia. Were it not for the fact that Nilia was exhausted, she might have endured it, but in her current state, she could not do so. In the end, the hit had taken both of them out. Tisha and Nilia just stared at the now two unconscious girls, not knowing what to say. Geez. After some seconds passed, Tisha sighed. I knew that none of the two would come up on top of the other, but I didn't expect this move. She closed in on the girls, checking their state with the help of A4. The both of them were fine. They would only get a short headache when waking up. That, and the clear bump each girl had on their forehead. If Nia saw them, she would immediately burst out laughing. After this, Tisha ordered A4 to carry the two girls to their bedrooms to take some rest. She then turned to Lydia. There is a lot to say about their fight, don't you think so, Lydia? Yes, the girl nodded as she got closer. Tell me then, what do you have to say to your sisters for them to improve? First, I don't think it's a good idea to scream or invent names for your moves. 
This was a good remark to make to Willia, she had incessantly screamed when she attacked, or commented about something. Then, there was the fact that she yelled the name of her techniques. You're right about that, there's no use about this. Tisha nodded, but then, a memory of her past submerged. She forced herself to forget about it. Yes, no use at all. Question mark Lydia tilted her head. Ahem, what did you notice next? Tisha continued, as if nothing happened. Yes, secondly, Nilia was too much on the defensive. She could have dodged some hits and struck back multiple times, but she did not do so. And finally, William should have been more aware of her own condition. There is no use doing what she did when you are exhausted. You're right, Lydia. You're absolutely right. This deserves a second reward tilde. Tisha nodded happily at Lydia's deductions. She really was good at analyzing things. And here's a bonus reward. She head patted Lydia. WH what are you doing? Big sis. That's not a reward. P please stop. Lydia struggled, embarrassed. On the surface, she wasn't particularly keen on these kinds of interactions, but the weak resistance she showed said the contrary however. It's fine it's fine Tilda, just enjoy it for now Tilda, Tisha said, definitely enjoying it more than Lydia. They stayed like this for a while. Then, Lydia finally stopped. Now, about your rewards, tell me. What is it that you want? A new toy? Or perhaps some special training? No. I don't want something like that, Lydia said, looking somewhat hesitant to say her wish. What is it then? Tisha said expectantly. Don't worry. Whatever it is, Big Sis will make sure to do it. You promise? Yes, I swear on my name. I will respect your wishes and make it happen, Tisha said, not realizing the consequences of what she just said. Then, please let me call you mother from now on, Lydia exclaimed. Closing her eyes. Wah, N no. Tisha did not expect this from Lydia, she panicked. Why you're wrong. Lydia, I'm not your mother. There's no way someone like me is a mother. A pang of unknown pain hit her chest as she strongly denied it. You, Lydia, I already said it, but I am not your mother. I am your big sis. You can't call me like that, okay? I knew it. You won't let me call you that even though you promised to do anything, Lydia said dispiritedly as she lowered her head, her expression invisible to Tisha. This simple denial had crushed the girl's spirit, and this made Tisha panic even more. D don't you want something else? Anything is fine but that, she exclaimed, but got no answer from Lydia. W what do I do? Tisha thought. How can I make her happy? Should I propose something else? After all, kids forget easily, right? But it's Lydia we're talking about. She's not like Nia or Tysenia. It won't work. Gah. It's in times like this that I need Rika. She always deals with complicated things. Tisha sought refuge in her past superior. But obviously, the answer wasn't there. Should I just accept it? N no. I can't. I just can't do it. She had thought about this question a lot of times ever since Nia first called her mother. But there was something deep inside Tisha's heart that prevented her from acknowledging the clone girls as her daughters, something that Tisha was scared of. It was when she was struggling like that that she noticed something from Lydia. Although she could not see her face, she noticed small water drops falling to the ground. Lydia, was crying, exclamation mark oh no, what did I do? I made her cry. Tisha panicked even more. This was the first time ever one of the clone girls had cried because of her actions. She wants to call me mother this much. Tisha reflected on her actions. Lydia was a good girl. She listened to her and did not cause any troubles. She didn't need as much attention as some of her sisters, and did not ask to be spoiled too. Taking all of those facts, Tisha asked herself, wasn't it fine to grant Lydia's wish? It's not like it was such a big deal, right? It was under such thoughts that Tisha spoke her next words. Fine, I'll make your wish come true. You can call me Emota, she embarrassedly said, her face becoming red. Eh? Lydia raised her head with big eyes full of tears. She was indeed crying, but she did not expect Tisha to agree. Only when it's just the two of us. Okay, un- That's fine, Lydia said, finally smiling. Thank you, mother. Tisha sighed in relief. Lydia was not crying anymore. Still, being called mother made her feel weird, so she forcefully changed the subject. Ahem, W what about your second wish? What do you want to do about this one? 
I want to use it now, mother. Ah really? Say it then. Tisha said with some tension in her voice, not used to being called mother. She hoped the wish would be simpler for her to grant this time. Then, my second wish is, in a somewhat tense atmosphere, Lydia expressed her second wish. 23, Chapter 14 Deep within the forest, screams echoed, making flock of birds fly away. A gruesome scene took place as one individual was mercilessly killing people. Corpses were scattered everywhere as that person who wore a white armored suit shot every person in her sight, whether they were alive, wounded, or already dead. Rah, I'm so stupid. The person suddenly said, of course, this person was Tisha. Why did I accept it? She thought back about what happened not long ago within the training ground as she continued her ruthless killing spray. Then, my second wish is to accompany you outside and see you working, Lydia exclaimed with expectations, no, this time, Tisha's response was immediate, her face became serious, I can't, Lydia looked at Tisha hopefully, it's dangerous outside, I can take care of myself, mother, Lydia insisted, I'll be very careful, and I'll follow you, that's still a no, Lydia, even if you follow me, big sis, can't guarantee your safety, Tisha was serious about this, even she was not perfect. Protecting people wasn't part of her skill set. She was a soldier, a merciless killer who would complete her objective, not a low class escort soldier. This is the end of the discussion. Now let's take a quick shower and relax. You can make another wish later. Tisha began to leave, but she immediately froze the moment she heard Lydia's next words. M. Mum, wait. I don't. I just want to help you. The voice weakened. Tisha did not turn around. She was conflicted not only by Lydia's insistence, but the way she just called her. She wants to help me so much that she changed the way she calls me. Is it really that important to her? She dug into her memories. She recalled one of A4's reports that the AI gave her some days before the clone girls were born. It was a report that disgusted her, so she tried to forget it within it. There was information about some security measures against the clone girls, just in case. This included the introduction of a purpose to their life, to make them more subservient. Right, there was something like that. Tisha remembered one specific purpose that was implanted into the clone girls' minds, and that was to be useful to the one they considered their leader. In Tisha's case, she was the so-called leader. Even though the null-class clone girls were somewhat resistant to this goal implantation, thanks to the lack of genetic modifications which would make the individual less rebellious. Some of the null-class clone girls, if not all of them, were probably influenced by this and unconsciously yearned to achieve this goal. This is disgusting, Tisha said to herself, just thinking about it made her mood turn even more sour, but this explained some things at least. Lydia is definitely under that influence. Even if she refused now, the girl would probably pester her until she agreed and this was something Tisha wanted to avoid, because if the other clone girls heard about this, there was a risk of reminding them about this said goal. At the worst, Tisha would enter an ever-ending cycle of the girls asking to go outside. Still, it's wrong to make Lydia watch me kill people. Tisha reminded herself yet again. This is not a bring your kid to work day or whatever some civilians do. Wait a minute. Did I just consider Lydia as my child? Her thoughts had gone in a strange direction. I mean, it's technically true. But no, I am not their mother. I am their big sis. Yes, I am their big sis and as such it is my duty to take care of them. I won't let them become like me. When Tisha was a child airing the streets, she had seen everything a kid shouldn't have seen. From adult relationships to murder. She too became part of this violent world at some point, becoming an assassin. She did not remember how old she was when she first killed somebody, nor does she remember what she felt. It was a period of her life where she did not show a lot of emotions after all. But by the time she enlisted herself in the army to escape this miserable life, she had already gained a name in the hitman industry. Whether they were good or bad people, she did not care. She only obeyed the orders a stranger gave her in exchange for some money and warm food. Still, Tisha knew that this kind of lifestyle, which had hardened her personality, wasn't the norm. As such, she wanted to give the clone girls something she did not get herself, to avoid them suffering the same fate as her. A warm shelter with a loving family, 
far away from the dark and problematic life of the adult world. Having found her resolution, she faced Lydia. Lydia, I want you to understand, I care about you all. And by just being yourself, you are already helping me. So please, don't force yourself to come outside with me. Mother Lydia stared at Tisha. A mixture of emotions were visible on her face. Today was probably the only day she had shown so much emotion. After a while, she spoke up. I understand mother's resolution, but, I still want to go outside with you. Sir Lydia Tisha made a complicated face. That's still a no. You won't change my mind about this. Lydia's face still showed stubbornness even though she said nothing. Tisha sighed. This is getting nowhere. I must find a way to make her forget about it. It was while Tisha was thinking about countermeasures that Lydia suddenly said, Then, I'll tell my sisters that Big Sis doesn't keep her promises. All right, let's go outside. Tomorrow, Big Sis is gonna show you our... Tisha exclaimed reflexively, she did not want the clone girl's trust in her to decrease because she did not keep her promise, and here was the result. By the time she realized what was happening, she had already agreed to something outrageous in her eyes. Meanwhile, Lydia was already all smiles. Thank you mother, I knew you would say yes in the end. Had she been played with again? Pulling herself together, she tried to call out. W wait, Lydia. I, I love you mother. Lydia suddenly declared as she hugged Tisha. Exclamation mark this sudden hug, which was similar to Tysenia's, coupled with Lydia shouting her love to Tisha, made Tisha's brain short circuit within her head. The words Lydia had just pronounced repeated itself like an echo, and her chest was filled with a very raw emotion she had a hard time identifying. By the time her mind rebooted, Lydia was no longer there, and she was left alone within the training room. There was no way for her to go back on her words anymore, and that's why I'm here. Do you understand now? Tisha said as she finished her aunt. She was talking to one of her victims, an injured soldier of the Ionian Republic who was the last one alive. Please, G.H., spare me. He managed to say, nope, Tisha said as she just shot the man in the head with her pistol. She then got up and stretched herself. And G.H., Artilda, I feel so much better now. Suggestion. Owner Tisha should do a sanity check. I told you already, there's no need. A4, I'm totally fine Tilda. This unit does not think so. No, really, don't worry. Everything is fine, Tisha insisted, but the killing spree she had done just to relieve herself only made a four question whether it made a good choice by making Tisha its owner. After agreeing to Lydia's second wish, Tisha had immediately met up with A4. She then began to rant incessantly to the poor AI about how she had been tricked into agreeing to Lydia's wishes. Having enough of this never-ending ranting, the AI had suggested that Tisha prepares in advance. From those words however, Tisha concluded that she just had to kill every soldier within a planned location, so that tomorrow, no soldiers would be present when she took Lydia out there. Thus happened the following massacres. Tisha ranted to her enemies while she was killing them. It was truly a surreal situation where Tisha just took her victims as ranting buddies, while her victims saw her as a demon instead. Not that Tisha minded. She was long lost into her own world. All right. I'm done here. Let's hurry up to the next zone. I need to vent out some more. Tisha said as she rushed out into another direction. R. Right. A4. Don't forget to clean everything up. I don't want a single body left. Orders received. Helpless. A4 could only obey its owner and guide her to her next target while scheduling a mental health check just in case. That day. All troops of the Ionian Republic within the southwest forest of Clone Installation 3 were eliminated, causing a huge commotion within the Republican headquarters. This however, would have bigger repercussions than Tisha thought. Meanwhile, Lydia entered a room on the fourth floor. Inside this room, Rhea, Nisha and Tysinia sat around a round table, enjoying some tea. This room had become Rhea and Nisha's tea room and the two of them would pass some time having some tea there every day. Tysinia sometimes hung out with them, she had taken an interest in making tea, and Rhea and Nisha would help her do a taste test of the ones she made. Rhea noticed Lydia, she called out to her with a radiant smile on her face. Ah, Lydia, perfect timing, I was just about to go search for you, 
Come, join us and take a seat, she invited her. Nisha and Tysinia stopped their conversation and also looked at Lydia. Lydia simply nodded, a serious expression on her face. This was her usual expression which was a far away from the multitude of emotions that she had shown to Tisha just a moment ago. She took a seat, and Tysinia poured some tea into a cup for her. After taking a sip from it, everybody looked at her, the joyous atmosphere no longer there, replaced by a serious and tense one. Let's hear what you have to report, Rhea said. She was like an officer in charge of a briefing. In fact, that was nearly the case. While the room served as a tea room, Rhea also used it as a reunion room for the clone girls who had similar objectives to her. While Tisha considered the clone girls like normal kids, they were anything but normal. The implanted knowledge within their brain had already made them conscious of some realities of the adult world, so considering them as normal eight-year-old kids was simply impossible. Just like you predicted, Willia tried to show her fighting capabilities in front of her by fighting Nilia. Lydia said matter-of-factly. Rhea nodded. So, what was the result? A draw, as expected, answered Nisha after taking a sip from her own cup of tea. She had predicted her two sisters would not be able to beat one another. From what A4 told me about their genetic capabilities, the both of them are the perfect opposite. They would become quite the impressive duo if teamed up together. After that incident some days ago, Nisha had begun to learn more about her modifications and the ones her sisters had. She passed her free time studying within the infirmary, studying the capacities of the human body, and how to deal with wounded people. Thanks to this, she was capable of doing precise analysis about her sister's capacities. So, how did it end up like that? Asked Tysinia from the side, curious about how the match proceeded. Willia had butted Nilia on the forehead, shouting it like it was some sort of ultimate move. The two of them ended up unconscious. There was a moment of silence. Tysinia grimaced as she put her left hand on her forehead, imagining what it must have felt like. Nisha sighed, looking exasperated, and Rhea had a wry smile on her face. That's a very Willia-like thing to do, the latter of the three finally said. Really? Why is she such an idiot? Can't she use her brain for one second? Nisha criticized. Come on, sis. Tysinia interjected, protecting Willia. Sister Willia is doing her best. Besides, she is funny and gives Tysinia lots of hugs. So there's no problem. Yes, yes. Tysinia, everyone loves to hug you anyway, Nisha said, not taking her seriously. This made Tysinia pout cutely, and her sisters, Lydia included, got the sudden urge to hug her, but managed to control themselves. This attraction to Tysinia was weird in itself. From what Nisha had seen within the reports on her sister's genetic modification, none of them had such an effect. In the end, she came to the conclusion that this was caused either by Tysinia's personality, which somehow provoked an instinct to protect the girl at any cost from the others, or a side effect of the combination of her genetic modifications. Either way, Tysinia was terribly cute, and her sisters wanted to protect her, even Lysia, as for Tisha, somehow the effect was twice as effective on her. So? Since you came back so late, I'm guessing something else happened? Rhea asked, re-centering the conversation around the initial subject. Lydia nodded. Since I was left alone, she offered to grant me a wish if I managed to guess who would win. Ooh Tilda. That's nice. Tysinia exclaimed. I'm guessing you managed to find out then. Nisha commented, and Lydia nodded, not mentioning the victory dance she did at the end. That was better kept a secret between her and Tisha. Had I known, I would have come to the training ground. Nisha mumbled, a bit jealous since she too, knew how the spa would have ended. You'll get your chance another time, Nisha, Rhea said, and Tysinia and Lydia nodded at Nisha as a sign of support. Still, it's a good thing you could get big sister grant you a wish to actually, Lydia announced, a small smirk appearing on her face. She was boasting, and it had an effect as this time, not only Nisha, but Rhea also frowned. Meanwhile Tysinia was just happy for her sister. That's amazing, sis. She had stars in her eyes, as if she had met her idol. This did not go without effect on Lydia, and her pride grew stronger. You can give me lots of hugs, you know? Yes, 
I'll give you lots of hugs later. Hearing that, Lydia made a small fist pose, a smile on her face. She just got permission to hug Tysonia to her heart's content. This was the breaking point for her sisters though. Ahem, can we go back on the subject? Rhea said, sending a glance at Lydia that told her to stop bragging. She obliged. I managed to convince her to take me outside and accompany her at work tomorrow. Wait a minute. You're telling me you managed to convince Big Sis to take you outside? Nisha got up, slamming her hands on the table. She was utterly surprised. Just like Tysinia and Rhea. How did you manage to do that? Rhea's technique. That was all Lydia said, but her sisters understood. Ah, I see. So it works even if I'm not the one doing it. Rhea nodded. Convinced. Nisha sighed, sitting back on her chair. What kind of blackmail did you use? She asked, remembering how Rhea had managed to make Tisha talk to her about the situation outside Clone Installation 3. I told her that if she did not grant my wish like she promised, I would tell everybody that she lied to us and does not grant all the wishes like she promised. And it worked. Yes, she immediately agreed to it. I thought so. But the image Big Sis wants us to have of her really is her weak point. Rhea concluded, thoughtful about how to exploit this weakness to her advantage. We can use this technique to make Big Sis agree to get our help then. Nisha added. Rhea and Lydia nodded. You can't. That's a no-go. Tysinia suddenly interjected, crossing her arms like a cross in front of her and shaking her head. Eh? Why, little sister? This technique has proven effective. So we should exploit it? Nisha questioned. None of them expected Tysinia to reject it so strongly. You can't use it every time. It's bad, very, very bad. Is it that bad? Yes. I mean, if you do this all the time, wouldn't Big Sis become immune to it? This was the excuse Tysinia blurted out. In truth, she just didn't want to see her Big Sis get exploited like that. It's true that this could happen. Rhea became thoughtful. It's Big Sis we're talking about, after all. Seems like I need to rethink about this. Why yes. Besides, wouldn't we lose all the credibility we built up if we used that technique so often? Tysinia jumped on the occasion, trying to convince the others to give up the idea. It's too childish. But we are children, Tysinia, Nisha said back. Ugh Tysinia had no argument against this fact. S still, that's a no-go. Bad. It's just bad to do that. All right. We understand, Tysinia, so calm down. Rhea said, putting a hand on Tysinia's head. It had an immediate effect on the clone girl who calmed down immediately. Let's just keep this technique as an emergency measure. Like this, the trust Big Sis has in us won't decrease. The clone girls nodded. This was probably for the best since none of them wanted Tisha to think of them as just a child who only knew how to throw a tantrum. On another note, please tell us everything about what you see out there, Rhea demanded from Lydia. And if something is about to happen to Big Sis, you know what to do. Of course sister. Ah. I remember. Tysinia suddenly exclaimed. Big Sis mentioned one time that she had a superior. Are you talking about the report you made some time ago about the lullaby? Rhea asked. Yes. That one. Maybe you will meet her? Tysinia was very curious about this superior of Tisha, although her big sis had said that she was not under her anymore, that didn't mean there was no hope to meet her. I'll keep it in mind, answered Lydia. After all, if she did meet that person, she would probably get another excuse to get some hugs from Tysinia. Now that I look at it, your eyes are a bit swollen, Lydia Nisha remarked. Did you cry? She asked with a bit of worry in her voice. Did she force herself to cry to add some force to the blackmail technique? Or did something else happen? Yes, but it has nothing to do with Rhea's technique. Don't worry about it, Lydia affirmed, and Nisha stared at her for a moment, evaluating her words. She wasn't going to say she cried as a result of Tisha denying in her face one of her most dearest wishes. How did Nia manage not to cry? Lydia thought back on the events of the day, when they first received their names. Nia just took it ahead on their first day, just after Tisha had already denied it, and yet she continued on, without showing much emotions, it was a contrast to her current childish personality, if you say so, Nisha said, before taking her cup of tea to drink, so, what was your second wish, did you use it or not, Tysonia asked impatiently, 
Her curiosity regained. Lydia nodded as an affirmation. Rhea was about to ask what she wished for when a big smirk appeared on her face and she calmly said, I made her authorize me to call her mother. P-F-F-F-F-F-T. Nisha spat out her tea. Rhea and Tysinia had big eyes, shocked by this revelation. You. You managed to make her recognize it? Nisha exclaimed in disbelief. Not really. Lydia shook her head. Calling her like that makes her stiff and I don't think she has truly recognized me as such, she said with a sad voice. Besides, I am only allowed to call her mother when we are alone together. Still, Rhea sighed. You managed to convince her. That's already a big step forward. A big smile appeared on her face. Congratulations, sister. I'm so happy for you. Tysinia exclaimed again. She had a hard time staying seated as she wanted to hug her sister out of joy right now. Still, she kept herself in check. Well, a win is a win. Nisha ended up saying after another sigh, Congratulations on winning this competition, sister. Thank you all. I truly hope you will be able to call mother like that too. Lydia honestly said, she truly wished all her sisters would be able to finally make their common wish become a reality. There was no need to be jealous about this fact. All the clone girls had a competitive spirit in some aspect and attaining this wish was considered a competition. None of them would ask how the other would convince Tisha to recognize them as her daughter, they all wanted to obtain this recognition in their own way anyway. Lydia had to admit that she had forced it a bit. If she didn't begin to cry because of Tisha denying it at first, chances are she would not be able to call her like that. Of course, the clone girls could actually call Tisha their mother whenever they wanted but they also wanted to respect Tisha's wishes, so they obliged and called her Big Sis, even though it hurt them. All clone girls recognized Tisha as more than a leader, or a big sister to them. Tisha was the reason they were born, and from the implanted information they had, this was the equivalent of what was a mother. From then on, the terms leader and mother became mixed, and the clone girls, who felt the need to be useful to their leader, began to see the fact of being allowed to call Tisha mother as a sign of recognition. Of course, the opinion depended on each clone girl. Rhea for example, was fine if Tisha did not allow her to call her mother. She thought she would use other stratagems to make herself useful to Tisha, and then maybe, later on, try her luck. Then there was Tysinia, who was fine because Tisha gave her a lot of attention already. Remember, Lydia, Rhea suddenly warned Lydia, whatever happens, you must be sure to never, ever, mention this in front of Lycia, Lydia nodded, this was one of the worries of the clone girls who reunited in this room, their eldest sister, Lycia, was extremely jealous, from all the clone girls, Lycia was the only one who did not show emotions, she did not speak much, and just stared at people, for some reason, she also refused to use the names Tisha gave them, referring to their numbers instead. Tysinia, who was somewhat sensitive to people's emotions, identified this as a growing jealousy, and while she herself was trying to calm her eldest sister by giving her hugs and passing time with her, this jealousy had already had its effects between the clone girls. Lycia did not hide her dislike of Rhea for example, and the both of them did not speak to one another anymore. If she found out that Lydia managed to win first place in this competition of recognition, although Lycia was the less active in it, it would definitely have repercussions. Rhea was sure of that. With all that said, let's end our reunion here. Rhea said, clapping her hand. A4. What is Big Sis doing right now? Answering Null CGO to Lydia's question. Owner Tisha is currently still out working. Thank you A4. Rhea nodded. I'll stay here a bit longer. Anybody wants to accompany me for another cup of tea? Gladly, said Nisha, already preparing another tea. The two of them would discuss their next moves together. Well, I'll go inform Mia, Tysinia said, getting up from her chair. Mia was the only member of their group who could not liberate herself to chat today. That was mostly because of Nia though. Tysinia began to walk joyfully to the entrance, but then a hand grabbed her left shoulder. Phew sister? Tysinia asked as she turned her head to face Lydia. Before that, 
I need you to charge me up, Lydia said with a smile on her face. Question mark Tysonia just tilted her head. Rhea and Nisha watched on, as Lydia dragged a confused Tysonia out of the room, and a creepy laugh echoed from the hallway. They both looked at each other. Next time, we should make sure to charge up on Tysonium before Lydia. Agreed. 20. Chapter 15. Yawn. Are you tired? Mother? Lydia asked, looking at a tired Tisha. The both of them were currently on the training ground, just after the clone girls had finished their regular training. Today was the day Tisha promised to take Lydia outside, and true to her words, she would do it. The main reason why Tisha was tired was because she did not sleep. She spent her entire night within the southwest forest, making sure the place was thoroughly cleaned. I am fine, Lydia. Don't worry too much about it. Tisha reassured, still unused to being called like this. True, she was tired, but it was to make sure Lydia's outing would go without a hitch. Now, before we go, we have to prepare ourselves first. Tisha began to walk towards the entrance, and Lydia just followed her, wondering what her mother was talking about. After a while, they arrived at their destination. Eh? Lydia was surprised. Mother, what are we doing at the armory? That's right. Tisha had led her to the armory, if it was because Tisha wanted to put on her armor, that would be fine, but she already had it on, as for the rest of her equipment, Tisha had already picked it up on the way there, Lydia Tisha faced Lydia with a serious expression, and Lydia became tense, I have already said it many times, but the outside is dangerous, there are a lot of bad people outside, Tisha then turned, entering the armory before going to the room on its left, as she did so, she continued talking to Lydia, who followed her, I cannot let you go outside in your current clothes, your jersey is only for training, but if something happens, it won't help you, that's why, Tisha turned herself, facing Lydia again as she reached their destination, I asked Tafor to make some preparations just in case you girls would need it, she said as she opened a drawer and took out a black piece of cloth from it, it was a skin suit, one which fitted her current size, exclamation mark Lydia was surprised, she did not expect this, still, she was overjoyed inside, Tisha cared so much about them that she prepared equipment for her and her sisters, all of this even though she vehemently refused to give one to Nia when the clone girl asked Tisha to get one of those, in fact, there were more of those skin suits stocked inside the drawer, as for the reason they were created, it was because those were a security measure both Tisha and A4 had prepared, just in case of an emergency. With this, the clone girls would be able to endure at least two consecutive shots from a laser blaster if they encountered enemies. Thank you mother, Lydia said, trying to hide her emotions. She grabbed the skin suit. However, Tisha did not let go. She simply smiled at Lydia, which made her alert. Her instincts told her she was about to receive Tisha's overwhelming sisterly love. Since this is your first time wearing a skin suit, Big Sis will help you put it on Tilda. M mother, W wait. I before she could finish, Tisha had already grabbed her right hand and began pulling toward the changing room. There was simply no way out of that one. After a while, Tisha emerged from the changing room, beaming, followed by a very embarrassed Lydia, whose face was red from shame. It was not because she disliked it, quite the contrary in fact, she was happy her mother wanted to be this close to her. Still, this did not mean it was not embarrassing, and Lydia, just like Nisha, had built a strong sense of shame, as expected. Black suits you so well Tisha said, looking at Lydia with a proud look. Lydia looked into the mirror which was, for some unknown reason, placed just outside the changing room. What was reflected was the image of a cute girl wearing a black skin suit with her white hair with black tinges arranged into a low ponytail by a big red ribbon. The girl suddenly striked a pose, then another one. Spoiler. Collapse. How cute said a voice coming from behind as another person appeared in the mirror's reflection. It was that of a beautiful young woman with a warm smile on her face, wearing the same skin suit as the girl but with white armored plates attached to it. Standing next to one another, the two of them gave the impression of either two sisters, or a mother and a daughter. Now, now, enough admiration of your cuteness. Lydia, we still have things to do, Tisha said to a very embarrassed Lydia. Still, despite the shame of her actions, and Tisha's light teasing, Lydia had a smile on her face, 
They came back to the main room of the armory, where they stopped in front of a shelf full of weapons. Lydia, Tisha said with a serious expression, the outside is dangerous, and since there is no guarantee that I will be able to help you in case of an emergency, you must have something to defend yourself. She took one of the pistols that was stocked on the shelf. This is a TP-100 laser blaster pistol. It's very easy to use. She gave Lydia the weapon. Lydia expected Tisha to explain how it worked to her, since she had never even held one, but when she met Tisha's gaze, she was met with a wry smile. Don't look at me like that dear. There is nothing for me to teach you about weapons since it's already inside your head. Tisha said as she then flicked Lydia on the forehead, causing the clone girl to hold her forehead with her left hand, while pouting. She knew what Tisha was talking about. It was part of the knowledge implantation she and her sisters had received, and it was categorized as basic knowledge for some reason. As such, the clone girls already knew how to use simple firearms such as a pistol or a rifle. Still, it did not mean Tisha would give them weapons. However, who in their right mind would give a child a weapon that could so easily kill after all? Today, however, it would seem that Tisha made an exception out of worry for Lydia's safety. I wouldn't mind receiving a lesson from mother though, Lydia thought to herself, but unfortunately, Tisha had already passed on to something else, and Lydia had no choice but to follow. Tisha had taken out something else for her. Here, take those knives Lydia. It's always useful to have some on yourself, she said as she gave Lydia three knives. I know you always strike vital parts in a fight, so this works the best for you in close combat. Those knives can vibrate if you push this button on the side, and when they do so, they can cut very hard metals. Lydia simply nodded, she attached one knife to her right forearm, one to her waist, and one to her left tibia, just before her ankle. This just felt natural to her, and when Tisha saw where she attached them, she just gave Lydia a knowing smile and a nod, not commenting on her choices. You're ready to go now, she ended up saying. She then proceeded to lead Lydia to the first floor, where she took the hallway leading south. Lydia looked at the condition of this hallway. Contrary to the plain white and thoroughly cleaned walls of the interior of Clone Installation 3, this hallway was left withering itself, with mosses growing, and humidity leaving traces. This left a different impression. It was as if the hallway had not been taken care of, and was left abandoned. In fact, this was because of Tisha. She had ordered A4 to leave the hallways and entrances of the facility in this state. The main reason was that it would cost them too much precious resources to just fix them, and the other was that Tisha held the tiny hope that, should anybody break in, any intruder would make the assumption that there was nothing of value left. Seeing the state of the hallways, it was more of a reassuring measure to herself though, as she knew from the bottom of her heart that, from the looks of things outside, there were some people placed high in power that knew the truth of this installation. They continued to walk in silence within this long dilapidated hallway. With every step, Lydia's tension and excitement grew. She was getting closer to the outside, and this fact made her happy. After some time, they finally reached massive, closed metallic doors. From her side, Tisha, who had put her helmet on, finally broke the silence as she looked at Lydia. We're here, are you ready to take your first step outside? She asked out of worry, Lydia could feel it even though she could not see Tisha's face right now, she simply nodded with determination, she had already made up her mind long ago, then, A4, open the door please, orders received. After a short answer from A4, the heavy metallic doors began to make a lot of noises, a crack of light began to appear within the dark hallway forcing Lydia to close her eyes, and when she finally opened them, whoa, that was all that came out of her mouth as she took in the scenery in front of her, there were a lot of green and brown things outside that she identified as trees from her implanted knowledge, but that was not all, as she took her first step outside, she raised her head, and was blinded again by light coming from the blue sky without clouds. It was similar to the one present within the training ground, but Lydia could tell from this one look. This one was real, it wasn't an artificial light. She stared at the blinding sun for a while until a voice finally brought her back to reality. Fufu, if you keep staring at the sun like that, 
You'll get dizzy. Tisha's light warning broke Lydia's staring contest with the sun, and true to Tisha's words, Lydia felt a bit dizzy, her head spinning. This made the only other person present release a sweet and warm laugh. As dizziness faded away, Lydia began to notice something else. Various noises were coming from all around her. She realized she could not identify all of them. But one thing was sure, they were not alone in this forest. In fact, it was busy with outside life from other species. Mother. This. This is the outside world, right? That it is. Lydia, answered a very pleased Tisha, enjoying every bit of Lydia's reactions. The clone girl had not even realized she was not even hiding her emotions anymore under her usual mask. What do you think, Lydia? Do you like it outside? I love it. Lydia exclaimed, not hiding her excitement anymore. There's so much. Trees, and, the sky, a eh, and those noises. There are so many things happening outside. Indeed, forests are very lively. Here, look to your right, there's a rabbit there. Ah, Lydia followed Tisha's finger, who pointed at a white ball of fluff with two long limbs growing out on the animal's head. She identified those limbs as being the ears. S. So cute, Lydia said. She then slowly, very slowly, approached the white rabbit, hoping to catch it and pet it. She had underestimated however the instincts of the wild animal. The white rabbit suddenly turned its head in her direction, before sprinting out of sight. W. Wait. Don't go. Lydia cried out sadly. She had failed at sneaking out something she was not ready to accept so easily since she was always good at it, except with Tisha that is. Speaking of which, Tisha had burst out laughing the moment she saw Lydia's reaction to the rabbit fleeing. I it's not fun. Stop laughing, mum, Lydia exclaimed, pouting. Tisha froze for a second at Lydia's use of the word mum, and she calmed down because of it. Still, she found Lydia's reaction very cute. My bad. Lydia, that was too cute. GG's, mother. Stop it. Lydia was red from embarrassment. All right, all right. I get it. I'll stop. But you're still cute, you know? Of course I am in your eyes, you stupid spoiling mother. Lydia thought as she sent her most deadly stare at Tisha, but its efficiency had to be questioned, as Lydia was too embarrassed, and her cheeks were still flushed red. Don't look at me like that. I'm sorry okay, said Tisha, definitely not sorry, how about I help you catch one? Really? Lydia had bitten the hook, completely baited by Tisha. Yes, but after you pat it, we have to release it alright? Wild animals should be left in the wild. If you suddenly change their environment, it would be dangerous for them, you know? Yes Lydia nodded reluctantly after thinking about it for a moment. Good girl Tisha patted her head, leave it to your big sis. I'll teach you how to erase your presence so the animals do not detect you. Lydia nodded, and for some time after that, Tisha taught Lydia how to erase her presence within a forest, as well as teaching some useful advices on how to survive in the long term in the wild. After failing twice at catching a rabbit, she finally succeeded in catching one on her third dry. Yes, I finally caught one, she exclaimed as she raised the scared rabbit in her arms to Tisha. Good job Lydia. I'm proud of you. But please be more careful with how you treat animals. Ah, Lydia realized how she treated the poor rabbit. Oh no. Yum. I'm sorry. She then hugged the small white fluff ball to her chest, and it somehow calmed the rabbit which nestled into this position into her arms. Lydia was melting. It would seem she really had a weakness for cute things. After this event, she would have no right to criticize Tisha for wanting to hug what she found cute. She wanted to hold it in her arms forever, but she knew she had to release the rabbit. But before that, a thought crossed her mind. I want to share this fluffiness with mother. Mother, let's pat it to SHH. Quiet. Tisha interrupted Lydia as she looked into a direction. Her voice with the same seriousness she would usually have when she was training the clone girls. We have unwanted visitors. Lydia tilted her head for a second, but if Tisha said so, it was not a good thing. She put down the rabbit, who fled immediately, and she came back to her usual expressionless face. In this tense silence, Tisha took out her rifle and positioned herself, ready to fire at any time. Lydia stared at Tisha for a while. She wondered what to do. I should concentrate too, Lydia thought as she emptied her mind. 
focusing only on the sounds around her. Her right hand unconsciously reached for the pistol hanging to her waist. Then, she finally heard something unusual over there. She was about to warn Tisha, but her mother had already reacted. Two laser beams were shot consecutively, reaching the bush Lydia had focused on. A grunt came back as a body fell to the ground, coming out of the bush. Lydia observed the human for a moment. She somehow knew he was dead now, but it didn't affect her for some reason. What did pick her interest however, was the person's equipment. The man was wearing something that looked similar yet different from what Tisha was wearing. An armored skin suit with a green camouflage. Of all people, it had to be Republican commandos. Tisha said as an exasperated sigh escaped her. Republican commandos were a special elite branch of the Ionian Republic. They all wore armored skin suits, and excelled in stealth missions. I messed up. Frustration grew within her. It would seem that her little cleaning process had finally come back to bite her. The Republican High Command must have sent them as a reaction. It just had to be today of all days. Mother, Lydia said with a small, worried voice. She had no idea who those people were, but she knew they were the bad people Rhea and Tisha had mentioned. She wasn't scared of them at this moment. No, she wanted to help. How can I be useful to my mother right now, Lydia? There are other people like this one right there that will come, so listen to me. Tisha said as she looked at Lydia. Lydia met her gaze. While Big Sis makes the bad people go away, I want you to hide somewhere and to not come out, alright? Lydia nodded, a bit disappointed. She wanted to help her mother, but she also understood that right now, she would just be a bother. She silently sneaked out to the side, quietly climbing on a tree, observing the situation. She concentrated, wanting to know where the enemies were. Three more were coming from the front, while four others sneaked to the sides, encircling Tisha as they got closer. Tisha did not say much, she just prepared herself, taking out a small ball that Lydia identified as a grenade. She then suddenly threw the grenade to the front before rushing to the left, exclamation mark grenade. One said, and an explosion came quickly after. Lydia could not tell if the enemies were eliminated. But after said explosion, laser beams began to appear from everywhere. The target is moving aggressively. Quick, find her Ludgar, she heard one of the men say, before he was interrupted by a clear laser hit to the side of his head. He dropped down, dead. Leader is down. I repeat, leader is down. The woman next to him exclaimed. She began to shoot accurately at Tisha's position, but Tisha just did a roll to the side before shooting three accurate shots taking the woman down. Whoa. Lydia was impressed by Tisha's performance. She had seen her mother training. But this was on another level. But then she noticed that two of the Republican commandos, the one on her side, were right behind Tisha, just passing under her tree branch. Did Tisha not notice them? She probably did notice them. Lydia was sure. But if they continued like this, Tisha might end up injured by them. I won't let it happen. Lydia repositioned herself, aiming her pistol with determination in her eyes. She waited, not moving an inch, until the perfect moment to strike came. She fired three consecutive shots at the one farthest from her, hitting each time. While the second commando looked around in a panic as the first one fell to the ground, dead. It was under such tension that Lydia fell on her opponent, taking out one of her knives, and aiming for the neck, exclamation mark however, the commando found her, and while Lydia managed to land on his back, she failed to deliver her blow, what the hell, why is a kid here, the man yelled as he began to grab Lydia who was on his back, throwing the girl away as a yelp escaped her lips, Lydia, Tisha, who heard the yelp, immediately called out, and let her concentration slip, the enemies noticed that, but when they took action, it was already too late. Tisha had rushed to Lydia's position, and with two clean shots, she took out the man. Are you alright Lydia? She asked. I'm fine. Mother, I managed to catch my fall. Lydia immediately responded. Tisha wanted to make sure the girl was really fine, but she remembered that there were still enemies around. However, when she looked around, nobody except those already dead were left. The enemies had fled. Damn it! Tisha exclaimed. This was not good, the survivors would inform their headquarters about her existence, and countermeasures would be made against her mother, a somewhat hesitant voice called out. Lydia stood next to Tisha, 
the girl had just killed somebody, and nearly got a second one, but this wasn't the actual reason she answered so weakly. Lydia thought that in the end, her actions endangered Tisha more than it helped her. Lydia, thank God you're fine. Tisha turned on the girl, hugging her with all her might. Lydia opened her mouth to say something, but before she could, she heard Tisha's weak, trembling voice. Thank God you're safe Lydia. If something happened to you, I... The voice faded out, but for a moment Lydia thought she heard sobbing noises. Eh no. I didn't mean to make mom cry. I simply wanted to help her. Eh mother, please don't cry. I'm sorry. Lydia exclaimed, about to cry herself. Tisha took out her helmet as she let go of Lydia. There were indeed some tears appearing in her eyes. Lydia. Why did you do such a dangerous thing? I... I wanted to help you, mother. T. They were going to shoot you from behind. Lydia bursted out in tears as she said this. A wave of strong emotions had come up. All she wanted to do was to be of help to her mother, and not be considered as a child. But she had underestimated how childish she could still be. Even if she was a clone, she was, after all, just a child. She got scared of losing her mother, so she acted, risking her own life without a second thought making Tisha panic as a result, but this made her realize something else, as Tisha showed strong emotions too. Tisha, her mother, truly cared about her in the strongest sense possible, she realized that by getting hurt herself, she might hurt Tisha more, this was the sort of emotion you would feel for other members of your family you wanted to protect, this range of emotion and realizations made Lydia cry out loud, thinking it was her fault, there. There Tisha hugged her, placing a hand at the back of Lydia's head, caressing it soothingly. It's okay. I'm here. I'm fine. You're fine. Nothing happened. Tisha began to hum a lullaby. The same one that she hummed to Tysinia. Ah, so soothing. This must be how it feels, between a real mother and daughter. Lydia slowly calmed down as she realized this fact. While Tisha herself might not call them her daughters, and recognize them as such, her care and love was definitely one of a mother for her child. This small moment just showed it to Lydia. We were wrong. She recognized us from the beginning. There's no need to prove ourselves. Lydia's mind slowly sunk into darkness as tiredness overtook her body. But she had a very warm feeling in her chest, as her mother hugged her. This wasn't something I expected today, Tisha said as a sigh escaped between her lips. She had just put Lydia in her bed. Somehow, Tisha had escaped the sight of the other clone girls, and she managed to get Lydia a health check, before letting her rest in her bed. The clone girl was sleeping peacefully after the roller coaster of emotions she just had and it began so well. Tisha thought back on the beginning of the day. Lydia had shown so much emotion, experiencing the outside for the first time, and Tisha enjoyed every moment of it more than she thought she would. But then, those fucking bastards had to ruin it at all. She cursed, because of a slight miscalculation on her part, she had put Lydia in danger. She thought the Republicans would not make a move if she eliminated all the soldiers within the forest but it would seem that the Ionian Republic opted for another option. Damn it. Bam. Tisha hit the wall with her left fist, frustration growing inside her. A4 did not comment on her actions, maybe the AI understood that it was better to leave her alone for a while. Because of me, Lydia had to. This was the most frustrating part to Tisha, she had sworn that the clone girls would lead normal childhoods, and yet, because of her miscalculation, Lydia killed somebody and could have been killed too. This is definitely not something a child was supposed to do, and while Lydia did not seem to show any trauma, it did shock the small girl to see Tisha panic so much after Lydia put herself in danger. Ah, the worst, truly the worst. I'm Tisha did not finish. The words died in her throat. In the silence, she began to regulate her respiration, trying to calm down. That's right, I'll gain nothing from blaming myself. A small period of time passed as she regulated her breathing. It was over now. The danger had passed. She repeated those phrases in her mind. Yes, there is no need to be so angry. It's already done, and nobody was lost. Tisha reassured herself with those words. Yes, Lydia was fine, and the other clone girls were fine too. She could still see their smile, and all she had to do now was pay attention to Lydia's mental state after this. Yes. 
it didn't become a worst-case scenario, and it's not like today could get any worse than that, Tisha said to herself. But as she did so, A4 suddenly spoke out with a tone of emergency. Warning, Null CG11 Tysinia and Null CG12 Vinia have been hurt. Current state is unknown, but possibilities of gene instability are high. Both Null class clone girls require medical assistance immediately. 17. Chapter 16. Right after the training session was over, Vinia and Tysinia were chatting together, wondering what to do. Vinia Tilda, what should we do today? Yum, I don't know. Vinia answered back, tilting her head. Isn't there something you want to do today? Yum Tysinia put her right hand under her shin, thinking, Oh, let's drink some tea with Sister Nisha. We can't do that, Sister. Did you already forget what Sister Nisha told you yesterday? Ah, Tysinia had forgotten. She dropped her arms and lowered her head, dispirited. Nisha had told her sisters that she wanted to be left alone so that she could concentrate on what she was studying, but drinking tea with her is so fun. Vinia let out a small sigh at Tysinia's childishness. She sometimes wondered whether she truly was the youngest. Ever since they were born, the two clone girls were often together. The two of them were well aware of their differences compared to their eldest sisters, and that was why they enjoyed the company of the other, who could understand how they felt. How about Sister Rhea? Vinia proposed. Um, nope. Sis is busy today, Tysonia answered after giving it some thoughts. She did not precise however what Rhea was exactly doing, as her sister had asked her to keep it a secret from the others. Maybe we could go explore with Mia and Nia? It's too late for that. Vinia shook her head. They already left to explore. Besides, this smells like trouble. Wouldn't Big Sis not be happy if she learned we sneaked out to go somewhere that could be dangerous? Oh no, that's a no-go. I don't want Big Sis to get angry after us. Tysinia reacted strongly, tears starting to form in her eyes already. Tysinia and Vinia were the most spoiled of the clone girls by Tisha, and she spent a lot of her spare time with the both of them. As a result, the two clone girls cared a lot about what Tisha thought of them. They were scared that... If they did something wrong, they would not receive the attention they craved for anymore. End of block 1